Okay, so you just come up here and... Yeah, but uh, if you could kind of keep people from... Running away? Off, yeah, yeah. It's not like it's going to take... Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yep. Do I just... Good morning and welcome to day three of Deep Carbon 2019. Uh, my name is Mark Lever. I'm an assistant professor of environmental microbiology at ETH Zurich and I'll be chairing the first session this morning. And uh, but before I introduce uh, the first speaker, I would like to say a few words about today's program. So there are four sessions in total and the first three are structured along the uh, three different major themes of the Deep Carbon Observatory. Uh, which are quantities and movements, which is the theme of the first session, and uh, forms of deep carbon is the sex, second session in the morning, and uh, origins of deep carbon will be the first one in the afternoon. And then the final session this afternoon will be on future opportunities of deep carbon research, 
And uh, we'll um, end with some closing remarks by Marie Edmonds. So uh, with that, I would like to now introduce the first session. So we, um, this is, will be the quantities and movements of deep carbon session, where we'll have uh, research presented on abiotic, thermochemical, and biotic uh, cycling of carbon um, through the mantle, the lithosphere, and sediments, and also include some exchanges with the atmosphere. And um, our first speaker today will be uh, Liz Cottrell, who is a member of the DCO Reservoirs and Fluxes community and a steering uh, committee member of this uh, community and also uh, who hosted us last night for a wonderful reception at the Smithsonian um, Institution. So I'd like to uh, invite everyone for a round of applause for her, to thank her for that. <laughs> so Liz Cottrell um, is a geologist here at the Smithsonian um, Institution, and there she is the curator in charge of rocks and ores. And she's also a leader of the Smithsonian Global Volcanism Program. And her research focuses on the long-term evolution of carbon and oxygen uh, since the um, formation of the Earth until today. And her uh, presentation today will be on carbon cycling in the convecting mantle. mantle sorry. Liz, the stage is yours. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm sure that for many of you in the room, the pleasure of this meeting is actually just in seeing your friends and seeing the DCO community. <laughs> And so as I launch into the achievements uh, and the quantification of carbon in the convecting mantle, uh, it's uh, appropriate to mention that there's one community member whose absence is acutely felt, I think, at this meeting. I'm, of course, talking about Eric Howery. He's depicted here with uh, Marion Levoyer, who is a postdoc, uh, who is a postdoc, uh, who was shared between Carnegie and the Smithsonian. And reservoirs and fluxes, you know, so much of what happened was Eric's vision. And it is no exaggeration to say that none of what I'm presenting here today would have happened without Eric. Uh, and he is deeply missed by all the authors and I'm sure everyone in the room. But there are many other people, two early career DCO uh, community members here, Jonathan Tucker, Kay Shimizu, who are here in the audience, reach out to them, say hi. I thank them for the work and their contributions uh, to this talk and everybody uh, who contributed to making this massive uh, amount of work possible. I'm gonna be talking to you about the quantification of carbon in the convecting mantle. That's the part of the Earth that's sampled by ocean islands and mid-ocean ridges and back arc basins. I was lucky enough to be part of what I think was the very first proposal to Reservoirs and Fluxes with Eric Howery. And I think it was the first proposal because it seemed the most, such an obvious thing to do, which was to create a carbon inventory of oceanic basalts and the oceanic upper mantle. We wrote that this effort will begin an analytical program to measure directly and map the carbon flux from the mantle to Earth's surface via the global mid-ocean ridge system using international collections. So we have to work with the samples that Earth gives us in these sampling locations. We need to quantify the carbon in basalts in the matrix glass, in the glassy melt inclusions, their shrinkage bubbles, bubbles in the matrix, and even in the uh, nominally and carbonaceous minerals um, like olivine. This is made difficult by the fact that carbon solubility in silicate melts is very low. And so what I'm showing here is a schematic of uh, mid-ocean ridge. It's erupting underwater, so it's erupting at pressure. This is pressure on the y-axis. And along the x-axis, I have trace element concentration. Carbon in this, in this presentation, carbon's just another trace element, okay? And what you're seeing here is the CO2 saturation surface. So if you want to quantify carbon in a melt unadulterated from its primary concentration, you might select a very depleted uh, composition, one with low carbon concentrations, low trace element concentrations, so that carbon nucleates late in that melt, uh, vapor bubbles nucleate late. And you might choose to sample very deep in the ocean under the highest pressures possible. By this means, you might have a scent of a, a magma with its carbon concentration and trace element concentration intact and unaltered. Another way you could do this, if you had a more enriched melt, 
or shallower ridge would be to take your melt and before a CO2 bubble nucleated, encase your melt in a shell of olivine. And that strong shell maintains pressure on the melt such that the melt can't degas until it, re uh, it can't degas. And then you might arrive with a melt inclusion in the olivine with no shrinkage bubble, and you'd have a CO2 undersaturated melt to analyze. Of course, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, melts arrive at the surface CO2 oversaturated, and that's because of the slow kinetics of CO2 diffusing into vapor bubbles. What happens in these scenarios is you have your trace element concentration and your CO2 concentration. You saturate in CO2, you nucleate your first bubble, the carbon concentration in the melt falls as all the CO2 goes into the bubble, and the trace element concentration um, is, is fine. The trace element uh, stays at its uh, initial concentration. And here I'm just showing that for any uh, sample pressure where you pick up your basalt off the sea floor, if you compare it to the saturation pressure, the vast majority are oversaturated no matter what model you use. And this is, of course, evidenced by the fact that mid-ocean ridge basalts are just full of vesicles. They're full of CO2 bubbles. So primary and trace element concentrations, uh, primary trace element concentrations and CO2 concentrations become decoupled in the vast majority of cases. So to complete our triptych on the left here, you have the case of ocean island basalts. Here we show the CO2 concentration falling all the way to zero as you erupt subaerially. And in these cases, you really need to rely on those olivine-hosted melt inclusions and even reintegrate the CO2 shrinkage bubble into your melt, concentrate, into your melt composition to reconstruct the CO2 concentration of those melts. So the underlying methodological assumption here that pervades all the work I'll be presenting today is that carbon's concentration will track other highly incompatible elements so long as carbon has not begun to degas. What's amazing here is that two decades ago, there were only two localities on the planet where we inferred carbon undersaturated uh, concentrations, the famous popping rock, where the vesicles were reintegrated into the melt composition, and Securos, where uh, Alberto Sal and Eric Howery found CO2 undersaturated melt inclusions. And you can see them here. They're the ones where CO2 is correlated with niobium. Okay, so they're correlated, they're behaving the same, they're behaving coherently because they're both just acting as incompatible trace elements. The rest of MORB, and here's popping rock up here, the rest of MORB, uh, this correlation is broken because of degassing. So the CO2 concentration has fallen whereas the niobium concentration remains unaltered. Today, we have dozens of locations, many, many localities with un where undersaturated melts have been found. And so this is just an amazing achievement of the last decade. Some of this work is uh, not related to DCO, but a lot of this work was uh, related to DCO efforts, and we see these beautiful correlations. Even at Iceland, uh, Eric published uh, in 2018 under CO2 undersaturated melt inclusions from Iceland, although this is extremely rare. So uh, we quantified carbon concentrations for six plumes, six ocean island basalts. Uh, this is um, Jonathan Tucker's work and uh, Marsky and Howery. And while they, the CO2 has partially degassed from these melt inclusions, they were able to reconstruct the CO2 concentrations to the best the best of our ability. So now looking at all, all the data that's come out in the last decade, we see a beautiful correlation here between CO2 and barium. Uh, we could choose many highly incompatible elements. Barium seems uh, to have a very constant ratio. Uh, all, these, all these samples fall on single line, so that ratio of CO2 to barium is very constant. And these are sampling locations around the globe, uh, across the mantle, okay? And then we can see uh, where CO2 has degassed and samples that fall off of this correlation. And so again, the idea here is that we have a constant CO2 barium ratio in the mantle with some error, some slop, but we can infer for these degassed melts that their carbon concentrations used to be up on this line. They've lost carbon, but we can use their barium concentration to infer their initial CO2 concentration. That's the game we're playing in all of these studies. 
So the constancy of CO2 barium and CO2 rubidium ratios in empty gas samples and the similarity of carbon, rubidium, and barium incompatibility in experiments, um, and these experiments were also conducted, these are uh, Mark, Mark Hirschman's lab, also in collaboration with Eric Howery. The similarity in experimental studies gives us a lot of confidence that barium and rubidium will be very suitable proxies for reconstruction of primary undegassed CO2. There are some potential problems. I don't, need to, I don't have time to talk about them in a 10-minute talk, conveniently. Um, but I will add, though, that uh, these, uh, anyone can ask me questions about them. I think that barium uh, incorporation from plagioclase is not a big deal. And I would say that partial degassing is possible, and it can't be ruled out. Um, but it's certainly not required to explain the data. And that came out in a really nice paper by Kei Shimizu just this year. So the takeaway message, we're going to use barium and rubidium uh, for, as proxies for MORB. And because these trace elements vary on the planet by greater than a factor of 20, that can't be explained by ridge processes, by partial melting processes. And many trace elements, these highly incompatible trace elements, correlate with a lot of radiogenic isotopes. So we infer mantle heterogeneity. Thus, by analogy with trace elements, we anticipate variations in mantle carbon due to mantle heterogeneity. So if you use trace element concentrations now, and so you don't need to find undegassed morbid every, at every segment, you need to have good constraints on the trace element concentrations. And we have 387 segments where we think that's the case. And so for those 387 segments, we can inf infer, calculate the primary CO2 concentration. And when you do that, you get this data set with uh, its uh, a very skewed distribution, nearly a log normal distribution with a medium of a median of 1,100 parts per million CO2, but a mode, a most common, you know, go, go to the ridge, pick up a rock, a most common CO2 concentration, primary CO2 concentration of 620 parts per million. This allowed us uh, to take those 387 segments and then by means of those statistics I just showed you, project what the carbon concentration of every single segment uh, is most uh, likely to be around the globe for all 711 mid-ocean mid ridge segments in the Gale catalog. The ones constrained uh, with uh, data have a range of CO2 from 104 parts per million to nearly 2 weight percent. And then Marion Levoyer went a step further. Okay, so looking at crustal thickness as a function of ridge depth, okay? Looking at the correlation between seismically determined ridge crust crustal thicknesses and, and ridge depth from the Gale catalog, she was able to create a relationship that allowed her to extrapolate, okay, the, the, the crustal thickness for every segment on the planet. And of course, um, the crustal, um, the seismic constraint catalog comes from Mark Bain, who's another member uh, in the audience from the DCO community. So with this, we have a lot of power because we can now calculate a global flux because we have magma productivity. And we get 1.3 times 10 to the 12th moles per year. What I think is great about this is that this translates to 58 teragrams per year. It, it's, uh, I swear we did not work together at all. I mean, we worked together, but the 59 teragrams a year from Jonathan Tucker's uh, noble gas um, constraints uh, was a completely independent project. And it's actually very similar to the 53 teragrams of, a year in the Keller, Katz, and Hirschman study from EPSL 2017 using a completely different um, methodology. And so I feel like DCO like, really stuck a pin in it here you know, about the carbon flux from Earth's mantle to the exosphere. We can also take these... Uh, primary CO2 concentrations and uh, do the back calculation to get uh, through the batch melting equation to get to the mantle concentration. And so we also mapped mantle concentrations of CO2 around the globe. And when you do that, you get uh, these data here with a median of 100 parts per million and a mode or a most commonly found CO2 concentration of 73 parts per million. And you can compare this to a lot of other um, work that's been done, this is lower than some and higher than others. And so as we look uh, at this uh, decade of achievements, 
uh, in this 10-year period, in a series of nearly a dozen papers, we've quantified the CO2 concentrations of more than 1,500 ocean basalts and melt inclusions, constrained primary magmatic CO2 of segments where we have trace element data, inferred uh, the rest, calculated a CO2 flux, estimated CO2 for uh, six major oceanic hotspots, spots, and estimated mantle CO2. And I would just close by saying that Eric pursued and achieved the goals that he set out uh, just through his relentless excellence. Thank you. Thanks for this great talk. Uh, we have time for questions. If no one has a question for me, I have a question for the audience. <laughs> if you were one of the early career gentlemen who approached me at the reception last night and asked if I could bring a soccer ball to the meeting today, I have done so. Please find me at the coffee break and I will deliver the soccer ball to you, freshly inflated. Great, thank you very much. So our next speaker this morning will be Taryn Lopez, who is a member of the Reservoirs and Fluxes community and also a DCO Emerging Leader Award winner um, in 2017. Um, she's been very heavily involved in the Decade uh, program, which has been mentioned and uh, presented in numerous talks already at this conference. And she's currently a research assistant professor of volcanology at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, which is also where she did her PhD. Her research focuses on the chemical and isotopic signatures of volcanic gases and waters to constrain volatile sources, deep subduction processes, as well as volcanic eruptions. And I would also like to mention that Taryn Lopez was the organizer, one of the organizers of the very first early career workshop in Costa Rica, which was uh, my introduction to the Deep Carbon Observatory. And uh, with that now, I'm very excited to hear your presentation on your research on the Aleutian Arc Volatile Cycling. Okay, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today um, to share some results that my colleagues and I have been working on for the past several years that are relevant to the Deep Carbon Observatory, looking at volatile cycling within the Aleutian Arc. So we've heard the past few days about how important the subduction cycle is. Uh, this is a key mechanism of volatile transfer among Earth's shallow and deep reservoirs, and we know this has important implications for uh, Earth processes such as magmatism, volcanism, and the long-term evolution of Earth. We also know that volatile sources um, and their migration among reservoirs can be tracked using the isotopic composition of key volatiles, in particularly carbon. Prior, uh, or I guess until recently, few systems have had robust constraints on the sources and quantities of carbon inputs and outputs within subduction zones. But thanks in large part to work by the Deep Carbon Observatory, we now have more data where we can actually make progress in this important goal. So within a subduction zone setting, we have volatiles from three sources that are supplied to arc volcanoes. The subducted slab, which can include altered oceanic crust, the overlying marine sediments. Um, the next source is the mantle wedge, and the third one is the crust. And each of these regions has a somewhat characteristic isotopic signature that we can use to identify the source of these volatiles. So specifically, inorganic carbon, like we might find in the altered oceanic crust, I'll also refer to it as carbonate, has a carbon isotopic composition of about zero per mil. Uh, marine sediments, also from the subducted slab, uh, are composed primarily of organic carbon with a carbon isotopic composition much lower in the range of, range of minus 25 per mil. And then the mantle wedge falls between with a range of about minus 6.5 per mil. So we can use these isotopic compositions to try to investigate volatile cycling. So the goal of our work was to do this within the Aleutian arc. We wanted to use uh, new constraints on the isotopic composition of subducted inputs and volcanic outputs and a simple mixing model to really characterize volatile cycling within this subduction zone. So our target is the Aleutian Arc. It's home to 54 historically active volcanoes, each marked by a triangle. The red triangles represent uh, volcanoes where we have carbon isotopic measurements in the volcanic gases. Uh, this arc is also notable because it has significant along-strike variations in subductive inputs 
in particular the subducted sediment fluxes. It also has a long strike of variations in convergence angle. And what's relevant to this talk is that uh, the crust varies. The Aleutian Arc is built primarily on continental crust, where we might expect a greater contribution of crustal carbon, where the rest of the arc is built primarily on oceanic crust, uh, where we might expect crustal carbonates to be a minor factor. So in this study, we wanted to use two new data sets. Um, the first were improved constraints on subducted carbon inputs. This is work by my colleagues, uh, Terry Plank and Alberto Malinverno, and they've used the carbonized, or they've used marine cores, oops, sorry. Marine cores from the Gulf of Alaska to estimate the carbon isotopic composition of the subducted inputs. And they find that they're unusually light, ranging from minus seven to minus 19 per mil. They also, on the right-hand side, extrapolated the carbon sediment fluxes for the entire arc. And what was particularly important is that they distinguished between the lower marine sediments, which we assume get subducted all the way beneath the arcs where they might um, produce melts, and the overlying terrigenous or trench fill sediments, which we're not sure if they get subducted beneath the arc or they may get scraped off during subduction accretion. And then the second data set we use were new constraints on volcanic carbon outputs. Uh, so the figure on the left-hand side shows longitude from east to west, carbon isotopic composition on the y-axis, and these are our volcanic gas measurements for the Aleutian arc. And what's notable is that prior to 2015, we only had constraints from the eastern and central arc segments, but in 2015, Tobias Fisher and I had the opportunity to join a collaborative campaign out in the western Aleutians. This was supported by the NSF Geoprisms program, the Deep Carbon Observatory, and the Alaska Volcano Observatory. So we were able to add some new data and kind of round out our arc measurements. And here's a photo of Tobias taking a sample at Garilloy Volcano. So we wanted to use these two new data sets and apply this to a mixing model with the, and to answer the question of what combination of carbon sources and fluxes can explain our observed carbon isotopic composition in the volcanic outputs. So we use the simple equation here. C, oops, sorry. C sub V is the carbon isotopic composition of our volcanic gases. That's equal to the carbon isotopic composition times the flux of our three sources. So the organic sediments, the mantle, and carbonate. And that's divided by the flux of each of these sources, flux of sediments, mantle, and carbonate. So we know several of these factors. We know the carbon isotopic composition of our volcanic outputs. We know the carbon isotopic composition and the flux of the sediments from Terry and Alberto's work. And we have estimates of the carbon isotopic composition of the mantle and the carbonate, uh, minus 6.5 for the mantle and about zero for carbonate. We don't know the flux of the mantle or the flux of carbonate. So this is what we need to solve for. Um, one assumption that we're making is that isotopic fractionation due to degassing is limited to about minus two per mil. We don't have good temporal resolution on the carbon isotopes from our volcanoes to say better than this. So we're, uh, we're using results from work by uh, Cindy Werner and Deb Bergfeld from the Cascades arc where they have time series measurements and they estimate carbon fractionation from persistently degassing arc volcanoes on the range of minus one to minus 1.5 per mil. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider end member scenarios and try to solve iter iteratively to constrain uh, the best sources or the best models of volatile cycling for this arc. So I'm gonna get into results, but before that I'm gonna map out what I'm gonna show you because there's a lot going on in this figure. So again, we have, oh, I'm sorry, keep doing that. We have longitude on the x-axis from east to west. We have carbon isotopic composition on the y-axis. Again, the red triangles are observed from our volcanic gas measurements. The lines are predicted from our mixing models. The red line represents if we have incoming sediments only, so all the trench fill sediments are scraped off during the subduction, and the black line is where we have um, total recycling of the subducted sediments. These dashed lines, which might be hard to see, show the boundaries between what we're calling the eastern, central, and western arc segments. And really what we're looking for is a match. We want to see that our observed volcanic gas outputs fall between these end members. And that would suggest that we have a reasonable solution to our mixing model. Okay, so the first scenario that we considered is that we had recycling of the subducted sediments with variable trench fill off scraping, and we had a constant mantle flux. Uh, we have these light carbon isotopes in the central Aleutians, and 
we needed to match these. We needed to figure out what we could do to get a fit to those light carbon isotopes. So iteratively, we calculated that we needed a mantle flux equal to about 25% of the mean sediment flux. And this would give us a good fit if we assume that all the sediment is recycled for the central part of the arc. Uh, so what we see here is that we get a good match with this model for the central Aleutians, but we don't get a good match in either the eastern and the western segments. So our next scenario that we considered is, again, we have recycling of the sediments with variable trench fill off scraping. And here we consider a variable mantle flux. So we just calculated what mantle flux would be required to get a fit in these eastern and western segments where we have heavier carbon isotopes. And in doing this, we find that it requires uh, a mantle flux 10 times the mean sediment flux, which is quite high. We're not sure this is realistic. Um, but in doing this, we do get a good fit to our observations. And then the third scenario, we assumed, again, recycling of the subducted sediments with variable trench fill off scraping. Again, we assumed a constant mantle flux of 25% the mean sediment flux. And we assumed a carbonate flux was also contributing to our, um, our outputs. In this case, we calculated that a carbonate flux of about 1.5 times the mean sediment flux gave us a decent match for both the eastern and western segments. Um, it does not give us a good fit for the central Aleutians. So we concluded that really a combination of these different scenarios is required to match what we're seeing in the volcanic gases. So our best fit scenario, we have recycling of the observed sediment, again, with variable trench fill off scraping. We have uh, a constant mantle flux equal to 25% the mean sediment flux. And we have a carbonate flux only in the eastern and western segments equal to 1.5 times the sediment flux, or about 648 kilograms carbon per meter per year. So this gives us a pretty good match of our data. We think this is the best solution. And one other interesting observation is that the flux of carbon corresponding to this mixing model is shown on the right-hand side. Uh, so flux, predicted flux, is on the y-axis, longitude on the x-axis. The black line represents complete recycling of the sediments. The red line uh, suggests that we had complete off-scraping of the trench fill sediments. And what's interesting is that we this model requires a higher carbon flux in both the western and eastern segments than the central part of the arc. Uh, we're still thinking about this, but it's an interesting observation. OK, so what might be these carbonate sources that we're inferring from the eastern and western segments? We think that in the eastern Aleutians, uh, the most likely source is crustal carbonate. This is because there is evidence for sedimentary rocks that have carbon-bearing rocks within them, both in organic and inorganic form. Um, so we think the crust is the most likely solution for the eastern Aleutians. In contrast, in the western Aleutians, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have an obvious crustal source. Uh, so we think that the most likely carbonate source in the western Aleutians is carbonate from the altered oceanic crust. Uh, we think that this might be reasonable because there is evidence for slab melting a little bit farther west. This is work by Gene Yogodzinski. So to conclude, uh, using our new constraints on subjective inputs and volcanic outputs in this mixing model, we try to constrain volatile cycling in the Aleutian arc. We find that our best fit model suggests that we have complete recycling of the subducted sediments and a constant mantle flux of about 25% the mean sediment flux for the central Aleutian part of the arc, but that can't explain the western or eastern segments. For those segments, it requires either a significant mantle a contribution or a carbonate flux, most likely a combination of the two. In the eastern segment, we think the most likely source of carbonate is the crust. And in the west, we think the most likely solution is carbonate from the altered oceanic crust. The implications of this work is that, at least in the Aleutian arc, subducted sediment carbon is not supplied in significant quantity to the deep mantle. And this also means that the altered oceanic crust carbonate is potentially an important source of carbon to the exosphere. Uh, with less carbonate subducted to the deep mantle from this source than we may have previously thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Anyone? Yep. Just, just a quick one. Are there going to be data from Boldir? We don't have any gases from Boldir. OK. Because once you get out there, then the lead isotopes are going to give you a lot of information about how much sediment you can. It's a whole extra constraint. But you have to get out into that gradient to really, really low lead isotope ratios. Yeah. Our farthest west degassing volcano is Kiska. Yeah. 
But I think Terry is looking at the lead isotopes. I don't know where Terry is. But, yeah. Cool. No, wait, it's, but that was really cool data. Thank you. One more question there. Well, there's not any carbonate in the subducted slab, and it's built on oceanic crust, so that's my interpretation. Do you have another idea? No, no. Okay. <laughs> Patrick? Did you try using a CO2 to demonstrate ratio to discriminate between your models? Uh, CO2 and what? Helium? CO2 and helium. I did. They were a little confusing. It does, the mixing models showed that the Western Aleutian does have a greater mantle source. Um, but it had carbonate throughout the whole arc in varying compositions. I think it might be affected due to degassing. Great. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next speaker. <laughs> and our next speaker is Alberto Vitale Provarone, and he's a member of the Deep Energy um, community at DCO and also a DCO Emerging Leader Award winner from 2017. And uh, Alberto is a researcher at uh, Torino University in Italy, as well as a CNRS researcher at IMPMC in Paris, France. And um, he uh, does research on metamorphic petrology, evolution of subducting oceanic crust, and high pressure fluid rock interactions in metasomatism. And he, uh, um, part of the reason why he got this uh, award several years ago was a, a really impressive paper in Nature Communications on the abiotic, abiotic methane production during subduction in the Italian Alps. And uh, today, uh, Alberto will be talking about metamorphic degassing of abiotic methane at convergent margins. Thank you. Uh, tick, tick, tick. I'm not sure how it works. First of all, thanks uh, DCO and, and the organizer of this meeting to giving me the opportunity to present my work at this very last meeting. Um, I'm very happy about that. I think that metamorphic degassing of abiotic methane at convergent margins is something very, very important to our community. Um, the session is about quantities and movements of deep carbon, but I really think that this topic is important to all the EDCO communities. Deep energy, of course, it's methane, it's energy. Deep life, um, extreme chemistry and physics, and um, reservoir and fluxes. It's very important to all of us and all the DCO communities are concerned. There is just a very small psychological barrier to overcome. It is that there is absolutely no methane in subduction zones, according to our models. All models we have are based on CO2. There's just CO2, always, always CO2. Um, and I have colleagues saying that, yes, but this is just a proxy for carbon. It has no sense to me. It's like saying that there is 40% quartz in olivine. It has no sense. Um, the problem is that this affects uh, strongly our everyday observations in the field, for example, and back in the lab, our interpretations and our new budgets, because we are looking for these CO2 and processes uh, capable to produce CO2 in subduction zones. Obviously, there is methane in subduction zones, and potentially a lot. But the problem is that we uh, do not have a clear picture about these fluxes, how this methane forms, how these fluxes uh, potentially overlap with these CO2 fluxes. We, we just don't know. So this is not just the control but is most likely a bias. So I would like to uh, start with the very important contribution that DCO scientists uh, have provided to, to this topic over the last decade from both uh, e experimental and natural samples uh, studies. And then move to a brief summary of what we know about the processes, the uh, signatures, and the fluxes of this deep abiotic methane at convergent margins, and conclude with uh, an example of very unexpected side effects of these processes at depth. Experimental results, the DCO decades have, has witnessed 
very important experimental results on this topic. Just a few examples. PT limits of deep hydrocarbon thin synthesis by calcium carbonate uh, aqueous reduction. Redox effects on calcite portlandite Portland fluid equilibria at 4R conditions. And then immiscible hydrocarbon fluids in the deep carbon cycle. This is very important because almost for the first time we have an idea about how these gases form, their stability field, and their speciation at subduction zone conditions. And I wanted to show you just one example that is, it has been very important for me as a field geologist and metamorphic petrologist. These are immiscible hydrocarbon fluids in aqueous, uh, uh, at, uh, sorry, hydrocarbons in aqueous fluids at high pressure and, and temperature conditions consistent with uh, what metamorphic rocks experience in subduction zones. What you see here are small droplets of immiscible hydrocarbons. So when, this is very important to me as a field geologist because when I'm in the field and trying to figure out how these fluids form, uh, how they move in deep rocks in very small pores, at very high pressure conditions, it's very hard. And this uh, has given me a picture of about how they are at depth. This is very important. And just keep this image in mind for the next slide. Then natural samples. In this case, it's not just if, for example, methane or other hydrocarbons are stable, but also the fact that they are stable, they exist at depth. One example is our uh, paper about massive production of abiotic methane in ultramafic rocks at blue sheet spaces conditions, so about 40 kilometers depth. And another one, very important one, about hydrocarbon formation in mafic rocks in, in China, in Tianshan, China. And when we have the opportunity to look inside the rocks and, and, and see how these gases formed, what we find is that they are immiscible. This is just an example of two coexisting fluids trapped in two different coexisting fluid inclusion populations. One is methane and hydrogen, the other one is methane, hydrogen, and water. So this is just the natural expression of this. It makes sense, and this has been a huge achievement for us again, from a field perspective, and I think also for the lab. Then the question is, are these gases, is this methane common? Is this, is this relevant or just something uh, strange in subduction zones? And I can tell you that it is common. These are examples of methane hydrogen-rich fluids from different uh, metamorphic belts around the world that tells to us that it is not just common, but it has accompanied subduction over geological timescales, mountain belts with very different ages. So it is relevant. And all these methane-rich fluids could have formed through the combination of different carbon and hydrogen sources, which are very diverse at depth in subduction zones, carbon from subducted carbonates or graphitic carbon, or fluid deposited graphite or carbonates, then dehydration fluids produced or equilibrated with different rock types at depth, sediments, oceanic crust, ultramafic rocks, and so on and so on, or hydration fluids produced at depth from, for example, uh, deep serpentinization processes. So there's a huge combination of, of um, sources for these deep fluids, and of course, a wide range of potential processes to produce deep abiotic methane and signatures and fluxes. I'm gonna show you some examples of these uh, processes, signatures and, and fluxes. Carbonate reduction appears to be probably the most common uh, process at depth. And once again, during the DCO decade, several papers have uh, shown evidence for this process at depth. The first one, or the first three papers about this topic investigated the uh, reduction of carbonate in marbles in contact with serpentinites at blue sheet spaces conditions, about 40 kilometers depth. This is a special case 
because there is clear evidence for reduction, but there is, there is no, no evidence for methane degassing. The carbon budget across this reaction zone is perfectly balanced, so the carbonate goes into graphite with any carbon loss, so no methane degassing. This is a special case. Then, again, our paper. The, the, the process is slightly different in our interpretation. This is percolation of hydrogen-rich fluids into uh, carbonated ultramafic rocks and production of large amounts of methane. This is, all these uh, bubbles are methane-rich. And again, this very important example from China, this is reduction of carbonate in mafic eclogites. This is important because mafic eclogites are the keyword of subduction zone metamorphism. So having methane produced in this rock is very important to change, uh, at least in part, our mind about the fluid being produced at depth. Okay, second process, we don't know much about it, is graphite hydrogenation. We propose this process as a side process in the alpine um, reduced uh, carbonated ultramafic rocks. This is fluid deposited graphite here in black, this is methane and hydrogen fluids being produced at some stage during the evolution. We think that at least part of this methane could have been produced through uh, graphite hydrogenation. This kind of reaction is considered to be very slug sluggish, sluggish at low pressure and temperature conditions, but we don't know if it is more efficient at high pressure and temperature conditions. This is a video of uh, the um, DFDMD uh, simulations Pauline Buckley has been doing. Um, and you can see, can I start it again? Yes. You can see that uh, hydrogen and, and graphite react together and at some state, buff, some method is formed. We are still working on this simulation to estimate the rates of these reactions. It's gonna take a little bit of time, but this kind of reaction is possible. Then the reducing agent, we have to produce methane and having hydrogen rich fluids is very important. There, might be many processes, but I think that the most important one is deep serpentinization. So it's the equivalent of what we know at seafloor conditions or in ophiolites, but happening at great depth. And we have examples of this. I presented a poster, poster yesterday. This is serpentinization of olivine rocks in, in the subducting slabs of the, of the Western Alps. And uh, there is serpentine forming along cracks, exactly the same patterns as low temperature serpentinization. And together with Dmitry Zvergensky, we have modeled these reactions at high pressure and temperature conditions, and we see exactly what we need. The FO2 decreases during the water rock interaction, and a lot of hydrogen and, 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 and methane, if some carbon is there, can form. And once again, we can couple this kind of modeling with the natural samples. These are just two examples from uh, tectonic units uh, that went down to one GPA and two GPA, fluid inclusions. And what we find in the fluid inclusion is a lot of methane and hydrogen here and there. But this methane and hydrogen are not alone. There is ethane, there is H2S, and there is also ammonia, which has never been found in uh, geological fluids, especially at depth. And look at the composition of these fluid inclusions. Hydrogen, methane, H2S, ammonia. This is almost everything deep life needs to exist and survive. And everything is in deep fluid inclusions. This is great. Signatures, this is very simple, unknown. We know uh, this kind of discrimination based on delta 13C of methane and, 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 and delta D. We know that it is, it, it doesn't always work, but it provides some, at least some, some, some insight with abiotic gases in here and biotic gases there. And we wanted to play with this kind of, of, of um, uh, classification. We have the gases, we crushed the samples and extracted the gases. And our very first result uh, plots here. It's not even on the diagram. So these gases are exotic compared to what we are used to uh, observe and measure at low pressure conditions. There is a lot of work to be done on these rocks. The extraction is not simple at all. So uh, I think that the DCO legacy will help in the future. We have done the same thing with other samples from 
different uh, localities with different techniques. Alps, this is also the Alps, and this is a, a very nice example from, from the US. And you can see that there is a quite uh, large range of uh, delta 13 C signatures of this meth methane, and this probably reflects different sources and, 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 and potentially processes at that. Of course, the next step is going to be uh, uh, the clamped isotope technique. This is not simple. We need to extract a lot of gas. Then fluxes, unconstrained. We don't know anything about the fluxes. We are still trying to compile a list of potential processes. But what I can say, this is based on my feelings and, and what, I can, uh, what I have studied in the natural sample, is that they could be very large. And we need a bottom-up approach. We need to define how this methane forms, how it evolves at depth, and also how it affects other carbon reservoirs. And this brings uh, us to the uh, last slide that is about unexpected results or effects. This is a sentence uh, taken from this, I, I think, very important paper um, that says, low FO2 may amplify the already significant enhancement of calcite solubility by pressure and temperature. So this basically means that if we have a very reduced fluid, infant, fluid infiltrating a carbonate rock, the potential to dissolve and mobilize carbon is enhanced. How does it work in natural sample? This is a carbonated uh, serpentinite. All the white stuff is carbonate, and there is no reduction in this sample. Delta 13C of the bulk rock is about one per mil, so nothing special, no reduction. And this is what happens when a, a hydrogen methane-rich fluid percolates through the rock. A strong channelization, the delta 13C of carbonate goes from one to 12%. This means a lot of methane production. And you can also see that this zone here is highly strained, so a lot of deformation. So this is not just methane generation, but also strain localization. And Francesco Giuntoli has done a very careful job in characterizing these shear zones and obtained estimates from, for the strain rates along these shear zones and got velocity that are, that are not so different from seismic velocity. So there might be very unexpected side effects during the evolution and migration of these fluids at depth. In conclusion, we don't know much about this deep methane. We know that it is down there, and uh, it is not present in our models. This is something that we have to fix. I think this is very important for our community. Deep methane is not alone. Other hydrocarbons and potentially important species are there too. The range of signatures is potentially large, and could overlap with other sources, so the detection of these gases at shallower depth could be very challenging. Fluxes are unconstrained, but potentially very large, and again, this is very deep energy. We should care about these fluxes. And unexpected side effects uh, on carbon mobility and dynamics of subduction zones uh, may also be important. This is what I would like to develop in a project. Uh, I don't know if this project is going to be funded one day, but I would really like to thank the DCO for the support with a very nice letter. And I want to leave you with this announcement. We will uh, have the next Serpentine Days next year in Sestri Levante, Italy. Many DCO scientists are involved. We have very uh, nice plans for those who like serpentinites and ophicarbonates, and we also have nice plans for those who don't like <laughs> serpentinites and ophicarbonates. So if you're interested in, please visit the website or come to me for details. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Alberto. Uh, we have time for one quick question. Thanks, Alberto. That was really fun. Uh, one of the things that happened at the very first deep carbon meeting is we had one group of scientists who rather provocatively said 100% of all hydrocarbons are biological. And, and another group said, to contrast that, 100% are abiological. Do you have any sense, or does anybody in the room now have a feeling that it's someplace in the middle, it's not 100% one or the other, but do you have any 
just intuitive feeling yourself about what percentage this might represent? I have no idea. <laughs> and, and to be honest, I, I, I would like to stay in the middle and share thoughts on both sides. But I think that the, 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 the important um, message of what I've been doing on these uh, systems is that we are not considering the potentially largest source of purely abiotic gases on Earth, that is subduction. There's nothing. If you check all the papers about abiotic methane on Earth, subduction is never mentioned. So maybe it's not going to explain all the uh, uh, oil reservoirs and everything, but just give it a try. Great. Thank you very much. And Thanks in the interest of time, we'll move on to our next speaker. So it's my pleasure to invite Cara Magna Bosco up, to, up on the stage. Um, Cara is a member of the Deep Life community and was awarded the DCO Emerging Leader Award this year. She was unable to receive the award on Wednesday because of a flight cancellation, but after this session, uh, we will re-invite her back on stage and so she can get the award. Um, Cara Magna Bosco just started her uh, a, a, a professorship, an assistant professorship at ETH Zurich in the Earth Science Department, and uh, she came from the Flatirons Institute of the Simons Foundation before that and uh, got a PhD at Princeton University with Talis Onstad. Her research focuses on the development of computational methods for investigating the co-evolution of life and the Earth, and uh, she had a very, uh, very nice paper that was received a lot of publicity last year in which she provided the first comprehensive estimate of microbial biomass in subsurface terrestrial ecosystems, and that was published in Nature Geosciences. And I believe that um, paper is also the title of her talk today. So um, with that, please, Kara, come on stage. Okay. All right, thank you, Mark, for the introduction, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation to uh, speak to you today. And um, this topic that I'm going to talk to you about is um, something that sort of came over the years through many interactions and discussions with the various members of the Deep Life community, and so I hope uh, you guys will enjoy what we have to say about the controls of biomass and biodiversity in the subsurface. And so to start off, uh, I just want to take you back underground. And luckily, Barbara gave a really nice talk yesterday to talk about sort of this relationship between the water and the microbes living deep underground. And so just to you know, reintroduce this kind of idea, I'll show one summary slide from many years of work um, that we did have done in South Africa, where we've been trying to understand what are the controls and metabolisms of deep life, and how does that influence um, the fluids in which they live, and vice versa, how do they, the fluids influence the microbial communities. And so what I'm showing here on this slide are just um, two different mines, Beatrix and Tautona. And you can see that one is a shallower site at 1.3 kilometers underground, and this has a bit more oxidizing fluids. And there's another site, Tautona, which is three kilometers underground and has much more reducing fluids. And if we do some 16S analysis, what we can find is that the more oxidizing environment is dominated by this group of microbes called proteobacteria, well, the reducing environment is, is much more, uh, has many less species, is really dominated by these Firmicutes um, organisms. And if we go and say, okay, so why might this occur? We can see that the microbes are actually eating different sources of carbon, and so the carbon that's available in the environment is really driving some of, uh, driving why we see the patterns that we see as far as species. And that is just exhibited here by looking at the delta 13 c value of various types of carbon. Here you have the DOC, DIC, and methane. And then we also have um, the 13C composition of the lipids of the microbial population, which are here in Beatrix, suggesting that you have microbes eating methane. And that up here, you see the PLFA is sitting below the DIC, which is indicative of more autotrophic communities. And the microbes there, these firmicutes, are really doing autotrophic processes, um, eating the DIC. 
And so we've done many, many studies to really think about these patterns from who's there, um, what is active through uh, metagenomics, RNA-seq, and metabolomics, proteomics, and also um, just thinking about over time how changes in these uh, small fluctuations in electron acceptor availability will actually influence who's there. But the big question that uh, we've been left with and what we've been really trying to pursue are, are these controls of chemistry and uh, microbial diversity really tied to each other globally? And so that set about a really uh, integrative effort um, through those collaborators in the first slide um, to go about trying to estimate um, the controls of biomass and biodiversity in the continental subsurface. And so here is an interactive map that you can recover um, from this website here, showing all the sites that have um, sampled the deep subsurface and cell counts from each of these dots. What you'll see here is just the figure showing uh, two main trends that I want to point out. Here you have cell density on the x-axis and the depth um, at which the sample was recovered. And you'll see that there's this relationship of a decrease in cellular abundances with depth. And then here I've highlighted this samples from Monterey, which is a clay. Um, and you'll see that the cell counts from this site sit on the upper end of this distribution of cells at a few hundred meters depth. And actually this trend is something that we see, that we actually have clays having much higher cellular abundances, metamorphic rocks having um, lower cellular abundances, and basalts having the least, the lowest cell numbers. And, and um, wanted to know whether or not we can actually predict the distribution of microbial abundances globally, and whether or not these are really the true controls. And so what we did was take ideas from machine learning to develop models to predict um, how many cells live within the continental subsurface using things like feature selection, cross-validation, weighted bootstraps to build the best model um, to predict subsurface cellular abundances. And what we found was that, yes, indeed, depth was a major parameter on controlling cell how many cells are present at a given point. And uh, crustal composition was a good proxy for this lithology trend that we're, we're observing in the cell densities with depth. And so if you plot these distributions globally, what you'll see is, is just that. You'll see that the orogenic regions have the lowest cell densities, whereas these shields have higher cell cellular abundances, um, going from yellow being the lowest to blue being the most. And that regions that have the largest amount of habitable zone, the largest habitable regions, meaning they, the, the, the points at which you reach uh, 122 degrees Celsius, 35 degrees Celsius is the deepest, so you're actually integrating over the largest areas. Those have contain the largest number of cells in the subsurface. And so when you add all of these numbers up across the subsurface to say how many cells actually are there in the continental subsurface, you get this number, which is five to six times 10 to the 29th cells, which very big number and would be enough cells to cover the surface of Jupiter. And if we convert this, this number to some sort of amount of carbon, what we get is 11 to 12 petagrams of carbon, which if they were diamonds and distributed to the total global population, everyone would be a billionaire. So it's too bad they're microbes, but <laughs> that'll do. <laughs> and, um, this just, uh, just further confirmed that, you know, this subsurface biosphere is really a huge reservoir of microbial um, cells. And the next question will be about, you know, whether or not the fact that we have so many cells living underground, does that mean that most of the microbial diversity is actually stored underground as well? But just to point out here, um, the continental subsurface is only a small subset of, you know, total microbial um, cellular abundances, and that we also have marine set estimate from um, various members in here, Jans Kallmeier, uh, 2012, and some idea of the marine crust, which is, uh, as Beth mentioned, being actively worked on to, to be better, and Rob is up here. Um, so this may change somewhat, 
um, in the near future, but overall you can see that, yes, um, combined these account for over 70% of the microbial cells um, in the world should be underground. So now we've talked a lot about, uh, so now it's kind of described how uh, lithology and, and probably the chemistry, the water chemistry, is, is driving how many cells we see. The next question is, does this same driver, lithology, influence the microbes that are actually living um, there? So what types of organisms we see? And so here is just uh, NMDS plus. It's very busy, but yes, we do see exactly this. We see that lithology is driving, uh, is correlated to community composition. And so this is a very busy figure, I apologize, but what you're seeing here is an NMDS plot where each point on the, on the 2D plane is the distance between them is meant to reflect the distance um, between the community composition. And as you can see, both in the archaeal community, you have metamorphic populations clustering together, um, sedimentary, as well as here again. You see this kind of trend. And if you do some statistics, you do see that, indeed, there is some relationship between um, lithology and the microbes that we see. And so, clearly, there's this relationship of, of energy and rocks that are really driving one another. And the next uh, thing that we want to know is, does, can we think of, say, the process that leads to the patterns that we see? Can we think of, say, a, a process that would generate um, the microbial abundances and the diversity? And so that gets to how can we link the numbers of individuals to the types of species we see? And so to do that, we turn to some, some earlier work by um, Curtis and Lucien Lennon, which, which began a, a discussion from the uh, theoretical ecology side to think about the distribution of um, species. And so what you'll see here is just what looks like a normal curve. This is what would be if species were distributed following a log normal distribution. And um, what, what they propose is that if if your species are following this kind of distribution, you should be able to predict the total number of species in an environment using three simple parameters. N min, which would be one, and so one, the least abundant species will have only one individual uh, representing it, and um, N max, which would be how many cells there are for the most abundant species, and this term, and total, which would be sort of uh, what we were describing, five times 10 to the 29th cells. And, and so um, Losey and Lennon proposed a way to get N max from, from N, a scaling law. And when you do that, you get a very big, a very big uncertainty um, because of how you may estimate N max. So it's, it's unclear whether or not this is the right way to go about approaching it, but it, it provides a really interesting framework because if we think about say, how, what the distribution of um, microbial cells versus the, what the spe these species curves look like, we can get a lot of insight into what process would generate such a curve mathematically, and we can study various cur curves, seeing how the species are distributed, and really get a much tighter understanding of how to model um, the speciation and diversification process happening underground. And so, with that, I just want to conclude that with the fact that, yes, indeed, um, we have this really intricate tie between what is the constraints the environment is placing on things like biomass and biodiversity. And the big question is, can we take that and project that into more global models, not just of the current environment, but thinking about this throughout deep time? And so it's something we're very much looking forward to, to working on. And with that, I'd like to thank, um, additionally, in addition to the authors of the paper, this group of wonderful collaborators who inspired many of the ideas and cohesive discussions about you know, what exactly could be the controls and limits of deep life, as well as just put out a shameless plug that uh, and the new group is hiring, so check here for
for announcements of job calls. So thank you. Thanks, Kara. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, so clearly you have to base these estimates on just a few sample, far fewer samples than you would prefer to have. You know, it's just hard to get them. Do you have an estimate for how much effect that has on the overall total biomass estimates and the total, total diversity estimates? Like, is it going to change things, change things by orders of magnitude or like by half if we can get better sampling? Yes, okay, so the diversity one you can see even with uh, the, the sampling you already have three orders of magnitude difference based on this, this curve and um, so, right, and if you looked at um, the, the slide where we had the histogram of, of what the continental data set looked like, there are many big gaps which means there was a clear undersampling issue um, preventing us from really getting a good handle on that estimate and so I think, yeah, we need to explore more, get more samples so that we can reach this limit. And then um, another feature I didn't point out was in this map, of course, when we look at um, the biomass estimates, there are certain regions of the globe that are, are, are less well represented, mainly in the southern hemisphere. And so, so the way that we try to overcome that is by using um, things like composi crustal composition as a way to take our cell counts from the surface as a way to project them down. And so, of course, as we start getting more information on, on those sites, we'll have a better understanding if this is really a control. Perhaps if, if South, Africa, uh, South America ends up looking like all of a sudden they have many less cells living there than, than someone on the surface, these, these estimates may drop dramatically. But assuming that the main control is in fact chemistry and say crustal composition, one, one wouldn't expect that um, this sampling issue would would cause dramatic uh, differences. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. There are none, then thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> and we'll conclude this uh, first session in the morning uh, with our keynote speaker, uh, Chris Ballantyne, who is a member of the Deep Energy Community and also Steering Committee member uh, uh, within this community. And he's a professor and chair of geochemistry of the, in, in the Department of Earth Sciences at University of Oxford. And um, his research focuses on the chemistry of natural systems to understand the origin of our solar system, uh, the evolution of life, and the mechanisms that have changed Earth from its formation until today. And he uses uh, noble gases for much of his research, and he'll be talking about the use of helium um, from the uh, lithosphere to uh, trace and, and better understand the, the deep carbon cycle on Earth. So with that, Chris. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, it's, it's, it's a huge pleasure to be standing here after, after a decade of seeing the DCO evolve and change and all of the fantastic science that's been done to that. And I would like to say a huge thank you uh, both to Bob Hazen and all of the other uh, key leaders who have led this process, but also the Secretariat who have done an amazing job of making these, making these meetings work uh, seamlessly and smoothly. And it's, it's, just, it's a pleasure to come to these meetings and meet friends, meet colleagues, and see actually fantastic science. Um, so, juice. Where would we be without juice? Um, to look at juice, we need good scientists. And I, and I particularly want to highlight um, uh, Annie Cheng. Uh, she presented a poster uh, earlier in this uh, session. And Can you hear me better? Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Annie Cheng. I'll be talking uh, more about the work that she was presenting as a poster. Oliver War, um, he gave a, a really great talk. And of course, we have been working for a long, a, a long time now with um, Barbara Show with Lola. But I also want to really mention the many other people that have, been, that have contributed to aspects of this work over the, over the, last, de over the last decade. Uh, oh, and of course, uh, juice. So this is a particularly important juice. This is a juice that has got a, a Precambrian flavor. Um, it's a, a particular vintage, probably a couple of giga years old. And that is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, these fluids come from the continental crust. The continental crust, for a long period of time, 
has largely been ignored, partly because of accessibility, partly because we just don't think it's that exciting. The continental crust is deep, inaccessible, reactions don't happen very fast there, and it is only in the last decade or so that we've really started to recognize the importance of the processes that are occurring in the continental crust and the impact those processes might have both on understa our understanding of life in deep environments, life at the extreme, uh, and also when you release those fluids, release those biota into shallow regions, the impact they may have on surface processes and a whole variety of uh, uh, com components that, that are associated with that. So the continental crust, it's four times the mass of the um, oceanic crust. Um, and we might think of the continental crust more like a tortoise. It is slow, things happen a little bit slowly, but it gets there. And what gets there is really important compared to the hair of the oceanic crust. The oceanic crust, you know, that's an exciting place to work. Things happen quick. There's a lot of biota and processes that we can make some really great scientific uh, discoveries uh, by, by looking at. But the continental crust isn't just a large mass, but it's a huge repository that has stored the reaction products for a long period of time. And sudden release of those reaction products or even the slow release of those reaction products can have a, an, an impact on near surface systems. So, and Bar Bar Barbara has very nicely uh, termed this the sleeping giant. And indeed it is. The, pre the, the uh, pre Precambrian continental crust has one more really important ingredient and that's water. We have a largely mafic, uh, largely mafic environment and this is a very nice graphic from, uh, from, from the USGS. This is, if we took all of the water on the planet and put it into a little sphere, this is what it would look like. Fresh surface water is almost inconsequential, but subsurface water can be split almost 50-50 between fresh underground water resources, essential for society, but an equal volume will be found as saline water within the Precambrian crust. And as soon as we have that water, we have the reaction of that water with the mafic environment. With serpentinization in particular, it doesn't occur very fast in the continental crust. In fact, it's very slow. But we have that mass leverage. We have that huge volume of continental crust to generate large amounts of methane over long periods of time. Because we're looking at long periods of time, there is another mechanism to generate hydrogen, and that's, hydro uh, that, that's um, uh, radiolysis. So the natural concentrations of uranium and thorium in the continental crust will generate ionizing radiation. And through excitation and ionization, we will generate hydrogen as products of that process. And because ionization, uh, ionizing radiation, helium uh, as, as alpha particles is part of that process, we have a natural relationship then between helium and hydrogen produced through that process. And we can look at the total system when we, when, when we go down underground, and we can see the products of the water rock interaction and the radiolysis in our fluid systems. We have highly saline fracture fluids, for example. We've seen many pictures of, of the uh, underground environment. These are all very rich in the hydrogen that is generated over these long periods of time accompanied by significant quantities of helium. Some of these mine gases contain up to 30% by volume helium, with the rest of the gas being made up with hydrogen, nitrogen, and methane formed from uh, abiogenic reactions, Fischer trope synthesis, uh, uh, bringing all of these components together. We have a very complex mixture of gases which control the ability of those environments to host life and to con uh, control and contain the uh, chemical reactions of mig any migrating fluids. Most importantly, these fluids are, in terms of mass, as important as the fast reactions that are, are occurring at the mid-ocean ridges. When you sum the total reaction rate of methane, uh, or rather of hydrogen being generated within the continental crust, uh, the 
radiolysis and the hydration of the Precambrian continental crust is the same at the same level uh, as the generation of hydrogen at mid-ocean ridges. And about 30% of that production is in fact by, by radiolysis. So what we really do have with helium is, is a mechanism to track where these fluids are, going, are, are coming from. And let's see if I can, I'm a slide, slide shy. So in terms of mass balance, the, the, uh, the, the, the methane, the hydrogen generated is uh, uh, critical, and we can use helium in particular to trace uh, these, these processes and reaction mechanisms. Um, we've already heard a lot about the, uh, from, from Barbara and Oliver, of the mine fluids, and in particular from Kid Creek, uh, there's also data from Sudbury. This is uh, some very nice work that Oliver War has produced. Certainly in 2013, we were, we were showing that the noble gas accumulation ages, so that is just the raw amount of time it takes to generate the amount of helium-4, the amount of argon-40, the amount of xenon produced by the fission of uh, uranium. The in situ ages, we're looking at, uh, we're, we're about 1.2 giga years. Resampling those at a deeper level, we're, we're finding in situ accumulation ages of about 2, point, uh, about, uh, two giga, giga years in age. When we go back to some of those uh, more, more shallow samples, um, we find now that they've younged, suggesting that those, those fluids that we originally sampled, those pristine fluids um, exposed by the mining activity at the time, have mixed with slightly younger fluids, starting to give us an insight into how that fluid regime is connected, and certainly in the case of mining activity, how it responds to a changing stress, stress regime within that system. Uh, we've also uh, looked at and extended the, 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 the study. We've got um, samples from the, the Sudbury impact crater, uh, mines down to 1.7 kilometers depth, separate mine down to 1.4 kilometers depth. Again, these mines are showing that the fluids in these environments are incredibly old. This, was really, quite, this really was quite a surprise to find, find that these fluids are not uh, recharged, they're not flushed, they're not pushed out. These are just sitting there accumulating all of the reaction products over a long period of time. So we're generating conceptual ideas of how these are stored, the environment in which they're stored in, how they respond certainly on anthropogenic timescales to, to, to mining activities. If we have systems of fractures containing these fluids, older ones tend to be more deeper than, than, uh, than, than uh, younger samples, younger, younger fractures. If we sample and through boreholes the fluids and then the mine r relaxes we see more fractures we see mixing we explain the younging of those fluids whereas the pristine samples exposed by the active uh, active mine workings are giving us the old and, and uh, old pristine samples But this generates um, a really interesting, it's not a problem, this is, this, this is um, a conceptual view of what these fluids are doing. These fluids are being generated, they are being stored on huge geological timescales, planetary scale, uh, pla planetary timescales. But what impact do these fluids that are generating and operating in the deep crust have on near surface environments? How do they release, how do they, uh, how, how do they um, get out of the deep crust? What's the mechanism there of their release? What is their rate of release? What amount is released? And what reaches the near surface? 
hydrogen is quite reactive. Methane is quite reactive. There's potential for chem chemical reactions and biological reactions, removing those en route to the near surface. When it reaches the near surface, what impact does it have on the surface systems? Are there volumes and masses that can impact the, the atmosphere? Maybe not so important for Earth, but, but on other planets, when you're considering release of deep gases, the masses that can be released could impact uh, thin atmospheres. When you are removing the fluids from the, the, uh, the deep environment, what impact does that have on the deep biosphere if indeed we're looking at environments which are hosting microbial activity? And uh, back, back, back on Earth, we are interested in resources. There are potential uses of finding clean energy. Can we find hydrogen within the deep subsurface? Can we find helium within the deep subsurface that society can use? So spin-outs from the, the DCO activities is not just carbon, but all of these tools and techniques that we're using to follow the carbon uh, in their own right, we're making, uh, making significant uh, advances in our understanding of where the hydrogen exists, where the helium exists, and how we might exploit that new understanding of those systems. And I'll be using pretty much uh, noble gases, mainly helium, to just illustrate some of these, some of these processes. So helium, as I've said, it's fundamentally related to hydrogen generation through radiolysis. Helium, within the mine studies, we can look at the relationship between helium and the hydrocarbons, helium and the methane, helium and the nitrogen, helium and the hydrogen. And dependent on the tectonic environment that we're looking at, we can use the surface expression of helium to start to understand the mechanisms that are responsible for releasing the deep fluids and bringing those deep fluids to the surface. For example, this is a, 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 just a schematic of a rifting system. And we might need to consider, for example, the role of the, the, the mechanism of gas release from the minerals to the mineral interfaces, from the mineral interfaces to the fractures, from the fractures to the near surface and the role of the other fluids in the environment in potentially providing vectors to bring those deep fluids to the surface. We clearly see the role of substantial and punctuated release um, of deep fluids um, in many environments. We can see, uh, this is a very nice study from um, Jacob Lowenstern from the USGS published in Nature a, a few years ago. Uh, the plume underneath Yellowstone is clearly putting a huge thermal pulse into the stable continental crust, and it is mobilizing and releasing a vast amount of helium. It's one of the largest helium fluxes measured at the, at, at the Earth's surface. And every million years, just the Yellowstone spot itself is releasing, excuse the, uh, the, um, the units, 13 billion cubic feet of, of helium. 13 billion cubic feet, to give you um, some context, um, our, our, our society uses about 6 billion cubic feet of helium uh, per year, and that is being degassed just at the Yellowstone, uh, Yellowstone hotspot. Once it's into the atmosphere, it's lost to space, and we can no longer use that, obviously. Um, we see the role of the tectonic environment in releasing those deep fluids in... Uh, other rifting systems. This is a study you now a little while ago by uh, uh, Van de Ketel in 1999, looking at the, the Eggergraben, it's a, a, an offshoot from the, from the Rheingraben in the Czech Republic. And here we see a, a volcanic center with a large amount of carbon dioxide being degassed. And then as we move away from that thermal aureole, we see a transfer from carbon dioxide, magmatic gases, and at the edge of that aureole, we see nitrogen and helium being released. Um, and that is, that is the deep fluid uh, that we have access to at the surface. These are potentially uh, exciting areas to study not just the flux of helium 
in the center, but the nature and character of the deep fluids that are reaching the surface and from those not be completely reliant on the, on the mines and deep boreholes, but we have access to some deep fluids and their surface expression through some of these, these environments, which we haven't really exploited yet. And if you want to bring all of those together, uh, clearly where you're going to release the largest amount of deep fluids is where you have fresh activity, fresh rifting, fresh volcanism. And this is looking at the uh, Rukwa uh, section of the uh, Tanzanian East African Rift. Invariably, you will find deep carbon observatory scientists. Uh, and I think Pete has found, Pete Barry has found some uh, exciting gas. And that gas is, the gas bubbling out here is almost pure helium. This is, this is a 10% uh, helium, 90% nitrogen bubbling out of these springs exactly where you predict it from, from, from that thermal, uh, thermal pulse uh, concept. But it's not just the exciting places. It's not just where the volcanic activity is taking place. We know that the deep gases are slowly leaking out of the continental crust all of the time. I'm going to just move forward. We can see helium in this fellow Scandian shield. We see helium in many other environments. I just want to very quickly show you some modeling work that Annie Chen, Cheng has been doing, looking at helium escaping through the fairly stable intracontinental basins. And this is the Williston Basin in Canada. We can derive the helium concentration in gas samples. We can extrapolate the gas samples and calculate the helium concentration in the groundwater. Several of these samples demand that we have a helium flux into the system. The helium concentrations are older than the amount you can generate in situ. Several of the samples are lower than the, the, than the in situ rate, suggesting that there's been flushing of that process. We can generate a simple one-dimensional model solving the transport equations, in this case for uh, diffusion. We can build up the helium profile for each um, of the different lithologies, stack those lithologies up on, each, up, up on each other, taking into account porosity change, taking into account diffusion coefficient changes with temperature. And we can, we can see the helium concentration grow in the groundwater as those lithologies are stacked onto each other. They will reach steady state and stop. They will stick on another aquitard, move to steady state again, move to steady state again. Any second now, we're going to put on the Colorado shale. And you see this rapidly puts a lid on the system and increases the helium content to the base of that aquifer system. Take into account flushing of shallow aquifers. And we have a very good match with a really simple model for understanding uh, deep fluid release into shallow sedimentary systems. This modeling approach gives us a, a, a really good sense of the flux of helium entering the base of these systems. And we understand from that the impact of helium interpretation in term, uh, if, if we want to date those groundwater systems. And very simply, to summarize, we know that the volumes of fluids in the deep continental crust evolve over time. Large amounts are kept down there, but we see material that is accumulated, released. And it's not just the exciting places where, we, where that release occurs. I've shown you the helium flux. I'm going to show you one more slide. If we couple the nitrogen with that helium flux, in that same helium profile, we can look at the nitrogen profile. And what we find, as soon as you incorporate nitrogen into these models, is that the nitrogen concentration exceeds the solubility for the groundwater system. As soon as you exceed the solubility for the groundwater system, you generate a free gas phase. The helium is insoluble. It goes into the free gas phase. And we generate a nitrogen-helium free gas phase, which forms 
a future resource for helium exploration. And this particular work is giving us a new helium exploration play concept. If we need to find helium, we don't need to just go to where it's exciting. Go to some of these slow places. Go to some of these places that have been accumulating deep crustal fluids for hundreds of millions of years. And that is, what we will, that is where we will find, in this case, helium. And it is just one of many of the collaterals that the Deep Carbon Observatory has allowed us to develop with the science that we've, that we've been doing. No, thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. If there are no questions, then thank you very much. And thanks to all speakers from this morning. And uh, before you all run off, uh, please welcome Craig Manning to stage. So we heard this once before. We're going to have a rerun uh, because Kara was not here on Thursday when we gave out the awards. So we'll give her a chance now to receive her uh, DCO Emerging Leader Award for 2019. Come on up. Coffee time. Thanks.
somehow stand back here. Stand back here. I know you're gonna stand up. Yeah, I am. No one's done it. Everyone's everyone's in front. I just want to stand back here and hide. So probably not as easy to see. Uh, I can just take this. I would do it. Oh, yeah. if you want. I'm gonna do it. No, no, you, you do too. Or not to. No one. No one's around. <laughs> Yeah, and then we're looking yeah. at to the controller. Right, because everyone's been so weird. Everyone's having trouble right? with it, but it seems like it's not like a pointer and then four. Wait. Yeah, I think back. this is forward. This is back. This is the laser. That's how so I it's just interpret easy to do it. This before your hands like. <laughs> exactly. I guess, guess you'll get confused with the green and green, green for the yeah. laser because right. feel of going forward. But that's so that's much why, bigger. And that's no one. That's how people are like hitting it. Yeah. Like, this, but but, and no one has been able to go backwards, so I'm curious yeah. about no, this one. Did. People did. Have, some did. people did. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because you know, even uh, Chris did. Because mm -hmm. that thing went well, that's forward true. and that's right. back. Right. And you can always ask them to. Yeah, and then there's another clock here if you want to.
Thank you. Uh, our next presentation uh, is by Benedict Menez, who's a professor at IPGP in Paris. Um, uh, she's, uh, even though she joined DCO through the Deep Life community, I think Deep Life, right? Yeah. She, uh, she has a foot in almost every other community, uh, reservoirs and fluxes, uh, deep energy, a little bit physics and carbon and, and chemistry of carbon. Uh, and you know, to me, she's, she's a poster child of DCO. Um, I'll let you make your own opinion. Uh, and so without further ado, Benedict Menez, you have the floor. Thank you, James. Thank you, James, for this introduction. So it's my great pleasure and honor to present you today some perspective we obtained uh, in the framework of the deep energy community on the abiotic organic synthesis during hydrothermal ad alteration of the oceanic lithospheres. So in fact, forms and origin of abiotic organic compounds naturally formed on Earth was one of the, the driving questions we had in this community because finding and understanding this process uh, represents a gate from the mineral world to the organic one with huge implications for deep life, for the origin of life, for extraterrestrial terrestrial life, but also for resources and energy. So we were a lot since a long time to focus on hydrothermal vents and especially alkaline noines that represent uh, open windows on the dynamics of serpentinizations. And it was reported in the literature since sometimes that in these vents we have uh, the attested presence of methane, but also organic acids, shorten alkanes, and, um, and uh, uh, at, the, at the outlet of the fluids. So there was a, a huge uh, 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 effort this last decade trying to understand how serpentinization due to the capability of producing uh, highly reduced fluids in the form of hydrogen, how this, uh, if this hydrogen was capable to transform uh, an inorganic carbon species into organic ones. And in theory, as you can see on this plot, which our work published recently by Vincent Milesi, you can see the evolution of the carbon speciation as a function of the reaction progress and you have at the beginning of the reaction the formation of a little bit of organic acid in the form of formates, but also you have a, 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 the, the methane that form and constitute the, the dominant product of this uh, 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 thermodynamic calculation. However, we now know that despite all this huge effort, most of the natural and experimental systems suggest a kinetic inhibition for the formation of methane at a temperature lower than 400 degrees. So we now wonder where does the methane from, and it is likely from higher temperature reactions, because, and it is suggested by the presence of the fluid inclusion that were reported some time ago, early in the 19th by David Kelly and Gretchen Fugin, and uh, this uh, ubiquitous presence of this methane-rich fluid inclusion in olivine-bearing rocks uh, could be uh, the largest reservoir of high temperature uh, abiotic methane on Earth and then could be the deep source for the methane that, are, that is vented at mid-oceanic ridge. So what can be the products and of the uh, reducing powers of serpentinization at lower temperatures? If you run, as Vincent did, a similar calculation by preventing methane to forms during serpentinization, then what you can see is that you have a little bit more of organic acid, formates and acetates, but at one point, the main product is what Vincent called the graphitic carbon, but we can call it more largely carbonaceous matters. But this should be the dominant product, product at low temperature. So do we have proof for that in, uh, in nature? So here I have the pleasure to present the work from Maris Forna that was recently published. And it's show you what was obtained on fully serpentinized artbergite that were collected here close to the location of Casal in a serpentinite outcropping uh, there. And then for those who are not uh, well used in the, the interpretation and, and of thin sections, then here I just summarize uh, 
what happened to this road, the main stage. So this road, rock is made of classical mineral we can find in mantle rocks, so olivine, or pyroxenes, pinons, and those rocks had, a, during their high temperature history, some uh, magmatic impregnation that uh, results in the formation of plagioclase. And then as the temperature decreased when those rocks were exhumed during their oceanic history, then the rocks start to alter due to water circulation and the, most of the minerals, so olivine and, and, and pyroxene, turn into serpentines. And then the, the spinels, but also the plagioclase, alter into uh, chloride and ferrochromite, where hydrogarnets were also formed during all these phases. You continue to decrease the temperature, then you form saponite from the former uh, alteration assemblage, and then hematites occur in this system. Why do I take some time to describe all these different minerals forming these rocks? Because at each stage of the alteration processes, then we observe, here it was thanks to scanning electron microscopy, we observe the formation of carbonaceous matter that related to each secondary minerals in this sample. So here this is the examples of the hydrogarnets. You can see also similarly this through the elemental distributions. But you can see here at the dark phase, because it's carbon, you can see thin film that are coating this hydroandrite. And Raman analysis of it can show you that there are aliphatic compounds. It also be a oxygen functional groups such as carboxyl ones. So, and the formation was related to local hydrogen production that is related to the formation of hydrogarnets. And probably in this case, the presence of chromium in hydrodite was also important because hydrodite that, like, that were lacking chromium were also lacking uh, carbonaceous matter. Perhaps one of the, one of the most impressive occurrence of carbonaceous compound in these samples were the ones that were associated with the hematite and the saponite. And you see here, this is as huge as the mineral phase, so large aggregates, uh, more than 100 micron in size. And then this really fill all the saponite and the crack, and probably if the reaction, the reaction has continued, it will have progress and progress. So you can see here on the Raman spectra, the blue part show you that the composition is a little bit different compared to the other generation. So we have aromatic compounds, but a little bit less of, of oxygens. And here it was related to hydrogen generation during the formation of hematite, and likely also supported by the well-known uh, catalyst uh, um, power of the iron-rich saponite. So the strict spatial association between this uh, organic phase and, and the, the mineral phase uh, really uh, support the idea that this, this carbonaceous matter could have been occurred simultaneously to the growth of the host mineral assemblages. And all this carbonaceous matter has variable size elemental composition. Here you can find one model that was estimated based on the whole spectroscopy data. So this elemental composition, but also the aromaticity, the presence of aromatic cycles, the aliphaticity, the change of aliphatic components likely reflects the formation modes, the environmental conditions, but also some limiting factors at the local scale, such as the presence of catalysts. So I show you one example, but here are all the rocks we looked at during the project, and it's really suggested that this condensed, carbon, condensed carbonaceous matter is ubiquitous in such kind of environment, and this could be a widespread processes associated to hydrothermal system. So does this fraction, totally unaccounted so far, has a global significance? Maybe for deep life, does it mean that it's, it, we have an additional bioavailable source of carbon for subsurface microbes, especially in serpentinization related environment where in some place pH, pH is so high that inorganic carbon sources are lacking. 
So if you look at some metagenomic data we obtain in our groups that came from a basaltic aquifer at 500 meter depths, then you can see that in all the genes that are carried by the microbial community of these aquifers, and in addition to the one that relate to the sulfur, iron, and nitrogen cycles, then a huge part of the genes that related to carbons are degradation of aromatic compounds. Does it have a relationship with the carbonaceous matter? This is something we have to look into detail in the future. But that means that maybe this is not a refractory uh, component uh, trapped in the deep earth. And as it, as it was suggested in, in the 19 by um, um, Everett and collaborators in their nature papers, so maybe this is a reactive fraction that further allow the diversification of abiotic organic compounds. And in this schematic, it is illustrated that maybe this carbonaceous matter has to be considered as olivine here, and that both during a further hydrothermal uh, alteration will evolve olivine into clays, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbon or carbonaceous matter into different kinds of organics and so what, what are the, those types of, of um, compounds? This is totally, for the moment, uh, unexplored. And this forced us to consider that initially we had a series of abiotic uh, inorganic compounds, and we, they, they were suspected to convert uh, in environments where you have high reducing powers into hydrocarbon, methane, but organic acids or, but, and, and, and perhaps polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And those were often considered in evolutionary model lead, leading perhaps to the origin of life, that they would form monomers, and these monomers would perhaps in some place under favorable conditions would lead to a larger polymer that resemble, resemble a biological macromolecule. If carbonaceous matters and reactive one is present and easily formed directly from these inorganic compounds, then we have to consider the systems more globally and, and more, uh, uh, in a more complex way because if this organic matter is reactive, it can also allow the production of methane, hydrogen, as it was highlighted in Alberto's talk previously. But then we have here uh, uh, an, another way to consider uh, abiotic synthesis at uh, low temperature. Another outcome for, for that derived from such a work is that if this carbonaceous matter is so ubiquitous and so easily formed within the oceanic crust, then it is a fraction that is trapped and maybe has a role to play during subductions. And here I just presented some results that I obtained with colleagues from IPGP, Julien Siber and Vladimir Lechnik. And then we play with the serpentinite, the natural ones that uh, show here using scanning electron microscopy images, uh, all these carbonaceous matter inside. And then they were subjected to experiments in, uh, uh, at uh, 1000 degrees C and 60 pH during seven days. And here you have pictures of the product to obtain. So first, we show that the carbonaceous matter is still there in between the olivine grains uh, after the serpentinization of the samples. So here you have the Brahman showing you that it is still poorly ordered. And then we also found here, as, as shown by SCM, but also the diffraction pattern we obtained, the presence of hydrogenated diamond-like structure that forms within all these textures. So this is open the, the door for new investigation because uh, for the moment, all these fractions that remain, that rely, that uh, uh, is uh, associated with the, the mantle part of the, of the slab is uh, not well uh, known. So just to conclude, <coughs> message to, take in, to keep in mind, and I was so happy about this opportunity with uh, Muriel Andrani to wrote all this and, and compile all this observation in this chapter, but during carbon processing in the oceanic lithosphere, so this is a multiple fluid rock reactions that allow the formation of a largely unexplored diversity. So, 
and the recurrent formation of carbonaceous matter, so a lot to explore in the upcoming decade. I thank you for the, your attention and your time. <laughs> Oops, yes, we character them with using Ramans, but also using uh, um, uh, um, the electron uh, transmission electron microscopes uh, based on, on, on FIB sections. Yeah. And so for the moment, the best fit we have for both the Raman and, 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 and the um, uh, TEM data are hydrogenated hydrocarbon, but based on what I have seen yesterday about the, the diamond-like carbonates and so on, I think there is really some, still some work to, to better identify all these phases, but we have stable and exciting phases in... Yeah, uh, we see diamondoids in uh, high-maturity pyrobitumen type carbonaceous material in, in shales, so I would, um, would expect that maybe you have them as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Benedict. Um, our next presentation is uh, by Ding Pan. Uh, Ding is a professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Um, he uses sophisticated computational uh, tools such as DFT calculations and molecular dynamics to understand the underlying physics and chemistry uh, at the microscopic level for complex uh, physiochemical uh, interactions uh, of carbon. Um, such in environments such as uh, CO2 water interactions, uh, supercritical fluids uh, relevant uh, for subduction settings, and more globally implications for the deep carbon cycle. So uh, please welcome Ding Pen. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you. So first I would like to thank James for a very nice introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me here. So uh, I remember the first time I got to know DCO was in 2010 when there was a meeting in Beijing. So in fact, I was not attending that meeting, but uh, during the meetings, uh, Julia Gali interviewed me and later offered me a postdoc positions uh, related to, to DCO research. And a few years later, I think mostly because my postdoc research on the deep carbon science, and I got a faculty position in Hong Kong. So honestly, uh, I cannot imagine without DCO what my career would be. So yeah, I'm really grateful to the to DCO. Okay, so today here I would like to mainly introduce some um, our recent uh, results and uh, there there are simulations, but I would like to emphasize uh, the strong connections with the experiments. Okay, so here the the question here we would like to answer is that for example, if you dissolve carbon in water, what they are. For example, like uh, uh, at ambient conditions uh, uh, in color uh, that uh, I had yesterday, and uh, most of, uh, I made more than 99% of dissolved carbon is molecular CO2. But how about uh, at 10 gigapascal and 1,000 Kelvin as found in Earth's upper mantle? And this cartoon shows some complicated chemical reactions within only point uh, four two four picoseconds. So here, the question here we would like to address is that what is the form of dissolved carbon under such extreme conditions? Is still molecular CO2 or bicarbonate or carbonate ions or other species? And uh, here for these studies, that uh, our study was motivated by this amazing work done by our uh, DCO collaborators, Professor Isabella Daniel and Professor Dmitry Swajinsky. 
And from this study, I learned that uh, uh, the, the, carbon, the aqueous carbon solutions are not simply mixtures by uh, small molecules like CO2 or methane with water. So in fact, uh, so this study suggests that the, uh, the, uh, the ionic interactions are very important. And also, I have some feelings that uh, uh, for experimental studies, we may have some experimental data at very high pressure or a very high temperature, but it's very challenging to have experimental data at both high pressure and high temperature as found in deep earth. And this is what uh, our simulation can do. So here, the simulation is called AB initial or first principle molecular dynamics. And uh, uh, the good thing for this method is that uh, it does not rely on empirical parameters or experimental inputs. So it's very good at uh, predicting. And basically, we combined the molecular dynamics simulations with uh, quantum mechanics calculations on the fly. And uh, so first, let's uh, see our uh, results. For example, for CO2 in water, and this work is mainly done by, our, by my uh, student, Laura, sitting here. And previously, we found that if we dissolve CO2 in water-rich solutions, it's almost uh, gone, there is no CO2 here, and the majority is, uh, is bicarbonate ion. And later, uh, it was suggested by Professor Craig Manling, so what if we increase the concentration of carbon here? And it should be a crossover, and after it, the CO2 will become dominating again because we don't have enough water to react, to react with CO2. But the, here, the interesting thing is that Right above this crossover, uh, the carbonic acid, H2CO3, becomes the most abundant carbon species in solutions. So this is unexpected because uh, at ambient condition, for example, in my color, I can simply ignore it because the concentration for this species is so low. But here, we also tried multiple pressure and temperature conditions and work out this possible pressure and temperature range for this new carbon species indicating that it may be an important common carrier in deep carbon cycle. And uh, here, uh, we also compiled to, to some experimental results. Uh, after we published our water-rich simulations, our DCO club uh, colleague, uh, Professor Abramson, also published some interesting uh, Raman studies on, the, uh, on CO2 uh, in water. And the, the, the interesting thing is that, as you can see, with increasing pressure, the CO2 signals uh, disappeared. And there is an unknown peak here at about uh, uh, 1,040 uh, wave number. And the, currently, we don't know whether it's high concentrations of uh, bicarbonate ion or carbonic acid. We are still working on it. OK, so here, my impression is that uh, in this kind of study, and also, as shown by our previous speaker, the Raman spectroscopy is one of the very uh, powerful experimental tools. That is, uh, from, the spectra, from the peak position, you will know what they are. And from the peak intensity, you may know the concentration of species. If you know this coefficient, is called Raman scattering cross-section. For example, here, if you would like to know some relative concentration, like more fraction or more percent, at least you need to know this gamma ratio. The current situation is that at ambient conditions, uh, often we know this gamma ratio, but at extreme pressure and temperature conditions, uh, we know very little here. And this is, exact, this is exactly uh, what we can help. And because in our simulations, we know the concentration as shown in my cartoon. And here, if we can calculate the intensity, and then we can calculate this gamma ratio and to use it to interpret our experimental findings. OK, so here the method is a dynamic method. So that is basically it's a Fourier transform of the polarizability autocorrelation functions. The good thing for this method is that it includes the temperature and harmonic effects which are very important for supercritical fluids. And uh, so, OK, so as an example here, this plot shows the calculated Raman spectrums for 0.9 molars sodium carbonate solutions 
at ambient conditions. And this topic uh, is from water. Maybe it's different from what we measured because here uh, uh, we use heavy water to speed up calculations. It's a common trick in simulations. The interesting thing is that at around uh, 1,000 wave number, there are several peaks. And uh, we don't know whether they are signals or just a noise. So here, what we can do is that we can do the detailed peak assignment, for example, using vibrational density of state. So here, for CO3 unit, there are four uh, normal modes. And for Raman study, so this one, called symmetric stretching, is the most important one. So yes, this is a signal. So here, what we can do is that, for example, if we would like to know the, uh, the gamma ratios uh, between the carbonate ion and the bicarbonate ion, so we can do two simulations, two solutions, and then uh, we use the water peak to align them to get this gamma ratio. So here, uh, the calculated uh, values for the uh, gamma ratios between carbonate and bicarbonate ions is 1.64. And the experiment value here is 1.46. They're close, but I have to say that our calculated values uh, uh, depends on the broadening here. So here, mostly we focus on how it changes with pressure and temperature. OK, so here uh, we tried uh, several uh, different pressure and the temperature conditions and also the crystal calculations here. And then uh, the, the most important thing here is that we found these relations. Basically, this gamma ratio as a function of pressure and temperature. And we found that these gamma ratios decrease with increasing pressure, like this one, and uh, increase uh, with temperature. OK, so let's see what we have so far. And this gamma ratio between carbonate and bicarbonate ions is very important. And uh, almost, uh, 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 almost 20 years ago, and uh, France, uh, using uh, some model calculations, uh, predict, uh, suggested that this gamma ratio should decrease uh, with increase in pressure. But more recently, Schmidt argued that, OK, this gamma ratio should not decrease. But how it changes, we don't know. So let's assume it does not change. We just use the ambient value. And in fact, our simulation suggests that OK, this gamma ratio, in fact, increase uh, with increasing uh, temperature. So the direct consequence is that uh, when we analyze our Raman data, the concentration of bicarbonate ion may be underestimated here. OK, so let's go back to see our uh, uh, simulation results. And uh, uh, at, two, uh, at PB level and the PB0 level, and also the experimental values here is obtained uh, by using the ambient gamma ratio. As you can see that indeed, the experimental value here is underestimated compared to the simulation here. This is consistent with our finding here. OK, so okay, let me uh, summarize here. So the, there are two things here. First, we introduced some interesting uh, aqueous carbon reactions uh, at extreme conditions. And then the second part is that basically, we propose a first principle strategies uh, to get uh, the speciations in solutions by, uh, with uh, Raman spectroscopy. So by uh, basically so by calculating the ratios of Raman scattering cross sections. And this method in principle is not only for carbon species and also for any other uh, aqueous species also should work. Okay, uh, at the end of my talk, I would like to thank our funding providers, so particularly uh, DCO, and also uh, the Croucher Foundation is in Hong Kong. It's a private foundation for science and technology. So in my opinion, it's very similar to uh, Sloan Foundation. So I can continue my deep carbon science research in the next few years. And here I would like to thank my former uh, advisors, Julia Gali, and uh, my DCO collaborators all around the world. And the last uh, but not least, I would like to thank uh, the DCL clusters maintained by Professor Peter Fox as a volunteer. Uh, yesterday, he told me that uh, uh, we will continue around these clusters in the future. So for me, because it's, a, it's an electronic device, so for me, it sounds like a miracle, really. So let me ask you, like, uh, where is your iPhone bought seven years ago? So our cluster bought seven years ago is still working. 
So it, if if every electronic device is like this, then the Apple company will go bankrupt easily. <laughs> okay. So yeah, thank you, Peter, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ding. Wonderful talk. Do we have any questions for Yang? Do not hesitate. We have a minute. Um, I can't see. Yeah, okay. Uh, who is it, Mark? No, I can't see who it is. Thanks, Dan. I really enjoyed your talk. I was interested oh, in um, your kind of overprediction of the Raman cross section. I was wondering if you could speculate on whether quantum nuclear vibrational effects would be important since the vib you know this, this you could almost treat these molecules as as mostly harmonic so oh okay so your question is that uh, whether the harmonic effects are important here uh, quantum nuclear vibrational effects oh quantum uh, nuclear effect here would be important oh yeah this is a very good question so in principle here is that in our simulations we treat uh, the nuclei as a classical particle here so in principle everything should be quantum but here that uh, our temperature conditions, uh, our temperature is very high, so we can estimate that uh, the quantum effect may be not as important as ambient or low temperature conditions. Yeah, indeed, there are some comparisons at ambient conditions. I think here that uh, um, there are some shifts in the vibration modes, but uh, here for the intensity, I would not uh, think that, uh, I would not uh, expect that uh, there is a very big effect here. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I was wondering if you made any simple comparisons to test that, like you could uh, see if at higher temperatures your data better matches lower temperature experimental data, so approximating quantum effects by increasing the temperature of the system. Yeah, this is a very good question here. Like, uh, what we, uh, we did is that we tried to compile the results uh, to some experimental results. Indeed, we find that uh, the agreement is better at high temperature than it, uh, at uh, low temperatures. But here, uh, honestly, for this kind of spectroscopy calculations, if you really want to do the full quantum calculations, it's very, very expensive here. But uh, uh, maybe we can do something like uh, coupled with some force field calculation. We can estimate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, let th let's thank. Oh, do you have a question? No, let's thank them again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So our next presentation is by Mark Hirschman. Um, he's, a, uh, he's the gun professor of our sciences at the University of Minnesota. Mark is an experimentalist, but also a thermodynamicist and also a theorist. And uh, he works on the role of <laughs> volatiles. And am, am I not talking about you? <laughs> in the thermochemical evolution of the Earth, with all the implications ranging from you know, petrogenesis to global mental dynamics. And what he's going to tell us about today is uh, where carbon is hiding or at least being stored. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, James. Uh, so my task today is to talk about uh, carbon storage in the reduced mantle. As we'll see, and I, as I think many of you know, much of the mantle is reduced, so that means that we're talking about carbon storage in, in, in most of the mantle. Carbon may well be greatest, uh, or the greatest amount of carbon may well be in the core, as we heard earlier this morning, but in terms of the accessible earth, the largest reservoir is the mantle. It was referred to, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, as, as the battery, oh, excuse me, as, as, as the gas tank. I tend to call it the battery because it is the reservoir that is exchanging with the surface and, and, and allowing what we call deep earth carbon cycle to occur. We care not just that there is carbon in the mantle, but we care about the form of the carbon in the mantle, right? It's not simply a passive place where carbon is stored. It's also a place where carbon has the possibility of affecting interior earth dynamics. And that's because depending on the phase that carbon is in, it may affect, first of all, the geophysical properties, and second of all, the geochemical properties, uh, in particular and most, uh, and most uh, importantly, if the carbon is in any time in a molten phase, or like as in a carbonatite, then uh, the, its ability to take part in mass transfers is, is greatly enhanced. So we care where the carbon is and where the carbon uh, is actually in, in terms of the phases. 
There's a great deal of variety of carbon phases, and I think we're going to hear a, bit, a little bit more about that from Wendy Mao in the talk that follows me in terms of the mineralogy of carbon. But beyond the mineralogy of carbon, we also care about the petrology of carbon, which is to say that once we understand the diversity of possible phases that can be stable, we also need to take into account the fact that those phases are going to, and in fact indeed will react with their surroundings, and their surroundings may determine, determine not what phases are possible, but what phases are actually there. So this work uh, is, was actually the, the PhD work of Zhang Zhou, known in the United States or known in the West as, as Johnny Zhang. Uh, the only reason I'm first author here is because I'm the one who's giving the talk. Uh, th this, th this work was not funded by DCO, it was funded by the National Science Foundation, but as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, the genesis of this actually began at the first international DCO conference in Beijing, where I first met Johnny Zhang, and the year afterwards he came to Minnesota to, to do his PhD. So this work, even though the, the, the dollars came from NSF, the inspiration actually came from DCO. Do I, how do I advance the slides? Green. No, that's yeah. This is, oh, there we go, that, there we go, all right. <laughs> really fundamental things can trip me up. Okay, so this is meant in some ways to be a bit of an update, right, a, a, a decadal survey. And so this is a paper from uh, a, more or less the beginning of, of a DCO time uh, that Raj Dasgupta and I put together, and it's a summary of uh, a bunch of different things, but it, it's a summary of the, di of the different possible phases that are storing uh, carbon in the mantle, and you can see that in much of the mantle we have these reduced phases of diamond or iron or iron carbide. Uh, we're kind of agnostic about it at that point, right? Just a, just a listing. Uh, this is brand new. Uh, it came out in Elements, I, I guess, I guess this month, and the listing of carbon in the in the deeper ports of the mantle is is similarly agnostic: diamond, iron carbide, carbonatites, or iron nickel liquid. And what I'm going to argue is, is that all of this misses actually probably the most important phase of all, right? So uh, if, if, if we go through it and, and go through the process, we may actually understand that, that, that none of these lists actually contain what are more than likely to be the principal phase. Okay, so there's a, a, a logic train to this. And the first part of the logic train is that much of the mantle in the deeper parts of the mantle are, is reduced. So... Uh, we know that in the upper mantle, the conditions are fairly oxidized, and carbon is present chiefly as carbon carbonate or crystalline carbonate or CO2 or carbonate or carbonatite liquid, perhaps. But uh, abundant evidence shows us that with increasing depth, the mantle becomes more reduced. And so the, the logical thought process that we get to is, oh, it must be a reduced phase and it's high pressure, so therefore it must be diamond that's down there, right? So, much, much, so the, the, the first place we get to is, yes, it's, it's, it's all in diamond. But then when we consider how reduced the mantle actually is, we realize that there are other complications. So uh, lots of experiments show us, and it, perhaps in fact the whole reason that we think that the mantle at depth is reduced is because mantle becomes sufficiently reduced that we begin to precipitate some sort of alloy, right? an iron nickel alloy. And that iron nickel alloy in the shallow parts of the mantle, or at least in the intermediate depths of the upper mantle, is initially a nickel rich alloy, and that nickel rich alloy um, is First of all, uh, mostly nickel, as shown here. Uh, this is the nickel to iron ratio. And there's a very small amount of it because there isn't very much nickel in the mantle. But as pressure increases and the mantle becomes yet more reduced, more and more of the alloy becomes iron. So there's more and more iron dissolved into the alloy. And because there's an increase of metal uh, and iron going into the alloy, there's an, in there's an increase in the total amount of alloy present. Okay, so previously we said, uh, car carbon in diamond because the mantle is reduced. Turns out that the mantle is probably, in many cases, too reduced for diamond, which is kind of a concept that when I first stumbled across it uh, was a bit, uh, you, you think of diamond as being very reduced. But the problem is that if there's alloy and there's diamond, they react together and they, and, and they form carbide. There's no place in the phase diagram of iron carbon, which is what this is, here, iron, carbon, where diamond and alloy coexist. They're, they're going to react to form a carbide. So the next part in the thought process is, okay, so it's probably not diamond, it's probably in carbide. 
But that's problematic too, because carbide has a very low melting temperature, right? And as a consequence, if there is a carbide and we subject it to mantle temperature pressures and along the geotherm, we'll find that that carbide is not crystalline carbide, but molten carbide. So, so then we get to the conclusion that the carbon must be in a carbide melt. I should say, of course, that we're talking about the reduced portion of the mantle, and we've heard a fair amount uh, about interesting uh, oxidized phases at great depth, and those two must exist, for example, in oxidized domains where subduction is, is occurring or uh, sub that have been influenced by subduction. But most of the mantle is this reduced form, and so we're getting to these, uh, we're getting to these more, uh, well, I, what I consider to be more com complex petrology associated with these reactions. So uh, the diagram here on the left is simply iron carbon, and it's showing again that there's no field of stability of alloy and uh, and, and, and diamond or graphite together. Notice also that, of course, that there's a certain amount of solubility of carbon in the iron metal itself, you know, like steel. And so that, that later is going gonna, is gonna to show up as being a, a, a player in this. This diagram on the right, and actually I think I have a, a better version of it, or two different versions of it over here that we can talk about, is, is that, in fact, the iron carbon relations are complicated by the fact that what, I, what you've already told you is that it's not iron, it's iron nickel. And so if we think about iron and carbon, whoops, um, can I go back? Yeah. Uh, if, if we think about iron and carbon, this, uh, this shows again that, that, that carbide forms, there's no coexistence of graphite and alloy over here, and there's, a, and there's melt stable over here. But if you go over to the right on the nickel rich side of things, in fact, graphite and alloy can coexist and the melting temperature is much higher. So the fact that it's an iron nickel alloy means that it's complicated. The, the simple thing, oh, it's going to melt and make iron carbide, maybe it depends on the composition of the alloy. So it's getting a little bit more complicated. But there's another player here, and that is sulfur. What did, what did Terry Plank say the other day, that sulfur is the new carbon? We can't, we, we, we can't understand carbon storage and reduced mantle without also taking into account the existence of sulfur. And the reason for that is because sulfur in the mantle, or rather sulfide in the mantle, is molten. And so here are some experiments that we did uh, a, a couple years back, and this is showing the solidus of sulfide, and it's compared to a mantle adiabat, basically through much of the upper mantle, and you can see that sulfide melts at a much lower temperature, so the sulfide is molten. Uh, here's the temp experiments at much higher pressures of, of various kinds, where in the presence of a reduced conditions, where iron, uh, the activity of iron is high, the melting of the sulfide is again well into the lower mantle, far lower in temperature than the mantle geotherm. So all through this scenario, there's molten sulfide sitting there. And again, you can't just think about the carbon in isolation. You have to think about the potential of the carbon to react with other things. And carbide liquid and sulfide liquid are mutually miscible. And so here are some experiments, I apologize for the small print on here, that show, uh, in, in this case, a carbide liquid and a sulfide liquid coexisting. You can see the concentrations of carbon and sulfur in each of them. Uh, if one goes, to, this is actually in the pure iron sulfur system, if one adds a small amount of nickel to them, the miscibility gap disappears and you have completely miscible iron, nickel, uh, carbon, sulfide liquid. And so in order to understand where the carbon might be, you have uh, to, to consider its reactions with the sulfide liquid. So, some complications. Uh, the, the first one I've already told you about, the activities of iron and nickel are going to vary with depth. First, there's going to be a high nickel activity, and then the iron activity is going to increase with, with, with increasing depth. And the sulfide liquid is going to vary its composition accordingly. It's going to be more iron-rich or more nickel-rich. It's going to have a higher metal sulfide ratio when the, when the activity of iron is greater, because uh, th that's how the, the, li the sulfide liquid must respond. And furthermore, as illustrated here, the amount of carbon that dissolves in that sulfide liquid is strongly dependent on both the metal sulfide ratio of the sulfide liquid and also the iron nickel ratio of the sulfide liquid. 
Those of you who know me and know my work know that I like to get away with the simplest model possible. If I can get away with mass balance and some partition coefficients, if that's going to explain the system, then that's what I will do. Not possible here. It's too complex, too many moving parts. You have to do the full thermodynamics. And uh, with apologies to Mark Biorso, who's uh, in the audience here and who was my PhD advisor, I, I, I do follow a Bernie Wood's dictum. And Bernie Wood's dictum is that thermodynamics is like changing diapers. You do it, but you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so uh, what we did is we, we did a full thermodynamic model, but we cheated a little bit in the sense that there was already a beautiful thermodynamic model for the system iron nickel sulfur that came from a group of metallurgists at the University of Wisconsin from 30 years ago. This is a paper from 1987. And we took that model, which was a low pressure model, but a complete thermodynamic description of the mixing properties and the, and the standard state properties of iron nickel sulfur throughout the compositional range. We, uh, we extended it to higher pressure by uh, including the effects of you know, volumes and things like that. And then we calibrated it into the carbon system by looking at the carbon solubility experiments that I already showed you, which are here. Uh, so this is our calibration for um, for the pure nickel system, this is the calibration for the pure uh, for, for the nickel-free system, the pure iron system, and we could we could draw isoplasts in between. The carbon solubility there gives us the mixing properties between the carbonaceous component and the nickel and, and, and the iron components as, as well. And so that gets us more or less to the conclusion, and that is, if you do it, just calculate it. What you find, imposing a certain depth FO2 relationship that we take from Frost, whoops, that's not where I meant to go, right, there we go, uh, Frost and McCammon, 2008. We see, of course, that in the shallow mantle, this carbonatite's stable, and the sulfide is sitting there uh, as, as, as a molten liquid, but there's not a lot of solubility in the, in, in, in the sulfide there because conditions are not sufficiently reduced, and, there, and the solubility of carbon in the very oxidized sulfide liquid is, um, is low. But then, The, the liquid and graphite replace the carbonatite because conditions become too reduced. And then the liquid uh, becomes diamond saturated because we get to sufficiently high pressure. And then finally we pass into a region where it's just sulfide liquid. And then eventually, of course, a, a, an alloy does saturate and that alloy is not going to be iron nickel, it's going to be steel, it's going to have a certain amount of carbon in it. And then, so therefore, depending on the total amount of carbon present, the host for carbon in the deep reduced mantle will be sulfide liquid and steel. And the only conditions under which we will get diamond is if there's so much carbon present, if we have a carbon rich environment, that it overwhelms the ability of the sulfide liquid to, to, to take it. And therefore we would get the assemblage sulfide liquid plus diamond. And that's my conclusion. It's, uh, the, the, the place to look for carbon in the mantle is with the sulfur. Thank you. Hey, Mark, that's spectacular. Uh, what about the mobility of this liquid? Ah, good question. So sulfide liquid is known under low pressure conditions to be not particularly wetting, and therefore its mobility is low. But there's some evidence, uh, particularly from <laughs> diamonds, for example, from the deep diamonds that, uh, that, that Evan Smith has, has found, that, um, that, that, that it is in part mobile. It's probably not as mobile as a, or it's certainly not as mobile as a carbonatite, but, uh, but Yes, it's, it's a whole lot more mobile than diamond. Yes, Chris? Hey, I have another quick question. Um, so given that so much of the lower mantle is composed of bridgmanite and ferropericlase, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't expect that carbon would go much into those phases, but have, exper have high pressure experiments been done to quantify? Yeah, Craig, this was Craig Schiffrey's point the other day. We, ha we, we have actually ex done experiments in the upper mantle for the carbon solubility in upper mantle minerals, olivine and so forth, and also the Bayreuth group did it a number of years ago, and, and the solubility is very, very low. Uh, there are a little bit of data for the transition zone minerals, and again, the carbon solubility is very low. Uh, it is probably a minority component, uh, it, but, but it's possible that more experiments 
could show us otherwise. I have a quick question mm -hmm. for you. Uh, so you showed that as uh, you go deeper and more reduced, you start melting more and more iron, and the iron concentration of your metal is going to increase compared yes. to nickel. And then you might hit that point where you're going to have phase emissibility again with the sulfides and carbides separating. Do you expect that would be a, something that no, fits the, in there on your... The, the experiments that I showed were at 2 GPA and 1600 degrees C, where for the pure iron system you have mutual miscibility between the sulfide and the carbide. At sufficiently high temperatures and pressures, that miscibility goes away even for the iron-rich system. Even for the iron-rich system. All right. Okay. Let's, let's thank Mark again. Thank you. And we'll close the session with our uh, keynote presentation about carbon at extreme conditions. Uh, Wendy Mao is a professor of geological sciences at Stanford University. Um, she's also the co-chair of the uh, PCC Community Steering Committee, um, at DCO. Um, Wendy carries out uh, extreme pressure and temperature uh, experiments uh, to reveal new transformations in minerals and uh, using a variety of techniques, both experimental and analytical, that you know, it would take me half of the remaining amount of time to just cite, uh, to just list. Uh, very importantly, though, she's uh, involved in what looks like a clear direction moving forwards uh, with uh, shockwave physics and uh, shock, sh sh uh, uh, shock experiments uh, at very short time scales uh, at Stanford's LCLS uh, free electron laser and uh, we're delighted to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, um, James, for the introduction. Um, so during this time I have, in this lunch, this slot before lunch, I wanted to uh, discuss some of the highlights from our experimental program looking at the extreme physics and chemistry of carbon in two areas. So um, both looking at, um, oops, sorry. I did the one thing. Um, with looking at um, carbon forms for understanding earth and planetary interiors, but also um, looking um, at these planetary forms for material science applications. And of course, these areas are very closely linked because we use the same experimental tools to reach extreme conditions, and also they both benefit from all the in situ and ex, and ex situ characterization tools to see what's going on to the carbon behavior at extreme conditions. Okay, so. Um, there's many questions to be answered about the forms of carbon in earth and planetary interiors, and so I just want to touch on a couple of them. So, um, the first one, how does the structure and bonding in carbon-bearing phases change with depth? And so we already heard a lot about um, tetrahedrally coordinated carbon and carbonates um, at this meeting. But um, had a um, former postdoc, Eglantine uh, Boulard, who um, led a project that really was enabled and supported by the DCO. Um, so her, during her PhD work, she had studied structural transitions in magnesite and magne magnesio siderite and found that there's a new high pressure structure. Oops, oh, I'm doing this. Sorry. New high pressure structure for the extra diffraction. And then looking at samples quenched, recovered from high pressure, um, saw from spectroscopy a very interesting um, spectroscopic signature in the carbon K edge. Um, but from the refelt, but from the diffraction, we're not able to um, do reliable refelt refinement. So we didn't really exactly know where the tonk positions were. And from the, the spectroscopy she had performed was ex situ. So um, she followed up these experiments with in situ infrared study looking at the high pressure uh, magnesium siderite um, phase. And so what she saw was the black spectra are infrared spectra for the threefold coordinated carbonate. But then the red spectra are, come from the, the high pressure form after high temperature and high pressure transformation. And so there's a lot of new peaks, but mainly want you to focus on this region from 1200 to 1300 uh, wave numbers. That, that's new. So, and then you can follow these peaks with varying pressure. So to interpret this, these new peaks, this is a collaboration with uh, Ding Pan and Julia Galley. So they conducted some DFT calculations and found that in the carbonate structure, so the threefold coordinated carbonate, there's no peaks in the 1200, 1300 wave number region. 
but a calculation on the fourfold coordinated um, uh, carbon in carbonate, you find a peak at 1250 wave numbers, and this corresponds to a new stretching mode in the tetrally coordinated um, uh, CCO4 cluster. So um, this is a nice theoretical and experimental validation of the fourfold coordinated carbonate. Okay, so then um, we care about other forms of carbon like melt. So because the title is viewing, I wanted to discuss one of the techniques that we had developed to, to image deep carbon. So we use nanoscale X-ray imaging um, using a nanoscale X-ray transition microscope. And so the parts of this microscope are basically the same as an optical microscope. You have a light source. In this case, is a synchrotron X-ray source. You have your sample that you're going to be viewing. The zone plate acts like an objective lens, so it projects a magnified image onto then your detector. And so X-rays are a great light source because they're highly penetrating, so you can look in very complex environments like in a diamond cell. Also, X-rays have very short wavelengths, so they're great because, in theory, they're not um, limited in terms of spatial, um, they're less limited in terms of spatial resolution. So we can image things with 30 to 40 nanometer spatial resolution. So you can, you can collect really nice 2D radiographs. So here's an image that we collected in collaboration with Mark Harrison at UCLA. So we looked at one of his really old zircons, Hidian zircons, and within them you can see these small carbonaceous inclusions, and they actually have hexagonal shapes, so probably graphite inclusion that's a few microns um, in size. And then if you're able to collect a lot of the 2D radiographs at different orientations, you can then do tomography and reconstruct a 3D object. And so I'm going to show uh, one of my favorite little movies that was, um, because here it just demonstrates an extreme example of why you want to do 3D imaging. Because then, you know, if you only had the 2D information, in an extreme case, yes could look like no. So this is like a little movie that's put together by the beamline scientist at one of these TXM instruments. Okay. All right. So. Um, but we, want, we also want to do this, though, at extreme conditions, so um, high pressure and hopefully ultimate high temperature. So we're doing imaging in a diamond cell. And so we're directing the X-ray beam perpendicular to the diamond axis. So we design new cells that have a lot of angular access. And one of the first things we looked at was just a little um, puck of tin. So it's about 10 microns in size. We use tin because it has very high X-ray absorption contrast, and we could also do diffraction, so to benchmark it we compared our tomography results shown in blue with um, results from X-ray diffraction and found that they correspond really well. Okay, so then we moved on to um, glassy carbon. So this is an amorphous material, so it lacks long-range order, so we can't do diffraction to get at the volume and density directly. But then we can use the nanoscale imaging to actually image and sum up the volume of the sample. So we looked at this glassy carbon. So it's an amorphous carbon phase. It's all sp2 bonded. It's kind of based on a fullerene-like structure. And what we had found from previous measurements is actually that it undergoes some bonding changes at high pressure. So you see a loss of all the sp2 bonding in conversion to sp3. The sample remains amorphous, but also becomes exceptionally hard at high pressure. And so we wanted to see how the density was changing with, um, with pressure, with these bonding changes. So we did nanoscale X-ray imaging. In this case, again, because carbon is very, very light and it doesn't have a lot of electrons, it's hard to see with X-rays. And so we coated the sample with a platinum coating, and then we're just going to do negative contrast imaging and just look at the coat. The, I look at the um, coating and then count the uh, some of the volume inside of the coating. So here are on the left are some 2D radiographs from low pressure to high pressure as we're squashing our sphere a glassy carbon sphere, and then you can see that we're just imaging the coating here and then summing up the volume. So we've collected on both increasing pressure, decreasing pressure, and followed how the volume changes. What we found is that it's fairly irreversible. You get 35% densification of the sample. So we're probably squeezing out some void space, but I think, but the sample overall also seems to be densifying. Um, and you can see the shape is also changing quite dramatically as it gets, as it gets squashed. All right. Um, so emboldened by that, we started looking at a whole suite of different um, glassy materials, so SiO2 glass, also silicate glasses, 
and we looked at both um, coded versions and also, because we were a little bit worried about how the platinum coding might be affecting our results, um, we're able to look at some disks of uh, silica glass that weren't coded. And we find actually the results are very similar. And around 30 GPA, there seems to be a change in compressibility in our silica glass. Oh, sorry. So this is work from a uh, former postdoc, uh, Jean Liu. Okay. So um, that's great for amorphous solids. We really do want to look at the melts, and that would require some in situ high temperature work, and that's still kind of work in progress, but there's actually a lot of experimental challenges that have presented themselves when we're trying to do in situ high pressure and high temperature um, imaging. But ultimately, you want to look at mantle melts with volatiles, also look at molten iron rich, I mean, iron carbide melts, and also the interaction between melts and solid phases. And so um, we have a study here where, a previous study where we didn't look at, we looked at iron rich alloy in a silicate matrix. And so the portions in red in these images are the iron-rich alloy, and then the gray regions are the surrounding silicate matrix. And so it just shows some reconstructions from four different pressures, 25 GPA, 39, 52, and 64 GPA, where um, the probably most dramatic thing you can see is that at lower pressures, you have isolated blobs. So the iron alloy is not forming an interconnected network, but at higher pressures, you can see that now the iron alloy is wetting the surface of the bridgmanite grains. And so there's some, it seems that there's some sort of change in percolative ability somewhere between 40 and 50 GPA in this um, combination of iron alloy and a silic bridgmanite matrix. Um, and as Sergey had uh, mentioned on yesterday during his lightning talk, we also want to continue to look at the impact of the changing structure on carbonate behavior. So there's a lot of properties, also properties of the melt that we'd like to know more about, and also for other new um, carbon-bearing phases. Okay, so with um, the remaining time, I would like to also provide some examples of looking at um, a material science aspect. So here the overarching uh, goals and questions would be something like, um, can we find new carbon-bearing phases with desirable properties? And so this includes using pressure to study how the structure then affects the material's property. And also, can we use pressure to understand and design new synthesis paths for materials of interest? And so um, I think Charles had asked the question about diamondoids. We actually have done quite a bit of study on diamondoids. So these are re these really interesting um, cage-like, ultra-stable, saturated hydrocarbons. They're based on cages of carbon-carbon frameworks that can be superimposed on a diamond lattice. And so like the simplest uh, diamond is adamantane, so it's one carbon cage, I uh, sorry, one diamond cage. And then you can have diamantane, which is two fused diamond cages, trimantane, three fused cages. And these are the lower diamond noise. And then you get to higher diamond noise, like tetramantane, pentamantane, and so on, where then you can have isomers. So it gets pretty comp can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Um, there, diamond noise have properties that are intermediate between bulk diamond and hydrocarbons. They're found naturally in very minute qualities, quantities in petroleum, but they're really interesting um, building blocks to kind of uh, study. So because they have um, atomic uniformity and they can have, you can look at different numbers of fused cages, also different dimensionalities and see what happens when you compress them. So we looked at a suite of diamondoids with different numbers of cages and you know, from zero, 0D to, to apply 3D and compress them. And we found that they, um, from the equation of state, they have indeed intermediate compressional behavior between bulk carbon phases, so graphite and diamond, and then hydrocarbons like methane and benzene. Um, so they're, they're pretty close in terms of compressibility to uh, fullerenes, which is probably not that surprising. But there's also a, a dimensionality trend where the 0D, or well, adamantane, is more compressible compared to the 2 and 3D um, diamondoids. And we also find that they, while they undergo um, phase transitions, the phase transitions just involve a, a, a more efficient packing of the diamond, diamondoid molecules. The diamondoid molecule always remains intact, so it's very, very durable to the highest pressures that we measured. Also, it's very durable over repeated cycling. So we, we cycled adamantane through diamantane through like 20, 30 compression and decompression cycles. And we found that the Raman spectra also visually looks the same. So it may um, lend itself to being a nice protective coating if you want to look for an application for this material. 
but also because um, the diamondoid has these diamond cages, we thought it might be a good precursor for making bulk diamond. So um, one of our postdocs, Silgi Park, um, she looked at a suite of diamondoids and put them in a diamond cell and compressed them and heated them and then used in situ ramen and extra diffraction and then did ex situ work um, with eels and TM to get the recovered products, see what she made. And so uh, what she found was for, again, I probably can't read this, but for a suite of diamondoids at lower pressures and temperatures, not surprisingly, she formed graphite, higher pressures and temperatures formed diamond. And so what um, was nice was that actually the diamondoids form at especially lower temperatures, so fairly you know, moderate pressures, but low temperatures um, for direct diamondoid to diamond synthesis. And also they form rapidly. So at 20 GPA, you can get conversion in less than 20 microseconds. So seem to be pretty good precursors for making diamond. Okay, and then, so here too, you can have many other forms of carbon and carbon rich materials to study. You can functionalize um, your diamondoids. So you can add different chemical groups to diamondoids and tune their functionality. We can look at diamond films, um, onion carbon fullerenes, nanotubes. Um, and I want to mention a little bit about um, graphene nanoribbons because it's kind of an interesting study, very simple study. You'll see when I get there. So graphene nanoribbons are of interest because uh, unlike graphene, which is a semi-metal, so it has no band gap, um, graph uh, when, you, when you actually make it into ribbons, so just strips of graphene, it becomes a semiconductor and with a tunable band gap depending on the width and the edge geometry of your graphene. And so that um, makes it kind of a of great interest for a potential co uh, component in electronic devices, but they're really hard to make. It's really hard to have a good yield of high quality graphene nanoribbons. And so um, one of our colleagues at, Stan at Stanford in the chemistry department um, and his uh, visiting scholar, Cheng Xin Chen, came over and had a pretty simple idea. Well, can we just squash the carbon nanotubes and then make nanoribbons? Because people have been trying to make um, nanoribbons from nanotubes. So he said, okay, that's a pretty simple experiment. We'll just take the solution of the carbon nanotubes, compress it, and then add an oxidizing agent to unzip the edge. And then hopefully we'll make graphene nanoribbons. And so indeed, that's what happened. So um, here's some TM. Uh, measurements. So before compression on the graphene nanoribbon, sorry, graphene nanotube, you can see the edges are a little bit out of focus, and that's because of the curvature of your nanotube. But after we squash the nanotube into a nanoribbon, a graphene nanoribbon, you can see that the um, sample is now in focus, not in focus because you have a flat surface. So we made nanoribbons, and using um, AFM measurements, we found that actually have a pretty good yield, so 40% yield from nanotubes to graphene nanoribbons. Um, a lot of literature doesn't even report yields because they're really hard to make, so we found good yield. The downside, of course, is that you're making, you're using like nanograms of samples, so you're not making a lot of, not a lot of these ribbons, but you can make them high quality, and the collaborators also made a field effective transistor, which worked really well, so uh, promising at least to understand how one can make them, but we still have to think about making them in a uh, more efficient or a larger um, amount. So um, there's just, just a few examples of the many studies that have already been conducted and are being conducted. And of course, there's many other deep carbon forms to study for you know, 2020 and beyond. I did want to end with, um, because I was looking at the little clips that Bob showed yesterday from the 2008 Sloan uh, Deep Carbon Workshop at Broad Branch Campus, reminded me of how quickly a decade can pass. So this is our lab in 2008, um, when I was just getting started at Stanford, and then like 10 years have passed. So, uh, this is earlier this year in 2019, um, our group. And I definitely, definitely want to acknowledge the many um, researchers and collaborators who came, who are in our group and are still in our group, um, who worked on deep carbon projects. So I hope that will continue on to you know, the next decade and beyond. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Wendy. Okay. Do we have any questions? I know you're all starving. I know. Um, do we have any questions for Wendy? We have a minute. Well, actually. No, we have negative we, two, we have we have negative two, two minutes. minutes. <laughs> no questions. All right. Bon appétit, everyone, and to you this afternoon. Thank you, Wendy, Thanks. again. <laughs> and let's thank all the.
Hello. Hi, right, everybody. Thanks for making it this far in. My name is Sami Mikhail. You don't have to pronounce it that way. You can just say Mikhail. But I always do this before introducing people so that if I mispronounce any of these people's names, it's totally not that big a deal because they can't pronounce mine either. <laughs> so this session now is entitled Origins of Deep Carbon. And if you look at the lineup of speakers, you might be a bit confused. So we have some cosmochemistry, we have isotopes inside isotopes, otherwise known as clumped, we have microbiology, and so I want you to think of origins in the, in the most holistic way. So an example I would give you is my origin, is either you can say I'm from my parents, or I'm a human being and I evolved as part of that line, or I'm part of the origin of life on Earth. And our speakers today are gonna to take us on a journey exploring origins from the scale of cosmochemistry all the way down to microbial flu rock interaction and looking at the origin of specific, sometimes the origins within inside the origins, shall we say. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome our first speaker, who's Bernard Marti from Nancy. Bernard is still a scientist, despite really only wanting to play his guitar. Um, <laughs> and he's gonna come up to the stage, and the stage is yours, Bernard. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my real pleasure to be here in this DCO fantastic program. And uh, uh, for me, this one of the main outcome of the DCO program is, uh, is within this, this room, there is uh, young people that made networking, that created a new communities that will last for long. So bravo for DCO. Okay. Um, 
Just uh, let me say that, uh, in fact, uh, what I am going to present is a group effort, of course, with people from Nancy, but people also worldwide. And uh, you have also an idea of the sponsor on, on the right-hand side. And let's start. I have 10 minutes to build the solar system and the Earth, so we have to hurry up a little bit. So it started, as you know, when a, a fraction of, um, of a molecular cloud uh, collapsed, gave rise to a central star surrounded by a disk of gas and dust. And um, schematically, it would be like this. You have the, the protostar, the protosun, making uh, nuclear reactions surrounded by a disk of gas and dust. Uh, the dust is uh, coalescing uh, by electric force and then by impact, makes a planetesimal planets, the gas dissipates, and we obtain the present day solar system with the inner planets, Earth is here, asteroids, giant planets, and here you still have some small bodies that, is, uh, that formed ultimately the, the uh, belt of, uh, of comets, okay? So um, where is carbon? Over there, carbon was in the gas as a CO. It's a, it was a, the main host of carbon in the nebula. And uh, carbon now uh, can be found in primitive meteorites that formed 4.56 billion years ago that have got a memory of that. And uh, in uh, primitive meteorites, it's mostly in the form of organics by far in terms of, uh, of content. You have other phases that are very much interested, but most of the carbon is organic in meteorites. And it's possible to understand, or it may, at least to make a model of how carbon was trapped in this material, because you have some gas, the gas is H2, helium of course, uh, nitrogen, CO, and if you add some, uh, some energy to this, like uh, photons from the young sun or from nearby stars, you start to ionize and you start to make organics, solid material from this. And this can be reproduced in the lab. We have been working for, for some time on this. So in the lab, you take some gas mixture at low pressure, you ionize them with a plasma, and you obtain some tar, sorry. You obtain uh, some, uh, some, oops, some tar here, and uh, you make organics, which resemble quite well to uh, refractory organics you can find in meteorites, uh, in terms of Raman spectra, in terms of uh, fractionation of noble gas are trapped here, and uh, in terms also on the, on, the, on the structure. Okay, so it works pretty well, and then you get some organics uh, that are trapped, then you can model all these organics are dispersed in the, in, in, in the, in the solar, nascent solar system, so this is a disk, and uh, after some time they tend to sediment on the, on, 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 on the equatorial plane, and here it can be trapped by, uh, by uh, uh, growing meteorite, silicate and metal, okay? However, we have heard this morning that in fact uh, the distribution may not be homogeneous because uh, you have a gradient of energy, gradient of entropy in the disk. And it, at some stage you, you, you have some ice that cannot condense too close to the sun, but also you cannot keep all the, the organics you have been creating for long. This means that it's possible that uh, the Earth grew up quite dry or quite carbon depleted. And uh, this is an estimate from uh, DCO, that is uh, about uh, the Earth is carbon poor. It is about uh, less than 0.05% uh, carbon. So coming back to, the, the, to, to, to this scheme, it's possible that the Earth grew quite carbon poor uh, at this stage here and then some uh, carbon-rich bodies were later on uh, uh, added. It, it's just a model, it's not certain, but it's a possibility. Another possibility is, uh, could be comets. And people who are modeling the, the birth of the solar system uh, believe or suspect that there has been some uh, a swinging of giant planets at some stage that disturbed completely uh, the asteroid belt and the cometary disk and so you have some uh, bodies from those reservoirs that were scattered all along the disk, including coming to the inner part of the solar system. This means that, a priori, you cannot really decipher from modeling, at least, if the carbon is a local origin or it's coming from uh, the outer solar system. And that's where the isotopes are coming. So uh, these are the d over h ratio variation in the solar system, so it's huge. Here, this was the protosolar nebula value that was um, 
inferred from the Jupiter atmosphere and from the solar composition. And uh, in fact, we could do the same for carbon, but the problem for carbon is that uh, you don't have such large variation. Uh, this is a comparison of the isotope variation of carbon with that of the D over H ratio, so it's uh, one, at least one order of magnitude less. So what we are doing, we are using uh, another system, which is nitrogen, and that's come two very interesting mission about this. One is the Genesis mission, and the other one is the Rosetta mission. So the Genesis mission was uh, 15 years ago, and it has been sampling some solar wind uh, ions coming back to Earth and analyzing stable isotopes of oxygen and carbon. And then, in terms of carbon isotope composition, again, we have this type of diagram, which is a huge variation everywhere. It didn't seem there are some logic here, but now with the Genesis data, we know that the solar composition is somewhere here, and the sun is the best representative we have for the protosolar nebula, because it has concentrated all the, the material, almost all the material we have in the solar system. And now you can put together these two uh, type of traces, so you uh, uh, like the D over H ratio and the nitrogen isotope composition. And if you do so, some logic starts to emerge. It seems that you have at least three reservoirs, distinct or maybe continuous, but uh, three reservoirs. One is the uh, inner, is uh, sorry, is the starting composition of the protosolar nebula represented by Jupiter and the Sun. Then you have something that is intermediate, which is the inner solar system represented by the Earth and by the meteorites, and then you have the comets, which are enriched uh, in nitrogen-15 and deuterium with respect to the other two reservoirs. So, we don't understand very well. There are several possibilities for explaining these uh, large isotope uh, variations, but they can already be used in terms of tools to decipher the origin of uh, terrestrial volatiles, and uh, it seems that at least for nitrogen and uh, hydrogen, water, say water, a local origin is more, uh, is, is favored on this basis. But we can go a step further, and there has been the, this uh, Rosetta mission that was a European Space Agency mission with a NASA participation that was, uh, that took uh, 10 years to reach uh, the, um, to, to reach a comet, 67P, P. Shuryumov Gerasimenko, from the name of people who, the two scientists who discovered it. And on this spacecraft, it stayed uh, more than two years around the comet. And on this spacecraft, you had a bunch of instruments, including here a mass spectrometer, high, uh, high resolution mass spectrometer, um, in a group led by Katrin Alveg from the University of Bern. It was an international group. And uh, in fact, this mass spectrometer, you don't need uh, any vacuum system here. It just sn sniff out directly the gas that are expelled by the comet, which, prov uh, which are coming from the sublimation of uh, cometary ice. And uh, the analysis uh, clearly showed that, in fact, the comet is not atypical. It's rich in nitrogen-15, it's rich in deuterium, and so it doesn't, it means that you cannot, it confirms that it's difficult to make the ocean carbon and, uh, and, and nitrogen from some outer solar system material. But there was further uh, analysis and some uh, key element, trace element, gave another view about the contribution to, to the Earth. And in this case, this is noble gases, so they are chemically inert, uh, they, uh, they are physical traces, they react to phase change and, 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 and to radioactive and to nuclear processing. And one particularly interesting uh, noble gas is uh, the heaviest stable noble gas, which is xenon. And in fact, xenon is uh, like every, every, every element in the solar system, is a mixture of everything that has been produced before by, uh, by stars, a previous generation of stars. It has uh, nine isotopes. Some of them are produced by P process, a slow neutron process and rapid neutron process here. Sorry. Uh, okay. Now, there was a problem for very long, in fact, uh, um, for uh, terrestrial xenon. And the problem is that th the atmosphere contains some xenon that is different for whatever you can find in any other place of the solar system. Uh, it's, it, it is different for two reasons. One, it's mass fractionated, uh, mass dependent fractionated. But this is secondary. This took place during uh, atmospheric escape during Earth's history. But more interestingly also, once you correct for this, so it's, uh, you correct for mass dependence, 
you obtain a xenon isotope composition, here normalized to solar or meteoritic, it's about the same at this stage. You obtain a composition that looks like primitive uh, in a solar system for most isotopes, but which is depleted in the two uh, uh, heavier isotopes, 134 and 136, which are uh, air process isotopes produced in, uh, in, in neutron stars. Okay? So this has been long for three decades and nobody really had a, a clue on this. But thanks to the analysis of xenon in the comet, now we, we start to see something. So this is the xenon data. It's, um, it's a very difficult measurement. The spacecraft stayed uh, three weeks, very close to the comet at about 10 kilometers. The flight engineers were very nervous about this. They don't like to have a spacecraft uh, circling in the dust emitted by a comet, but anyway. And, and so, uh, um, the error bar are quite large. Uh, in the lab, you can uh, obtain orders of magnitude better precision. Uh, the light isotopes are, well, could not be measured because they are not abundant enough. But there are two interesting features. One is that it's also, uh, the comet is also depleted in the heavy isotope of, of xenon, 134 and 136. Okay. Here, there is an excess of 129 xenon, but this is a radioactivity. So, but the other isotopes are more or less compatible with a kind of solar composition or meteoritic. And the bottom line is that this depletion of uh, EV uh, isotope of xenon is a kind of fingerprint of uh, cometary contribution to the Earth. And you can make a very simple exercise. Uh, you, can, you can do it with an Excel file. Uh, you mix up some uh, meteoritic xenon. We have some evidence that uh, inside the Earth, uh, noble gas, krypton, xenon are from meteorites. Uh, you, you don't see this depletion. So you mix up some meteoritic xenon with cometary xenon, and you obtain a very good fit uh, for the atmospheric, primitive atmospheric xenon. Okay? And the mixing proportion is that you have 20% about of, uh, of uh, cometary xenon in the, in the terrestrial atmosphere, the rest being chondritic. So, uh, at last, now we have uh, some fingerprints of uh, cometary contribution, so we can see what would be the impact on the other volatile. I told you that norm normally from isotopes, water is not from, um, is unlikely to be from comets. And this is confirmed, this is just a mixing, uh, again, a, a, a mixing exercise. This is a fraction of uh, cometary xenon here, and you can obtain with, a, it's a little bit model dependent, but you can obtain the fraction of cometary water, and again, the fraction is probably very minimal, lower than 1% of terrestrial water should come from a comet, as long as the 67 p comet represents a cometary reservoir. Okay, so, but an interesting thing is that you, you, you can do also this mixing um, equation, um, or a mass balance approach for organics. And in fact, comets are very rich in organics, the, the classical model of uh, cometary grain is uh, one third organics, one third uh, ice, and one third uh, silicate and metal. And if you do this uh, mixing, you obtain something that is different. You obtain um, an amount of organics that could have been potentially delivered by the amount of comet you need for uh, impacting, for, uh, impacting uh, xenon and, and krypton is the same. So from the 20% uh, concentration of, uh, of xenon, you can compute what is the mass of comet, and you can compute how much organics. And you end up with a, 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 an abundance of organics that is quite large. And this event is, could be one order of magnitude higher than biosphere. So it doesn't, doesn't mean that all these organics will survive uh, the, the bombardment, the high energy. But it leaves the possibility that you have a, uh, a, a, a contribution of comets that could have bring some, uh, some uh, organics. Okay, so I'm almost done. Uh, this is just a summary of the delivery of carbon to us. So you start uh, 4.56 billion years ago, there was still some gas, the, the Earth was growing up, there is a little bit of solar gas in the Earth, solar neon, but most of the volatiles were probably uh, uh, carried out by uh, what is called wet accretion, accretion of bodies that already contain volatile, including water and, and carbon. You have uh, the moon forming impacts that dried up uh, everything, not everything, which might have removed some volatiles. And after that, uh, after this catastrophic event, the things becomes quite uh, quiet and uh, 
you probably have some late addition where the cometary addition would, would, could take place because we don't see it in a, we don't see it in the mantle and so on. And then we have some evidence of volatile, di direct evidence. So I am, I, I would like just to, to end up with this. Uh, it's a very exciting time now because there are two missions that are going to, to, to return some uh, material to us uh, next year and in three years. One is JAXA, a Japanese agency mission, and the other one is OSIRIS-REx, it's a NASA mission, and both are sampling a carbon-rich asteroid. So soon we will have some fresh material, not altered by, by uh, its transfer to Earth and its residence on Earth, that will permit to, to really got some good insight into, uh, into uh, carbon, primitive carbon. That's it, thank you very much. <clears throat>
if you, instead of relying on the partitioning between two phases, if you have an intra-phase uh, thermodynamic parameter, in this case, the distribution of isotopes across bonds, like, for example, putting two heavy isotopes on a bond, now you don't have to worry about the phase that you no longer have present, for example, the water. You only have to worry about the phase that you have in your hand. In this case, it would be carbonate, and in our case, it would be a gas. So this is proving to be a very popular technique, uh, the, and it breaks this so-called degeneracy between, for example, uh, ice volume and temperature in paleothermometry of the oceans. So our idea back in 2008 was to uh, apply this idea to methane uh, and, to see, and to take the full information content that exists with the different isotopes that can exist in a molecule of methane and get at the provenance of the methane because it was very clear that the provenance of methane was a big outstanding problem in understanding carbon. Um, you will have seen a diagram like this many times. I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but you'll recognize that one of the principal tools that's been used to understand the provenance of methane is the carbon isotope ratio on the x-axis against the, the hydrogen isotope ratio on the y-axis. And you'll see the different fields. Um, this is just one rendition of it. And the, all you're supposed to take away from this diagram is there's dots all over the fields. The dots all, don't always form nicely and separate into beautiful fields. There's a lot of overlap. The principal reason for that is this diagram, by necessity, confuses source with process. So the idea of using the rare isotopologues was to break that degeneracy by using an intramolecular, or perhaps better said, an intraspecies partitioning of isotopes across different molecules. So here I'm just showing the equilibrium 13CH4 plus 12CH3D goes to make a doubly substituted 13CH3D. Uh, you saw this yesterday in, uh, in Shuhei Ono's talk. Um, so the idea is take the equilibrium, the temperature equilibrium uh, um, that's defined by thermodynamics for one of the rare isotope logs, 13D, and then to do the same thing for the doubly deuterated species, so we have two curves here, combine the two curves onto a single diagram, and now you have essentially a temperature concordia diagram, where if a molecule forms or reset at a temperature that's in thermodynamic equilibrium with itself, a bunch of molecules, then they will reside on this curve. So we're interested in when those things are on that curve and when they're not on that curve and what it means. Okay, so back in 2008, I was saying, everyone's telling Genesis stories, so I'll tell you a Genesis story. So in 2008, I'm having lunch. I wasn't going to tell the story, but I still think it's funny. So I was having lunch <laughs> with Doug Rumble and Bob Hazen. And Bob Hazen was all of a sudden in command of a huge amount of money from the Sloan Foundation. And he said, and I'll tell you, I wasn't going to say this, but it was a job interview. Okay. And he said, how could you spend this money? And I said, I'd like to build a large geometry gas source mass spectrometer. And we started thinking, how could we apply this to carbon? And the idea of doing isotope clumping in methane emerged. I didn't get the job, <laughs> but I got the mass spectrometer. <laughs> so... So here's the panorama mass spectrometer that resulted from that meeting, uh, built by New Instruments. We partnered with new, new Instruments to build it. And the whole idea of this was to separate the two mass 18 isotopologues of methane. Okay, so there's the instrument. And here's sort of the, the money slide for what we've been doing with our lives for the last four years as it pertains to methane. Each one of the dots on this diagram on the left, which is that diagram that I showed you the genesis of, that isotopologue, it's like a three isotopologue diagram for the isotopomists out there. So um, every, every one of those dots has a story to tell. And in the time I have, I don't have time to tell those stories, but I just want to sort of talk about the, gen the origins of the different um, elephants in the room on this diagram. The main thesis of what I'm going to say, oops, I did it. I said I wasn't going to do it. The main thesis of what I was going to say is that the diagram on the left I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you is mainly about process, and the diagram on the right is process plus source. So let me give you one obvious example. These blue dots here are from boreal lakes. They are what we believe the products of methanogenesis, and they plot right on top of a bunch of methanogenesis experiments that we've done with collaborators in the laboratory. Those are the crosses. And notice the blue dots on, the, uh, on this diagram plot at very low delta D. The reason they plot at really low delta D compared to some other biogenic gases is because they are formed from water that's really low in delta D. So that's where the source is affecting where those things plot on this diagram. But over here, we don't think that that has much of an effect. It's just process. 
So the first question, I'm going to do two things in the rest of the talk. I'm going to talk about this elephant in the room. Why are microbial data way down here on this diagram? And then later at the end, I'm going to talk about what's going on up here with some high temperature sources of methane. And all of this is devoted to developing this tool so that we can figure out where methane's coming from when there's a debate. Okay, so um, here's just a, a, a little diagram showing you how one pathway for producing uh, methane during microbial methanogenesis. And the thing I want you to get from this diagram is that there's multiple steps. So I took these multiple steps and write them this way. There's basically seven steps for making a methane molecule from a CO2 molecule and hydrogen by, uh, by uh, hydrogenotrophic methanogenesis. So that you have these seven steps, and each one of those steps is going to have an isotope fractionation factor associated with it for hydrogen as you're uh, taking hydrogens off a molecule and then adding hydrogens to C1, to carbon-1, over and over and over again. Each one has an isotope fractionation factor. And there's an analogous process, the abiotic process of, of Fischer-Tropf-type reactions or Sabatier-type reactions when they're a surface mediated and they actually have a similar set of seven steps. And we understand the fractionation factors for the, for the inorganic process pretty well, better than we do the fractionation factors associated with the enzymatic process. So I'm suggesting that we can do modeling using the inorganic as a sort of uh, uh, proxy for the enzymatic process. So we have the same kind of like seven steps. You make an alcohol-like thing, then you make a formaldehyde-like thing, then you add hydrogen successively to C1. We kind of know what those fractionation factors look like. And if you follow that analogy, um, what you learn is that there's a number of physical chemical processes that are going to be involved in each one of those steps. So actually, if I go back one, uh, yeah, it, a physical chemical, yeah. So one of them is quantum tunneling. So we have to think about quantum tunneling as a possibility for affecting the isotopic composition of, of the isotopolog distribution that we're looking at. I think this is important for some of the samples, but I don't want to get too much into it, but I just want to show you that that is one way to get a big isotopolog effect. Uh, another way to get a big isotopolog effect is what I'm going to be referring to as a combinatorial effect. So this is the math lesson part of the talk. If you think of X as being a mole fraction of an isotope or an isotopolog in a sample of gas, there's two uh, ways of looking at, at, the, uh, at the average composition. One is the arithmetic mean. When you take a sample of gas and you get a bulk isotope ratio, that's an arithmetic mean. But the isotopologs are actually expressing a geometric mean. So they're a product of iso individual isotope ratios from distant reservoirs multiplied together to form this geometric mean. And it's a truism that there's an inequality between the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean, which is the geometric mean is always less than the arithmetic mean. So the result of that is that um, you get a, a, an apparent shift in isotopolog ratios as a consequence of that inequality of the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean. So what that means is, no pun intended, is that you're going to get anti-clumping, you're going to get negative clumping values as a result of mixing different reservoirs that have different isotope ratios together to form a molecule. So let's say you have a, a reservoir that has one DDH ratio and a reservoir that has another DDH ratio, and they combine to make a bunch of molecules of methane. Those methanes will have an apparent deficit in the CH2D2, for example, because of the inequality of the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean. And so you get a parabola-like shape here because of that process. Now, the reason we're interested in this is I showed you that microbial field is really has a huge deficit in CH2D2. Why does it have a huge deficit? Uh, one possibility is it's just this mathematical artifact of the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean, which is a simple shorthand way of saying that it's some sort of statistical combinatorial effect. So that's really what we're going to explore. So if we take uh, this model and put it in the computer and assign a fractionation factor that people tell us we should assign to each one of these steps, and consider what could happen in the context of different D to H reservoirs being produced at each step, um, you can produce the kinds of things that we see in the microbial data. So for example, um, if you have um, uh, different degrees of equilibration in each step, depending on how many different steps are reversible versus those that are not reversible, you get the different stars I'm showing here. So the gist of this is I can produce the very negative CH2D2 that is a signature of microbial genesis 
uh, in, a, in a sample just by considering this combinatorial effect. Now, this is just theory, really. But we uh, had the good fortune of pairing up with the Dartmouth group. Uh, Will Levin and his student, Lena Tenzer, came to visit the lab. And they had a vehicle for testing this idea. It wasn't actually the original thought, but it turned into this. That is, if we take this P. stutzeri organism, which takes uh, hydrogen from water and takes hydrogen from a pre-existing methyl group, CH3, and these organisms break the, the methyl phosphonate, take the methyl, add one hydrogen to it from the water. Now you have a mixed reservoir. Okay, So if that we can uh, play around with the isotopic composition of the water, we can see whether or not this process that I was telling you about, this inequality between the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean, really manifests itself. So we did that in the lab, and we uh, spiked the water with a lot of deuterium. So you get these wild ratios on the x-axis, and the methane that was produced correlates with it perfectly. And taking that correlation, we can make a model, and the model results in uh, no variation in the 13D isotope clumping of methane, but big variations in the H2D2 on the right, and they form that parabolic shape. And in fact, you can make a model for that parabolic shape based on the kinetics and the isotopal law compositions, and the model is not so bad a fit to those actual data. So this is the first real proof in the lab that this idea of a combinatorial effect could be the principal source of the variability in H2D2 that is, for example, a marker for a microbiogenic methane. So we're getting at process here, as I was saying to you before. We, we get some idea of what the process is. Okay, so you can imagine we have all these different ways of making methane um, enzymatically. So the hydrogenotrophic has multiple steps. So we have these multiple steps, each one with a different fractionation. That causes the big deficit, which causes our, our microbial field. In the case of methylotrophic uh, pathways, you're mixing a methyl group with another source of hydrogen, and again, you'll get the really low values. So that also explains why they're down in that microbial field, and so forth. Okay, and in fact, we can, we can uh, break out the, the uh, samples that we've done in the laboratory already between methylotrophic pathways and hydrogenotrophic pathways. But we're trying not to just draw you know, boundaries around groups of points on diagrams. We really are trying to understand the mechanism. And so I hope I've given you some idea of what the mechanism is that's controlling how far down on this diagram you are. OK, so now I want to just turn to one. I, I, I wanted to pick one uh, troublesome but interesting high temperature example of the application of these rare isotopologues to the provenance of methane. So I'll turn to the Lost City. Uh, hydrothermal field as an example, and you've heard a lot about Lost City, and you're going to hear about it in the next talk. Uh, you all know that it's a hydrothermal field uh, just off axis from the Mid-Atlantic uh, Mid Ridge, and I just want to point out, well, so here's my obligatory um, video. I was trying to figure out, I'm a laboratory scientist principally, so I was trying to figure out how I can get a drone into my, into my talk, and the panorama is big. But you don't really need a bird's eye view from a drone to see it. So this is my this is my equivalent of a drone. Okay. So they're sampling at Lost City. And the question is, where's the methane coming from? Now, in the chapter of the book that you picked up the other night, we put this figure in. And this figure shows that it's possible that when we measure a sample of Lost City up here above the equilibrium line, that you could explain it by mixing between microbial gas and a high temperature gas. And this is an object lesson, and it's good to collect more than one data point. Because, <laughs> because since that book that's already out of date, sorry, we collected more data. So here I'm showing you data from uh, Lost City from other vents that are at lower temperature. And we think actually that these are, these are the on-axis data from, from the, the hot uh, vents that are giving us temperatures of 300 to 400 degrees. But here you're seeing an array of data that look like they're forming a mixing trend between low temperature equilibrated gas and high temperature equilibrated gas. So what I would say now, unlike six months ago, is we don't see any trace of microbialgenic gas in the methane sampling from Lost City. What we see is a, a trace of low temperature gas mixed with some high temperature gas. Now it gets even worse because Gibran Labidi, the postdoc who has collected these data, made a plot that you see on the left and another plot that you see on the right. And on the left, you're seeing the H2D2 versus the fluid temperature coming out of the vents. And on the right, you're seeing the same, but for 13D. And what this is telling us is that H2D2 records temperatures, even low temperatures, 
upon resetting, whereas the 13D only partially resets. So we're actually seeing one isotope log resetting and the other one not resetting. And so we're looking at, uh, we're, we're really looking at something that records, has the capacity to record different stages of thermal evolution as the methane is uh, climbing up through the system. Okay, one last slide. I know I'm over, but one last slide, which is I didn't want you to think that this big mass spectrometer that we built can only do methane. So here's one slide of, of nitrogen clumping. So we, we discovered a, a couple years ago that there's a huge excess of 15N, 15N in the air that, uh, that you breathe. Not that you breathe nitrogen, but you know what I mean. So the 15N15 is 19.2 uh, per mil in excess of what thermodynamics would allow in air, and only in air. So we have this beautiful tracer of air. So now we can go to places like Yellowstone and look at fumaroles or, or uh, effusions from springs, and we can tell whether the nitrogen is actually from air, whether it's contaminated with air, or whether it's really nitrogen coming from the mantle. And that's important. So for example here, many of you will know mantle delta 15N values are around minus seven per mil, but when we look at Iceland, for example, a minus seven per mil or minus five per mil gas is 100% air, but it's fractionated air, not mantle gas. So we have this beautiful tracer now of air contamination for nitrogen, which is leading to all kinds of interesting things. So anyway, I, I, will, uh, I will end just with, these are all things we hope to be able to apply to effusions from extra, <laughs> extraterrestrial values. Max is laughing. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Could happen. No, there's no panorama there. But Shuhei is working on spectroscopic methods, and we'll figure it out. So anyway, the be I, but it's, it's not entirely a joke, right? The beauty of it is if you are using rare isotopologues, you don't have to know the isotopic composition of the different reservoirs. All you have to know is how the clumping works. It's process rather than source. So when you go to another planet, you can do process without knowing source, and that's a huge advantage, actually. Okay, I'll stop there. If someone really, really wants to ask a question, we can allow it, but I think we should move on possibly for the sake of the time and our coffee break. So okay. our next speaker is Susan Lang from USC. She's going to talk to us about serpentinization and um, Lost City is going to feature again. So Susan works with mi water rock microbe interactions, which to me sounds a bit like biological metasomatism. But I'm very <laughs> looking forward to this and the floor is yours. Great, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I wanted to give a couple quick updates from two major recent field expeditions, namely IODP 357 that drilled a series of boreholes into the Atlantis Massif, and then a recent ROV expedition to the Lost City hydrothermal field itself where we got to collect some fluids. And just to remind everyone, uh, Lost City has been mentioned a couple times today, but we're sitting here on top of a detachment fault, and there's fluids that are venting um, in a focused flow um, out through these large carbonate brucite chimneys. And going into these expeditions, we had some ideas of what was happening with carbon along the fluid reaction pathway, and namely that we have seawater that's starting out in the, in the deep sea um, with dissolved inorganic carbon, about two millimolar, and it carries with it dissolved organic carbon. Um, and as that downwells, we know from looking at the fluids, both at Lost City, but then a lot of analogous places such as Oman, that you basically remove almost all of the dissolved inorganic carbon, mostly as calcium carbonate in the subsurface. Uh, we know as this, these fluids migrate through the system and come to depth and are heated, we know that there's some degree of mantle input, at least at Lost City. We can see that in the helium isotopes. We know that if there's a mantle input, there must be a mantle CO2 input. Um, that does not actually make it up into the chimneys as far as we can tell, because instead you have the result or you have the impact of these serpentinization reactions that are forming, among other things, hydrogen, and that goes on to potentially form methane, either, uh, so possibly not along this fluid pathway, but rather that formed at higher temperatures was trapped in fluid inclusions and then is being stripped um, as these new fluids are going through those same reacted rocks. 
from previous work that we've done, we also have um, a lot of evidence that you have things like small organic acids, such as formate, that are formed abiotically from this mantle CO2 and carried with those fluids uh, as they then go into the chimneys. And so the opportunity with um, 357 is that we could drill into these rocks and look at some of these processes directly in the subsurface. And one of the uh, things that we were able to do on 357 is look at what we're calling liner fluids. And this is kind of the rocky equivalent of sedimentary pore fluids. And so it's the water that um, is in interaction with the rock. In this type of, we were using seabed rock drills, and in that type of drilling, you're using uh, deep seawater as your drilling fluid. And so you have this combination of, uh, in these liner fluids of basically deep seawater and what was, uh, what, and the water that was in the subsurface itself. And so if we look at some of the organic acids, for example, in the subsurface um, of the Atlantis Massif, this is a plot versus depth. Um, and so up at the surface down to about, we got down to about 16 meters, and you have formate concentrations on the left and acetate concentrations on the right. And in these gray bars are the range of concentrations that we see coming out of the chimneys when we sampled them in 2003. And what you see from this is that even though we had very high concentrations of formate in fluids coming from the Lost City, uh, the Lost City chimneys, there's much lower concentrations in the subsurface. And you have the opposite with acetate, where you have relatively low concentrations coming out of the chimneys, but you get up to hundreds of micromoles um, in many different samples in the rocky subsurface. And one of these samples had up to two millimole acetate. And if you do the math on that, acetate has two carbons. So that means there's about four millimole of carbon that's um, present in those fluids. Since you're starting, um, since the fluids that are coming down come down with about two millimole carbon, um, you must be having an, a uh, contribution of carbon from other locations, something like uh, either remobilizing previously uh, deposited carbon or inputs from something like, um, like mantle CO2. The interesting, what I found really interesting about this data is that we could then go and look at where you see these organic acids and the acetate to me was the most interesting part of this because it's very high concentrations and we could look at where we see those high concentrations compared to the rock types that they were, that were recovered with those liner fluids. And so when you do that, what you see is that most of the very high acetate concentrations are associated with uh, serpentinized hardspagite and metadolorites, as opposed to um, some of the basaltic type of, um, type of material. We also looked at hydrolyzable amino acids in these liner fluids. And again, you have um, hydrolyzable amino acids uh, going down through depth, and you get up to some relatively high concentrations. Well, for seawater type systems, these are very high concentrations. Um, and this is, these amino acids, um, we know are microbially produced. We did DL ratios on them, and so they have a very clear microbial signature. Um, and so this is an indication, potentially, of where life is in the subsurface. Um, and so, again, we can look at that in comparison with where, with what type of rock they were associated with when they were recovered. And um, in this case, we see the highest amino acids associated with serpentinized Hartsburgite rubble as opposed to the in, more intact serpentinized Hartsburgite. And again, this is um, a little bit different than where we see the really high acetate. And so this might be starting to tell us something about where you have uh, different types of reactions and different type of carbon rock reactions in different parts of the system as you have fluids that are passing through. Um, and so that's the IODP side of things. Uh, a few years after that, we were able to go to the Lost City field itself and sample some of the fluids that are coming out of the carbonate chimneys. And um, one of the big things that we were able to do during that expedition, uh, in part thanks to DCO and its support of a new sampler, 
um, that was able to collect very large volumes of very clean um, water is analyze those fluids for dissolved organic carbon, um, the C14 content of dissolved organic carbon. And so C14 of DOC is a very powerful indicator um, because it's, it's reflecting this, the different potential sources of carbon. And so in the deep sea, you basically have modern carbon in the form of dissolved inorganic carbon. You have dissolved organic carbon of deep seawater that tends to have an F14 signature of about 0.6 or 0.7 that is, is associated with a C14 age of about 4,000 years in the Atlantic. As you have the circulation pathway of the ocean, it ages to about 6,000 years. Um, and, and what the DOC community has wondered for a long time is how to reconcile the fact that you have this pool of organic matter that's cycling through the ocean four to six times um, over and over again and is must be relatively refractory and relatively slow to react. If you compare that with some of the concentrations in F14C ages of dissolved organic carbon collected from the Lost City Field, what you see is that there's basically no radiocarbon left in that DOC pool. Um, and that concentrations are go from about similar to seawater to uh, substantially higher than seawater. So you could explain that data in one of two ways. One, the kind of first explanation would be to say that you have um, aging of organic carbon along that fluid pathway, and you have some addition of organic carbon that's contributed on top of some seawater, aged seawater signature. Um, and so if you try and uh, go with that explanation, you can calculate how long it takes for C14 to decay, and it would, t it would require a circulation time of about 20,000 years. Um, we know from some independent data looking at radium isotopes that are coming out of these fluids that the circulation pathway of fluids from the point of downwelling to the point of exiting through a chimney is more on the order of about 10 years. And so you can't really attribute this, um, these C14 ages to a mechanism such as um, aging and addition. The other uh, argument that would support this is that I have here in parentheses the C13 ages of the same dissolved organic carbon pool. Seawater is pretty uniform. Seawater has a pretty uniform DOC C13 value of about minus 21 to minus 23, no matter where you are in the ocean. Um, and what you see is that coming out of Lost City, you have DOC that has C13 values ranging from about minus six to minus three per mil. And so again, if you were simply aging this seawater, you can't get to a C13 value of about minus three um, just by just via aging. And so um, if you compare, if you add onto this graph all the C14 DOC data that exists from hydrothermal systems globally, um, what you what you'll notice is that you actually that this this signature um, is that there's a tendency when ocean, when ocean water goes into the subsurface that you're removing dissolved organic carbon. It's a signature that we've seen for a good 10 years now, and that C14 age tends to become um, older and older and older. And so these are data from basalt-hosted systems um, in North Pond on the Juan de Fuca Ridge. And what I would argue is that in order to get data that's down here at C14 ages of zero, close to zero, um, is that you have to have a complete removal of oceanic DOC that's, that's being carried into the system. You have to remove all that, and then you can add back in um, some organic matter that has a very different isotopic signature. And that organic matter is uh, both has a C13 that's somewhere around minus three, minus six, um, but it is also, uh, it, it's being formed from probably mantle carbon um, or possibly something like carbonate that was deposited um, more than 50,000 years ago. 
And so when I saw this data, you have to now explain, let me go back for just a second, you have to explain how you removed all this organic carbon in the first place. And um, one possibility is that you have sorption of organic matter to things like iron. You've seen a lot of talks um, about things like serpentinites, and you know that there's this very important interaction between carbon and iron, and that's something that Again, these are uh, just a very small number of, of examples, um, starting in the soil literature, but then also experimental um, examples, where you have this very strong interaction between um, organic carbon and iron. And the higher iron content that minerals have, that sediments have, that soils have, um, the more organic carbon ends up being associated with it. And that tends to be true in particular in anoxic systems. And so when I first saw this data, um, one of the questions that I had was whether or not this could potentially be an indication that you have a lot of sorption in order to remove that organic carbon from seawater um, into the crust. And so Gretchen Frugreen and her group have measured TOC in the rocks that we recovered from the Atlantis Massif. And um, the TOC of those rocks, the t total organic carbon of those rocks, tend to be in this kind of marine realm of about minus 25 per mil. So again, that might be indicating that this organic matter is coming in part from these surficial processes. Um, and, and again, we've seen this close interaction of carbon and iron um, in some of these really amazing um, high-resolution imaging experiments. And so part of my question is whether or not some of this could be due, some portion of this signature could be due to the sorption of things like dissolved organic carbon that's coming, that's being brought with this downwelling seawater and being sorbed onto iron minerals as it passes through the, through the system. Um, we also, there's, there's clearly the extra question then of what this extra additional 70 micromole of DOC is as you um, are now coming back up. And just one answer is that some of it is clearly um, organic acids. So this is N-member formate concentrations versus hydrogen. Um, and there does seem to be a metastable equilibrium that's occurring there, which is um, something that I've talked about in the past and Jill McDermott has shown in other systems um, that you have this, this formation of formate, particularly where you have higher hydrogen concentrations. But this high acetate that we see in the subsurface does not make it up into the fluids that then get exported into the deep sea. Um, and so the, the kind of carbon cycling diagram that we would have is this loss of seawater, DIC and DOC, and then additions of things like formate and methane. Um, so I am out of time, but I just wanted to say thank you to all the people who have participated um, in this work. It was an enormous effort and all the funding agencies that supported us along the way. Do you have any questions? If not, then we're a bit behind. We can, we can move on. You all set? All right, our next speaker, oops, let me just get my notes, is Rick Corwell from Oregon State. Um, he's interested in data, data science, deep life field studies as a sort of combination of the three things. Um, he's going to talk to us about global patterns of subsurface microbial diversity and, and function. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Sammy. And I think to uh, begin with, I have a lot of other people to thank. I mean, I'm listed at the top here. Uh, but the, you know, the plain truth of this is that there are a number of people I've highlighted uh, some of the key people that continue to be helping with this uh, as we try to pull together this understanding of the um, what we call the census of deep life. Um, and I would, uh, I would say also there are a number of uh, census of deep life investigators that are not listed here, but that uh, contributed samples that 
that we have analyzed during this time, and also the number of agencies and organizations that have supported the original sampling efforts, uh, none of uh, wh which all contributed to the collection of the samples, um, and in many cases, some of the analyses. Um, I've also noted here, uh, or I will note, that many of the people listed are uh, early career scientists. And I, I thought, well, gosh, they're almost all early career scientists except um, me and Mitch. But if you remember the very first presentation this morning, uh, Liz Cottrell finished by asking uh, you, all of us, I guess I should say a question. She said, who was the early career scientist who asked for the soccer ball last night? And that was me. So I, I am. Liz, thank you. I am also an early career scientist. OK, that's as far as that goes, I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Let's see. So the census of deep life. Um, this is a, uh, an effort to define diversity in this deep biosphere that we've been talking about. And what we really want to do is characterize the diverse the, the diversity of deep life in continental and marine subsurface environments um, using high-throughput DNA sequencing techniques that have come about in the last couple decades and continue to be improved. Um, this, this developed out of a uh, workshop in March 2010, right at the advent, maybe the origin of the Deep Carbon Observatory, and it continued until uh, a little over a year ago. And since that time, we've been doing some resequencing, going back to the freezer and resequencing. In total, there were 135 projects that were supported for this effort. And um, it, it involved a lot of uh, scientists who were perhaps graduate students or postdocs as uh, the lead PIs on these short proposals to have uh, sequencing done. And the basic idea was that the applicants to these proposals could write a short proposal, and I should also thank the reviewers, four of which are here in the audience, that routinely through these 10 years would drop everything, maybe not immediately, and review the proposals that have been submitted. So Tom and Mitch and Beth and Steve, thank you very much for that. You don't have to do any more, I think. Um, and so the successful proponents would then send their DNA and uh, would have the, the sequence data then provided back to them after it was conducted at the Marine Biological Laboratory uh, where Mitch works. And so this uh, complicated slide showed us, sort of shows a, a timeline of the, uh, of the project across the top from 2011 to 2019. I think the key things are the boxes that are in the middle uh, that represent the projects that were actually funded. And you see we had at the very beginning 17 that were started in the beginning. That's right there. And then after a year or a couple of years, we, we managed to expand uh, so that it was no longer just 16S sequencing, which indicated uh, information about the individual taxa or the species, if you will, that were present in the samples. But then we were able to do so-called metagenomes on a few samples, which uh, uh, intensively sequences, or you get more sequence data, so you actually get information on functional capabilities of the community. So there was that split there at that point, and then those were the offerings the rest of the time. And uh, this all tallies up to about 135. Uh, this just shows meetings and workshops that we carried out along the way, and uh, maybe more for my sake than anything else, uh, an indication of when we had uh, proposal calls and when they were reviewed. Uh, so this is a map. I think Mitch showed it uh, yesterday or the day before that shows where these samples came from. Uh, all over the world, of course, uh, the white dots being the terrestrial samples, the black dots being the marine samples. OK, great. Thanks. OK. Better? OK, thanks. Um, OK, so one thing that's true with these uh, systems is that they're very low biomass in almost all cases. Uh, this isn't what you would consider a great place for most microorganisms to live. And so the biomass is quite low. Maybe they've died off on their way there. And um, that 
ends up being an issue when you're doing some of these sequencing studies. So when we started to look at the data, um, almost certainly we understood this would be the case, and it was, that there were a lot of contaminants that came perhaps from the drilling process, perhaps from the handling in the labs, that sort of thing. But the, the great thing about this was a paper that came out a little over a year ago that Cody Sheik led on, um, where we were able to look carefully, patiently, at the, uh, the census data as it was coming in um, and determine which samples were likely contaminants, either perhaps by virtue of uh, being contaminants from previous studies of the subsurface or possibly known human uh, microbiome contaminants. And so you can see perhaps that uh, a lot of the database has these things, but if you know where they are, then you can spot the, uh, the blank areas here, not the gray bars or the pink bars, and the blank areas are where the, uh, the data are good. And so this was helpful to us because then we could move on to what's happening actively right now. And again, uh, I'm presenting it, but these are data that are being developed really by a group of people. Emil Ruff has, has worked on this data quite a bit, uh, looking at the, the two basic groups of microorganisms that were sequenced in these samples, uh, either the archaea or the bacteria. And one thing that was uh, noticeable in this, so on this axis we see observed ASV, amplicon sequence variants, which is uh, microbiology speak for uh, different taxa or different species of organisms. Uh, there are a lot of samples considered here, so each one of these black dots represents samples that were in the database. And what's interesting is that for the archaea, uh, they are significantly more dominant in these marine systems, the, the blue bars, uh, compared to the terrestrial systems. Whereas for the bacteria, they're roughly equal. And this is interesting because in many other systems that have been studied, bacteria are typically dominant. Okay, if uh, we look at an NMDS plot showing the same data sets uh, but in this case, this is, again, archaea and bacteria with the blue dots shown as the organisms or the samples that came from marine environments, whereas the gold ones are those that came from terrestrial environments. For both archaea and bacteria, there's a clear separation of uh, grouping, meaning these communities are different depending on whether they were uh, originated, whether they originated from marine environments or terrestrial environments. And we had hints of this early on, but I think we're actually coming to the point of, of understanding this or recognizing that it's the case, that it is the case. So these data then show uh, um, metagenomic data, and I mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier, that there was a point at which we were able to sequence a limited number of samples for metagenomic information, so get whole community sequence information, which says something about the functions of the microbes in these samples. So 164 of these. Um, and we actually, interestingly, see generally similar patterns to what we saw with the 16S. Uh, for instance, that the archaeal diversity is greater in marine than in terrestrial. So this seems to be reinforced here. Um, there's a greater variability in the patterns uh, that are shown in the archaeal uh, system, here, shown here in a principal components analysis, than uh, for the archaea that are present in terrestrial systems. And uh, this shows generally that there are certain differences in the, the uh, taxonomic abundance of uh, different organisms, or these so-called ASVs that were found in the in the samples. Uh, Jerome also notes that uh, this is similar to uh, the profile that you saw yesterday, uh, indicating the degree to which mineral samples have been thoroughly sampled in, in, on Earth. And, and this indicates simply that, that we're not there yet in terms of exploring the, uh, the genomic variability or diversity that's present in, in these samples from a metagenomic perspective. There's still more diversity to be realized. But interestingly, here, the functional, there's functional redundancy across the, 
the biome. So even though uh, for functional characteristics in the metagenomes, there's an overlap between the marine and the uh, terrestrial systems, uh, functionally, they, they span the same space, which means that there's functional capability that should be redundant. Okay, this is kind of an interesting pattern. Uh, one of the things that we're still working on in small groups at this meeting is to consider the environmental data that goes along with all of these samples that were collected. On one hand, some attributes are easy, like whether they are marine samples or terrestrial samples, or seemingly easy. But um, other things are harder to reconcile. And what this shows is what uh, Karen Rogers and Fang Huang have put together in terms of uh, progress for data science. So all along this uh, axis are different variables that we've asked uh, individual PIs to collect, and here uh, sample IDs. So each one of the bars, the vertical bars, would be uh, an individual sample collected by the census investigators. And you can see they're not completely filled in. We're still working on doing this. And little groups of us who are uh, scurrying about, maybe trying to even get answers from people now, are trying to fill this in. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, we, we do see in this database um, uh, a number of interesting things. First thing I would like to point out, this is a remarkable and unique database. It's, it's larger than any other that has ever been collected on subsurface systems. And, and for many uh, large-scale surveys, it rivals those as well. Um, and so it's, it's really a unique resource that has been created. We're the first ones to explore it, I think, but others should be able to do this for quite a while. Uh, it does show that so far that marine and terrestrial systems are distinct from each other, that um, the metagenomic patterns are similar to uh, what we see at least uh, in defining the dis those distinctions, the marine and terrestrial distinctions, similar to what is seen in the 16S ribosomal DNA. And yet we also see uh, functional redundancy in terms of the capabilities of some of these organisms. Um, the, we're, we're still in the process of seeing past the low biomass or the contaminants in the system. However, that's something we know how to cope with now, I think, because of uh, Cody's paper. And, um, and also, we're in the process of continuing to uh, collect and archive this environmental data, which is not always um, a pleasant activity, but... Um, we try to remain collegial about doing it. And I think there are a lot of stories that will continue to come out of this. So thank you very much for your attention. All right, so we'll finish up now with our final speaker, Professor Alexis Templeton from University of Colorado Boulder. And this is a keynote address and has I have to admit, I think this is an absolutely fantastic title. When and how does subsurface life make methane under extreme energy and carbon limitations? So with that, the floor is yours. Um, well, thank you. And it's been a real pleasure to be able to be here and to participate in this synthesis of the DCO over the last 10 years. Um, I have definitely been exposed to many thematic areas that I wasn't uh, aware of their full scope and, and accomplishment. And I particularly want to thank um, Isabel Daniel and Craig Schiffries then for inviting me to come and participate. And in that invitation, they asked me if I would speak about some of the research I do on microbe mineral interactions. And I needed to reflect on that in the light of how that might well connect to some of the themes that the DCO has been doing, and also in context of some of the work that we've been doing through the Rock Powered Life um, NASA Astrobiology Institute. So the goal today is to talk some about just a few aspects of, of the research that we're doing related to deep carbon that I think do connect to many of the themes that have come up so far during this meeting. And in particular, I wanted to highlight uh, a diversity of outcomes from a set of early career scientists that are then working within this team. 
They've been very fortunate that we have long had um, substantial input from DCO community members into this project because more than a third of our investigators are members of the DCO community. So for example, Tom McCollum and Everett Schock and Matt Schrank and Shuhei Ono are also connected into this team and into the debates and the discussions that we have. Um, so in this talk today, yes, I'm going to talk about when and how does subsurface life make methane under this idea of extreme energy and carbon limitation. And um, I am going to take us also to the Oman Ophiolite in particular. So we've picked this as one of our key research sites. And again, it was supported, some of the investigations, and I'll explain the context through the DCO, through the Oman drilling project, and, and a lot of where the future of this kind of work may be able to go. So in Oman, um, we have a spectacular system here with this large piece of abducted uh, mantle and lower crustal rocks that we can investigate in terms of understanding not only their prior history, but what we're particularly interested in is the modern hydrological system that's present here and the hydration reactions that are happening today, their role in the release in, of, of energy-rich molecules, the process of ongoing carbonation, and how this couples together with permitting subsurface biological activity and in how we recognize some of the products of that activity. And so what we'll look at today is essentially an aquifer system where although we're, we're, we're looking here at the surface expression of these rocks, we have a five kilometer thick section. We're not accessing all of that through the Oman drilling project, but we are tapping into aquifers that are both shallow and deep um, that have a, a constant circulation of fluids within them in the modern. And in cartoon format, this is sort of the way that we look at this. So um, we really have a, a diversity of hydrogeochemical regimes. It's a theme that I'll come back to at different times in this talk. But we're able to access fluids that are circulating through an upper fractured aquifer here with um, shorter residence times. They rapidly equilibrate with these partially altered and serpentinized rocks and become alkaline and have a sort of magnesium bicarbonate character. And then there's a deep fluid system here with fluids in much longer residence times that are trapped into the subsurface. There are sometimes surface ex expressions where they're released, for example, in hyperalkaline seeps. But one of the um, key aspects of the work we've been able to do since about 2013 was to access a set of legacy wells that were established by the Oman Water Ministry in the search for potable water supplies in this environment. And these wells were drilled more than 20 years ago, and they intersect many of these different zones so that we can access both those upper aquifer fluids, but deeper fluids too. And it's these deeper and the longer residence time fluids that tend to have uh, extent this very rock reactive character. They're a calcium hydroxide rich fluid. They're often at pHs of 10 to up to 12. And we can, when we bring these to the surface, then they're continuously degassing both hydrogen and methane. And these are fluids that are at a state of the system that we're very interested in terms of the biological potential in those fluids and their role in some of the dynamics, again, in energy transfer. So the focus of today's talk and to connect it into to the meeting here is on methane. And it's not to ask the question per se of what controls the entire flux of methane from the sophilite. It's something that the work we've done does not speak to at this moment in time. But what we do know is that we're looking at a system in which there is molecular hydrogen present in the fluids and a set of reactions occurring that would continually supply hydrogen, but we're interested in metabolisms that may harness that. And one of the proposed me metabolisms that should be operating here is methanogenesis with the reduction of CO2 to methane. Now, there may be multiple sources of methane that occur in the system, but we would love to be able to recognize when and where biology is able to take advantage of the geochemical state of the system to produce methane and how it fits into the larger context of both production and consumption of this gas. So that's sort of the larger framework that we're trying to find ways to investigate. And we do need to come in and ask the question, is there actually any methane being formed in the modern? Um, and what are some of the processes that are potentially controlling the storage of carbon in the system, not just in the form of methane, but actually in the diversity of forms that have been discussed so far, um, and which could be in both reduced organic carbon forms, carbonate, and, and other phases um, versus loss. So that, again, is part of the overarching context of what we're trying to answer. I'm going to use this image from Tori Holer, who's a collaborator within our NAI team, just to kind of give a sense of why, actually, we should not expect biology to be important in most of the uh, aquifer that's sitting in the hyperalkaline conditions. 
So in a graph like this, with this would be hydrogen pH. The idea here is they're trying to look at the continual um, production and, and, and availability of hydrogen, and you would need to make assumptions about the DIC load in your system, which we can measure across this environment, and to look at the um, energy available for methanogenesis. And that would be in this form of the reaction where it's a CO2 reduction by molecular hydrogen. And looking at the heat map that's presented here, there's a, a small set of conditions here in the more moderate pH range in which you can really imagine or would predict methanogenesis to be highly favorable. A large area here where you're really at barely eking it out, and then you go to states of the system where you won't even have sufficient energy generation to maintain your cellular biomass. And so um, when we look at the aqueous geochemical conditions that we're, we are able to access in the subsurface through these well systems, um, the majority of them are lying out here in this area that would be predicted to not be bio biologically viable for this metabolism. The other reason that we really would have a first principles data that would tell us this is not particularly biologically important here is again coming and looking at the bulk isotopic composition of the methane that's present. So in general, in serpentinizing systems globally, if you're looking at the delta 13C versus delta D of methane, if we're looking at these classically defined here as of fields of microbial and thermogenic, almost all serpentinizing environments are notably delta 13C enriched. And then the methane that we are able to capture and collect in wells in the, in the hyperalkaline component of the Oman system are actually notably heavy and sit here at, at values of plus three and higher. So we have, again, a sense that the, the dominant pool of methane on this basis might well be something that was formed abiotically and, and that would be its origin or source. But we went in and we asked questions by moving across the diversity of hydrogeochemical regimes, pH is a seven up to 12, uh, across redox potentials that might sit at about 200 plus 200 millivolts to minus 600 millivolts, um, and a diversity of balances of electrons and donors and acceptors and said, who's present here? What are the diversity of these communities and what might they be functionally doing? I don't get to tell that whole story today, but the, the approach is, is collecting as much biomass, in this case from the fluid system, as we possibly can, but we are integrating over a, a fluid that is being collected over hundreds of meters of depth in these wells, which often go to three or 400 meters into the subsurface. To keep the focus on the methane story for today, this is some data from Dan Notaft um, in work that he's been doing across the well array that he's been working in in the past few years. In this particular data set here, it's just a focus on the gene abundance here um, for um, organisms involved in various types of aspects of methane cycling. Um, in this data set, what you might have is, a, make sure you use the right clicker here, um, looking at maybe the GABRA-hosted wells, these alkaline or into the hyperalkaline part of the system, we really can look at a different balance of organisms that might play a role in the methane cycle. The surprise in this data set um, that I want to focus on for today is that when you look at that big blue bar on the right, that is methanobacterium. It's the dominant methanogen that we find in all of our data sets, no matter where we're looking in the system. Um, in this particular case, in this well, um, we have up to 25% of the total reads are coming from methanobacterium, but this is one sitting at pHs of 11, and again, a very reducing character. Why are there so many methanogens there? That is the part that's right off the map in the predicted area of where you'd expect this metabolism to be feasible. Um, Dan's done a lot of work on the different aspects of the gas chemistry that he's been able to extract from um, these different well systems. And in this particular case, the only thing I want to make a point about today is that it's not only okay the bulk carbon isotope characteristics, but in this case, methane over other hydrocarbons. Now, we can go to parts of the subsurface system in these ophiolites and find whiffs of methane that come out that are easily recognizable as, as being um, biological both in their carbon isotope composition, it was being highly depleted, and then with these methane enrichments over other hydrocarbons. What's the surprise again, though, when we're looking at this kind of gas geochemistry is that there's a whole other cluster of, fluid, of, of chemical states where, again, you're seeing methane in this case is three, four, and five orders of magnitude enriched over the other hydrocarbons that are present, but that bulk isotopic composition is sitting here, that plus zero to plus three. What is that field? That is not one that is commonly observed, and we'd like to know more about what it represents. 
So we've been very fortunate working again with the DCO, and in this particular case, this plot's data generated um, both from Shuhei Ono's lab and then from Ed Young's lab. We're just looking at the CAP13CH3D aspect of this and, and in terms of the methane characteristics as well as with um, equilibrium of methane with water. The point here when you take a first look at this the lens on this is that if this is an array that defines isotopic equilibrium, these samples that are being represented here come from these hyperalkaline, again, states and environments and wells, and they're all pushed into some, something that's more of a kinetic array. And that um, first hint of, of potential um, bond disorder and disequilibrium that's present here was something that we were able to elaborate on further by working with um, Ed's lab. and taking a look at this and using the same axes that he was just talking about in his, in his previous talk. So in this particular case, now we have the H2D2 parameter that's been added in, and when we take a look here at the, at the isotopic bond disorder of the methane that is being um, collected in the most highly methane-enriched samples in these Oman subsurface system, they are plotting squarely in this region that is being defined as a potential microbial signature that's present here and definitely deviating from um, equilibrium uh, or part of this array. And so we're trying to map this out across more parts of the states of the system, but this was a really strong result for us looking at both this end member composition that's represented in here and then trying to understand something about other sources of methane and their possible formation conditions that may be represented in this data too, because we do have a mixing process that's going on in the subsurface, and there's a lot of interest in knowing what is the integrated sources of methane that may be forming. So it's something that we're working on at the moment right now. Okay, so as we've come in and started taking a look at some of the bulk properties of the gases that are dissolved in the water, we wanted to come back and ask questions again about the cells, the organisms that are present, and what they might be functionally doing. So, and this is data from a paper that was published this year by Libby Phones et al. And um, what had happened here is we again went across these pre-existing well arrays, started looking at just cell abundance. What are we really talking about here in terms of the, uh, you know, how low biomass is the system? Remarkably, it is not that low. So 10 to the 5 cells per mil is something healthy for us to work, to look at and to work with, at least in the fluid system. We don't have these numbers yet on the rocks. In this particular case, we do have more cells in, let's say, the alkaline part of the system, but there's still an abundant community present here in these pH 10 and 11 type fluids that we've also been trying to interrogate. What this allowed us to do then was to start doing incubation assays and trying to ask the question, if you take the fluids in their native state and you have your killed controls, can you measure an appreciable conversion rate of something like 14 labeled bicarbonate to methane to show and demonstrate that there's biological activity? And the rates are not high, but again, we can look at the pervasive potential for the formation of methane across, I knew I'd do it eventually, <laughs> um, across the system. And so keeping the focus in this particular talk on these hyperalkaline component of the system, we can measure the potential formation of methane even at these high pHs. And then um, in a separate data set that was generated by a student, Emily Krauss, in the John Spears lab, what she was looking at here across, again, the diversity of conditions we can find in the subsurface is relative abundance of DNA against the, um, and then trying to look at the at transcripts, at the active community that's present in these samples. And um, what's really notable in here is the real deviation that starts to happen in just a subset of samples where we have a, 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 those dark blue triangles that are present up here. And also in, in these clusters of samples here, what's happening is that these are coming again from our hyperalkaline end member. And we're going into these pH 11 fluids and what we're seeing is not, is that the methanogen population is making up, again, 20%-ish of the total population, and it is the active population. So this, again, is a big surprise that we would find that this abundance of the total population methanogen and that they're active and under this condition that's sitting out in a physiological realm that we don't really understand very well and wouldn't predict that would be feasible for methanogenesis. Um, we've been able to sort of um, ground truth ourselves a little bit by the fortunate fact that methanobacterium has proven to be amenable to cultivation. So we have been able to go into the environment, pump these fluids, collect enough material on filters, 
pump and beg them to make methane for us across the diversity of conditions in the lab. And there, we know from the genomic data there's more than one population of methanobacterium present there, but one of the ones that is prevalent in the system we now have in culture in the lab so we can at least start to test some of its um, potential for growth across states of the system that we think are relevant in the subsurface. So in this work that was um, by Hannah Miller, what she was trying to ask was, how, what happens if we um, start to grow something like a methanobacterium, again, under these more optimal conditions of high hydrogen, high CO2, she made them so-called DIC replete, pump them along, they can grow well, push them up towards pages of 9, 10, 11. Do the same thing now, giving them calcium carbonate to grow. No dissolved, or initial dissolved inorganic carbon. Let the carbonate dissolve and equilibrate with the fluids and set the system and then try and get them to grow. And the reason for that is the, what's been said multiple times today, that when you look in a subsurface rock-hosted serpentinite ecosystem, DIC and CO2, they get scrubbed very quickly from the environment. We're constantly hunting for the carbon that could be bioavailable to be used for metabolism. And so what we wonder about is all that carbon, DIC, that gets locked into the rock matrix during prior water-rock interaction, is it available now to be remobilized and used as the dominant carbon source potentially for growth? And so in this work, which is able to just push them to start growing much more happily down at these lower pHs of, you know, six, of 7 and 8 up to 9, once you're getting above about pH of 10.2, it's really hard, on a, at least on a short time scale experiment, to measure this. Um, she was also measuring the delta 13C of the methane that was being produced as a, as a function of time in those kinds of growth experiments. And so in this case, if she's providing them with um, dissolved inorganic carbon and high hydrogen, then again, depending on the pH, she can, she can really see like a 30 per mole variation in the exact bulk delta 13C and delta D character of the methane that's produced. When you start to move them onto calcium carbonate and to push the growth into this slower condition, again, with hydrogen as the, energy, as the electron donor, then you start to push yourself much further here in delta 13C space, and we now have a, you know, a 60 per mole variation in the delta 13C of methane that's produced. These kinds of experiments are in small batches, and we're integrating the signal through time, and where we'd really like to go is to see them growing right at that limit on the of slow growth on calcium carbonate with hydrogen as their carbon source, and to look at the expressed isotope and isotopolog character of the methane that would be derived. Um, so to, I want to leave this picture in your mind for a moment, and then I'm going to move into the, uh, some comments on the Amman drilling project. So um, when we're looking and what we're thinking about here from some of this work is that how often are we sitting at pH 11 in a carbonated or partially carbonated rock where we may have biological methanogenesis here, taking up CO2 and making methane that may be dependent on the dissolution um, of calcium carbonate that's really pH sensitive. And you can really control the rates of what the potential coupling can be between the in-situ community and those, and those rates at, at pH is above 9. And so that's the dynamic that we're trying to get at here. Why might it be important in the systems-wide um, state would be the idea that if actually there's this persistent biological activity that could be directly utilizing carbonate, and this is just for one metabolism, but for methanogenesis as its dominant carbon source and for energy generation, that would be important in the long-term stability of carbon that we think of as being stored in this kind of system as carbonate. Okay, so all of this was, has been a framework in which has allowed us to go then on to do the Oman drilling project. And this has been an absolutely fantastic project. Peter Kellerman, Damon Teagle, and Jörg Motter did an incredible job of organizing an enormous community that was interested in the properties of the subsurface mantle rocks for diversity of reasons. We were really fortunate that not only was there such successful core recovery with a kilometer of core, 100% core recovery in um, what was the, called the active alteration zone, but also that um, we could uh, you have up to about 5% of that total core for biological experimentation. And we really did put in a big request about the kind of and amount of material we needed for the diversity of experiments that we want to do. So we did build a mobile lab there in Oman. This is just last year in 2018. And um, 
what was exciting about it is I just using a little bit of the footage that was so kindly uh, developed and provided by the DCO when we were down there to give you a sense of, of the beauty of these rocks. I mean, there's just nothing like seeing these coming out of the deep subsurface and they are absolutely, um, you know, they were huge areas of intact core, so many features of the hydration and stages of alteration that occurred in them. And all of the teams that are working to understand the mineralogical uh, um, water rock interaction history recorded in them are absolutely vital to what we're doing. And so using these types of cores, what we can do then is start to come and um, ask questions as we move down core, let's use as many tracers as possible of activity. What's happening if you inject 14 label bicarbonate or you've got tracers on the sulfur that's in the system? As you start working with these groups to count cell numbers, extract the intact polar lipids, all of this information is being used in conjunction with the DNA to tell us not only where life is distributed into the subsurface, but where it's most active. And while we're doing that, it's very much tightly integrated into the mineralogical characterization at every scale of what is the, the actual um, latest stage mineral phases that the microbial communities are associated with. And so as we nest that in, even here, if we're doing this kind of imaging, we're trying to go down to the micro scale on every, every kind of measurement that's being made so we can start to move towards that cell minerals um, interaction and how those are dependent on each other. Um, the two things that um, are key and what I would like to leave in the mind of this community is we're sitting here today in 2019 and um, an in, in, in excellent framework for future investigation has been built. So what was built and has been barely utilized so far is the establishment of a borehole observatories that are here where you have a series of different um, boreholes that are large enough for putting downhole tools or downhole packing off intervals for experimentation and asking about communication and hydrological interactions in these systems. But they're beautiful for microbiology too because we know we are intersecting from the surface within tens of meters. We change the pH by several units. We go down to the lower redox, lower stability limit of water. And as we're sitting here, you can use the packer to isolate those intervals and ask about the biology as it's distributed with depth into that part of the system. Um, and so to use ta the DCO's own words with Task Force 2020, um, and we found it very interesting in reading that report as it had been distributed before this meeting and looking at the most promising directions in the future projects lie with those that develop strong geological and biological components simultaneously. I think that's something that DCO has been doing all this time. I think there are many sites that have been discussed at this meeting that have purposely developed that framework. That needs to be used across all of these going forward. It's such a shame to develop these types of potential observatories available for experimentation and stop. And so I don't know what discussions are going on with that, but I do recommend that this is seriously considered in terms of the ways that you could do so many coupled hydrological, biological, and chemical experiments that were dreamed about a decade ago, but are only yet still to be realized. Um, and with that, I say thank you. Um, and I, I don't know if we get to have coffee or treats or something to keep <laughs> us all going in this last part of the afternoon. The only thing I want to say in the slide that's here is I am so excited that we, about the physiology of what we need to do. We don't, we're not talking a ton about that aspect of the biology here today and in these last few days, but how these organisms function under these extremes of carbon limitation pH are fundamentally important to understand their acquisition strategies and the dynamics of how they're behaving in the subsurface. If we're going to make any accurate predictions about how subsurface light responds to availability of CO2, addition of CO2, or different forms of carbon that might be important. So thank you. So I think the speaker actually asked an important question. There is coffee, right? Yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> okay. Question. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Oh. Why do you think there's biotic methane in your samples and abiotic methane at Lost City? Uh, great question. So we're not, we're not the same. <laughs> um, and it's, it's interesting to, to really think about the different types of serpentinization environments that we're talking about in each of these, in each of these studies. So um, it really looks like that there's a very strong um, abiotic, higher temperature production of methane happening at Lost City system. 
we don't have that temperature gradient or thermal thing. So in some ways, I think for us, it's more like, why do we have methane here at all? And what we're trying to understand is the importance of maybe past hydrothermal activity in the system to have produced and stored methane that's now getting still released into the modern. So for example, methane and fluid inclusions and things like that, that's one source term here. I just didn't get into that today, but Dan had it on his poster to talk about. I think we're getting overprinted in our system by the fact there really is this biologically active system that is adding methane in here as well. And it's much more prevalent under the conditions that we have. Yeah. So um, I just want to sort of ask you to speculate for a minute. So I know the pH and, um, and uh, FO2 profiles you showed it for an older well, but the new ones, we've sort of done this experiment without really wanting to and inject vast amounts of oxygen and carbon into the subsurface. So over the next few years, what are you expecting to see in terms of the evolution of the, both the water chemistry and the uh, biota? Right. It's a great question. So what Peter is referring to is there's one well that, that um, it was a borehole drilled in the Oman drilling project, and it's, it's so exciting because you look at it, and it's got a huge stratification of a very reduced... Um, a hyperalkaline deep end member and a more oxidizing, it's not oxic, there's no oxygen there, but oxidizing fluid with things like sulfate and nitrate in the upper aquifer. And that delta pH and delta EH are the things you kind of dream about for all sorts of, of both metabolic potential and, synth and chemical synthesis potential at those. So it turns out that what happened through drilling is they connected an upper and a lower aquifer fracture so that the two are communicating and one's pouring into the other. So there ought to be a massive bloom of biological activity and states of chemical reactivity in that system. It would be a place where you could sit and monitor and see how that dynamic changed through time. So it was an, it's an accidental experiment, but it is in progress. And um, we do fortunately have, that was the well that was used for initial packer testing. So there's a baseline of data and there's another year of data. And Dan um, Notaft and Jörg Mater and others had been down there and been able to collect those initial states. So again, there's a great experiment in progress that should be harnessed. All right, so what we'll do now, I'll introduce you all to coffee. Yeah. And before we go off and have some coffee, oh. let's just thank all of the speakers one more time. How it feels. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh, I know. Ah. Why? It was not so difficult. Why, why is it so difficult for most people to know how to, you have to, look how at to go it, back? Like, is it, um, I kept, they're both green, so like going yes. forward and the pointer are the same color. So yeah. that's why I got But this is go back, right? <laughs> Where do you, where should we be? Maybe we should have both go over there. No, yeah, we should. No, no, no. Ask to someone. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah.
I want you It's from art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a good idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I don't mean, know. Oh, that two wheels was right. Yeah. I don't know. Always makes the photo, even though it's completely dead. So when was this taken? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes there's a, there's a plume, but it's just water. It's like, oh, okay. it, it happens, like sometimes there's a plume, but it's it's normally like after big rains. I don't know, it's a real bar plume. <laughs> Photoshopped. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
Okay. Yeah.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final session of this, this meeting. Uh, I'm Marie Edmonds. I'm from Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge. I am co-chair of the Reservoirs and Fluxes community and chair of the Synthesis Group. So we've reached the final session, which is returning to the theme of future opportunities. And we have two talks in this session. The first will focus on the whole Earth carbon budget through deep time and will be given by Sinti Lee. Sinti is professor and department chair at the Earth Environmental and Planetary Science Department at Rice University. And Sinti's very broad research interests have long included the deep carbon cycle, and in particular, the link between tectonics magmatism and evolution of the atmosphere. So Sinti led a chapter in the recently published Cambridge University Press book, Deep Carbon Past to Present, and today he will talk to us about the long-term evolution of whole earth carbon cycling. Okay. Thanks, Marie, uh, for the introduction and for inviting me here. Um, so uh, the theme is uh, future directions, and I'm actually a bit uh, afraid to be talking about future directions because I don't, don't really know. But what I'm going to do is um, talk a little bit about the chapter in uh, the book. It's a, really about a framework for how to think about whole earth carbon cycling. And then I'll end with uh, thinking about... Um, you know, where, where does that lead us next? Um, so I, I put this up. This is a uh, strat, uh, some st stratigraphy right here. It's the Eagle Ferd out in West Texas. And it's basically, these are marls. These are carbonates all up and down here. Um, but it also happens to be very rich in organic carbon. Uh, and this is where um, uh, they're fracking out there to get natural gas and uh, um, other hydrocarbons. But I also want to point out that all of these little brown layers, these are volcanic ash. And so the volcanic ash is, is strongly coupled with the deposition uh, of, of these sediments here. And you can kind of think of this carbon that's sequestered here as limes, limestones and organic carbon as they were once in volcanoes. Um, so there's, there's the link um, right there. So... Whoops, I thought it had. Yeah, that is the top. That's it, you press this one to advance. It's not, not advancing. Oh, it worked. Okay, I wasn't pressing hard enough. Okay, so, you know, why would we be interested in sort of whole earth carbon cycling? Oops, it worked too well. That's uh, that's weird. Oh, go back one, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, so right up here, this is uh, oxygen isotopic compositions of carbonates through, through time. It's uh, a proxy for temperature. And you can see over the last 70 million years, it was a greenhouse climate, and it gradually cooled down, and now we're in basically an ice house climate. And what causes that, of course, there's albedo um, and, and, and solar insulation, but if you look at PCO2 in the atmosphere, you can see that overall there's been a decline. So in large part, on uh, these long time scales, at least within the Phanerozoic, what controls uh, climate is how much CO2 um, is in the atmosphere. Next slide. Oh, here. And of course, you probably have seen many slides like this so f in this session. It's really all about the inputs and outputs of CO2 that control how much uh, CO2 is in the atmosphere. And there's, there's, of course, all the deep mantle contributions, metamorphic degassing, and then you have silicate weathering and the eventual precipitation of carbonate. And I, I don't actually want, I'm not going to go through this, uh, but this is just to show it's a plot where the y-axis gives you residence time of carbon in particular reservoirs. There's nothing on this axis right here. A residence time roughly scales with all the size of the reservoir in terms of total carbon. And you can think of the Earth as having an exogenic carbon system here, which would be the biosphere, oceans, and atmospheres. You can get as complicated as you want, all the different components of the exogenic system. That system 
uh, basically sits on top of the endogenic system where you have the, the mantle contributing through mid ocean ridges and other types of volcanism into this big box right here. You can have storage on the continental crust and lithosphere or the oceanic lithosphere. And of course, if you subduct carbon, it goes back into the mantle. And these work at much shorter timescales, you know, on the uh, timescale of days to thousands of years. And the deep carbon cycle works on much longer. We're talking 100,000 to million year uh, timescales. And so when we think about whole Earth carbon cycles, you have to make sure what timescales we're worried about. So for, for us, that whole thing, uh, at least today's talk, simplifies to something like this. Mantle and exogenic carbon, ocean atmosphere, biosphere here. And then some temporary storage sites. As the continents build up, you, you deposit carbonate and organic carbon on them. Some of them can get back into the mantle when they weather and then get subducted and, and so forth. Um, and so what we're interested in um, is how much carbon is in here, which ultimately then dictates how much CO2 might be in the atmosphere over the long time scales. Um, and, and so just some pictures here. Again, this, these, this is an example of the sink. And these are the inputs. I, I had to put this up here. It's Odonyo Lengai. And last year, I flew over it and circled around it. So not that this guy is that important for the long-term carbon cycle, but it's, it's very nice. Um, so we know a lot about the inputs, or we, we, at least we understand it's volcanism and metamorphism. I don't know how much has been talked about in terms of weathering or here. But the weathering um, goes as follows. It, the idea is um, if you have a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, it um, uh, generates carbonic acid, reacts with your calc silicates, and eventually breaks it down. And then which, you, know, you skip a lot of steps here. It eventually uh, precipitates that carbonate, uh, carbon back down as carbonate limestones on the continental shelves. Okay? And the idea is that the more CO2 you have, the chances are you're going to increase temperature, which increases kinetics. It might increase H2O runoff or precipitation, all of these things increase chemical weathering, which then increases CO2 drawdown, which then uh, pulls out carbonate. So this is uh, pulls down CO2 by sequestering the carbon carbonate. This is a negative feedback. And it's good that we have this negative feedback, because if we didn't have that, just this background uh, release of CO2 from volcanism would just keep on going, and we'd reach a runaway state. So Earth is basically. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, think of it as a bathtub right here, of water here. These are the inputs. And there's a sink here that actually depends on how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. The more you have in it, uh, the, the more they will come out to first order. It's a lot more complicated than that. But you can just a simple differential equation here. And so uh, the, these are the magnitudes of the inputs. And what comes out, really, you need to be thinking about the efficiency, which is this rate constant here of how it comes out. And that's really, that efficiency has something to do with tectonics, the amount of CO2, and, and temperature, uh, and also life there. Now, if you set this equal to zero, to figure out what it might be at steady state, then the steady state CO2 is basically inputs divided by this efficiency factor. So you can increase CO2 either by more mantle degassing or uh, decreasing efficiency of, of weathering. And the time scale for this, the, the steady state time, or the residence time, response time, is 1 over k. And what this, is, uh, this number is, is basically, if you were to perturb that system, how long does it take for the Earth uh, ex exogenous system to get back to a steady state where inputs and outputs are roughly equal? Um, and how do we know that? Well, we can. One way to do that is if you know how much you have in the reservoir and what's coming out, you can get it that way by dividing them. Another way is the community has used things like this at the PETN 55 million years ago. There was a spike in uh, CO2, uh, as recorded by in the carbon isotopic compositions. And they look at this, uh, this response time. And from that, you can, they conclude it's going to be somewhere in the tens to 100,000 year time scales. So that's important to know. So as long as we're beyond 100,000 100, year time scales or so, uh, the system is at steady state, which means inputs and outputs are roughly um, equal. And this is, of course, just a compilation of a lot of uh, people's work. And these are uh, uh, the inputs of C the long-term geologic inputs of CO2, metamorphism, all the mantle, the magmatism right here. 
And what you have to compare it to is the silicate weathering right here, which is the carbonate deposition, basically, um, organic carbon effect, and then also the amount of carbonate that is uh, sequestered directly in oceanic crust through that type of weathering. Weathering of carbonates um, on long time scale just balances out, so that's why they're on both sides. But if you can sum all these and these, there are big error bars, but <laughs> to within order of magnitude, they are roughly balanced. And so what I want to say is, uh, when you're thinking about long time scales, um, everything is balanced. And the only way then to change the CO2, um, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, next slide. This somehow doesn't work now. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah. And the, it's just that it's the, change, the changes in inputs and these um, efficiencies. Okay, so then the question I think in the community right now is change the inputs and the efficiencies. Well, which one is causing it? Are we changing volcanism or are we changing the efficiencies? And the way it works here is very simple. The slope of this line is basically just K right here. And if you want to increase the amount of CO2, one way to do it without changing efficiencies of, of withdrawal is just to increase the inputs. And so for a long time, we've been thinking about, well, you just have more rapid oceanic spreading, and that drove the Cretaceous uh, greenhouse. But you could also have, if you go to the right one, a scenario where you don't change inputs at all, or even outputs, right? We're at steady state. But what you do is you change the efficiencies, or effectively the residence time of carbon in the exogenic system, and you make it less efficient. That could be, have something to do with maybe less uh, mountains being formed, or less land is available. Many factors could have change this. But the, the debate right now is essentially on which one these are. So I'm going to show you just some examples. I don't think we really know the answer, but um, this is, uh, we'll be talking about the, the inputs of CO2. Like I said, the, the, the ideas have been, for the most part, mid-ocean ridges are changing through time. But in the last sort of 10 years, we started to think about other things. One of them in particular is these volcanic arcs. We think of them typically as static, uh, sort of continuous geologic features, but they can wax and wane, particularly in terms of the style of subduction. So you can have island arcs and continental arcs. And we heard, I think, some talks today where if you have magmas intruding through um, upper plate that's continental crust, there's a lot of carbon within the crust itself, and it can liberate that. So this is just showing you there are, there are times in Earth's history where many of the arcs were actually ocean continent uh, arcs. And so this is the Cretaceous, and you could potentially liberate lots of carbon out to the continents that were stored over there over hundreds of millions of years before, and then suddenly released when you reach a state uh, like this. Uh, more recently, it's, there's been suggested by uh, this from Dietmar Muller's group, uh, but based on uh, work by Tobias Fischer's, were inspired by that, where the diffuse to gassing in some of these continental rifts may be very, very high. And so if you have a, a period where you have a lot of continental breakup, then that could also enhance CO2. And in fact, when you have breakup, you also have these continental arcs, so they could go hand in hand uh, together. Um, and this here, just this going back to the idea of these continental arcs uh, forming, I have these uh, brick-like uh, features here. Those are all... Um, these carbonate platforms that were pre-existing there before these arcs came in. And uh, you can see this is showing you the length of the, the arcs along with uh, zircon ages through time. And so there's a rough um, a correlation there. So I'm not saying that that is uh, cause, causation, but it's uh, a hint that maybe this sort of stuff actually happens. And the, the end product, of course, of Magma is interacting with carbonates is to get this decarbonation, and you, you have these residues called scarns, and sometimes they're very beautiful. This is, these are ancient um, uh, sediments here, but they're now peroxnites, garnetites, and so forth like that. Um, of course, they, uh, these magmatic origins are getting uh, more complicated. Of course, every time we dig deeper, things get more complicated. Uh, while they do produce a lot of CO2, so this is a plot of, of magmatic flux versus time for one of, an, an arc in the Cretaceous, uh, Western North America. It comes up and then it, it dies, um, and they're producing a lot of CO2, but they can also become regional sinks of CO2 because you 
you generate high elevations, you generate your own orographic precipitation, a uh, lot of erosion, and so chemical weathering rates could uh, be enhanced, and so your, your net global efficiency of weathering could get higher. And what that might do is take you from a situation right here, where yes, you increase CO2 uh, fluxing, increase CO2 in the atmosphere, that'll give you a greenhouse state, but in the aftermath, when the magmatism ends, you still have this mountain that's coming down, uh, which is uh, magmatically dead, but the efficiency of weathering is much higher, and so the net result is when you go back down, you actually go to lower CO2 concentrations. So you might predict that when you have these magmatic origins, a greenhouse, and then immediately after that, you would go into ice house uh, states if there are these global fluctuations in tectonics. So th uh, this was the, the sort of Walker feedback. What you have to superimpose on that is put a box around that, but these are the drivers, the deep earth sort of winds in the end, and we've largely thought about as tectonics, driving up of an erosion, chemical weathering, but tectonics also includes not just metamorphism, but a lot of these mountain belts actually have a lot of magmatism. And right now we think mostly about Tibet uh, as our origin, orogeny, but Tibet doesn't have a lot of magmatism, but in the past, much of the mag, uh, orogenic belts were continental arcs, and those are magmatic. So now it becomes an interesting interplay between the role of tectonics in generating or enhancing CO2 fluxing and also enhancing erosion. So I think we have to look at those in great detail in the future. The other thing we need to uh, uh, talk about is that carbon cycling is, is not, uh, we, you know, we can't look at it by itself. We had talks uh, earlier today and also I think from the titles uh, early in the week. Of course, carbon is, we think mostly about depositing as carbonate, but 20% of it is deposited as organic carbon. And where you put that organic carbon in the oceans and the carbonate matters a lot. If they are deposited together, it doesn't, for example, it doesn't change you know, net oxidation states, but they're deposited in different areas and it can very well happen, um, as uh, shown in some of Terry Plank's work, then you can have a lot of effects in terms of, of the type of species of carbon that you're putting down. And of course, this uh, deposition of organic carbon is tied to the oxygen cycle uh, today. So if you want to understand how we got um, atmospheric oxygenation, it is fundamentally linked to the uh, evolution of carbon, how we cycle it throughout Earth's history. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about the car oxygen thing. I want to come back to, to this right here and um, the, the role of the volcanism here. So this Eagleford strata, I also plot on at about the same time, all these black things right here, these are basically source rocks. And so uh, Cretaceous source rocks, they're one of the major reservoirs for uh, the hydrocarbons that we, um, are we get out today. But they're in the Cretaceous, and they happen to be associated with, at least in time, a massive global flare-up in continental arc volcanism. And then, like I said, every one of these recessed layers, almost every one of them is a volcanic ash. And so we're over here, and they're coming from this arc, the kind of drift eastward. And here's, here's a, a big uh, ash layer um, that's recessed uh, right there. So what is, the, is, is there a coupling between volcanism and this deposition of organic carbon? So one can look at these ash layers in great detail. What we did here is they're highly altered, and what we wanted to see is what the original compositions were, and then um, what happened to them uh, after they were erupted and deposited into the ocean. Uh, how did their compositions change? So what uh, this is is really a recon kind of using a certain immobile elements to reconstruct the protolith composition. And then from that, we can actually, so you, if you look at the red colored guys right here, the black ones are the protoliths. Uh, and the red ones are all the altered ashes, and anything lying below that tells you that it's lost, in this case, silica, a lot of silica. So we can calculate how much silica, phosphorus, iron, all of these elements that are potential nutrients uh, for life, how much was lost, and we can calculate a flux of this nutri of, uh, nutrient deposition from volcanoes, airborne uh, inputs, into this interior seaway. And so this is what we get and in terramoles per year, the soluble fraction of phosphorus, iron, and silica, the red ones, 
in the Cretaceous, and you can compare it to global uh, inputs of phosphorus or soluble phosphorus and iron from rivers or wind and so forth. And what you can see is during these periods of very high volcanic activity, uh, the silica is, I mean, the volcanoes dominate the silica. Phosphorus is pretty big. It's comparable to even just modern um, uh, wind uh nutrient delivery. And iron is, of course, much higher. And so the idea is that it's possible that this, the volcanism is actually uh, fertilizing the oceans and um, enhancing biological productivity, which then may even lead to this uh, organic carbon uh, burial. Um, so the other thing, uh, because we can reconstruct the compositions of these ashes, we, um, we can actually, so this is work from Sidney Allen, who's working with some uh, collaborators, Daniel Minnesini from Shell. This is silica content, the original silica content of the ash, this volcano, through time. And I, this is 97 to 90 million years. Uh, that we have an age resolution that's, that is phenomenal because there are, there are no uh, erosional unconformities in this sediment, um, except where this bug happens to be. But the, uh, and it, the, the ages are bracketed by high precision uranium lead, and then there's Milankovitch cycle. So you have an age resolution uh, on the time scales of tens to 100,000 years. And so what you can see here is the composition of the, the arc of what's erupted is actually changing um, through time. Okay. And this is, I don't think this has ever been seen before at this uh, level of resolution. So, and we haven't published this, so just uh, uh, forget about it after this, this talk. Uh, <laughs> you can remember the caterpillar uh, there. And, <clears throat> but you know, what does this have to do with carbon, of course? Um, so I'm not sure, but what it's telling you is something's happening with the plumbing system of the arc on basically million year time scales. It's, it's changing. And we learned earlier from Liz Cottrell's talk, of course, CO2 solubility was very dependent on pressure. This is telling you where magmas are probably ponding. Uh, they're changing the depths of which they're ponding. So it's basically telling you that an arc itself over million year time scales, probably this, the effect is the CO2 coming out is going to change, among other things, not just CO2, but so many other things become uh, interesting in here, sulfur, uh, water, um, et cetera. So I don't know what's driving this, but some hints may come from some simple diagrams like this. This was a student, Farner, who plotted the composition of volcanic rocks versus uh, elevation in arcs. And you go, why would we do that? Well, the idea was that elevation, in most places, is isostatically compensated, so it's a measure of crustal thickness, and you see this, this correlation. So the fact that uh, silica content varies with crustal thickness is also telling you that the average pressures of magmatic differentiation are changing. So is it possible that what we just saw in the previous figure is that your arc is waxing and waning in crustal thickness, or maybe stress state, and the end product is it's going to really change the way we think about how volatiles get out of arcs. So what we see today is a snapshot, but uh, these arcs are not static. Not, they're not even static on you know, 100 million time scales, but on these million year time scales, they're also not um, static. Um, so I guess that's, that's it. I think with uh, deep carbon, I, uh, I tried to get across that carbon links to so many other things, this uh, nutrient cycling and if we really want to understand how uh, the carbon fits within the, the system, we have to think about uh, tectonics, climate, and life. Yeah, thanks. We could do a very quick question, if anyone's got one, for Cinti. No? Yep, OK. Hi, I'm just wondering. Um, so you have this variation in silica content, but a lot of volcanoes have, you know, the, the different sources of magma, either mafic or calcic. Oh, yeah. So, is this are these ash layers all from the same volcano, um, or w what's special, oh. I guess, about having some that yeah. are silica rich and poor? We, we we still don't know the answer. Each one of these ash layers is probably from one single eruption. So, and whether those eruptions come from the same vents, I don't know. Probably not. Um, and um, of course, any 
volcano will have a whole range of compositions, and any section of an arc will have a whole range. But what we're seeing is when we, that uh, correlation with um, elevation, it's an average. And with the ashes, they're definitely discrete volcanoes. Um, so we're making a jump, of course, comparing it to averages. But in, in any case, it's very interesting that we see that variation. We'll see. Great. Thank you, Cinti. <laughs> Dr. Christopher Glein is a research scientist at Southwest Research Institute, San Antonio. His research interests include origins of volatile inventories on outer planetary bodies, compositions of alien oceans, and the habitability of outer planetary satellites. And he will talk to us today about alien oceans as an opportunity for the deep carbon community. Chris. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon. Thank you for staying until the very end. <clears throat> I'm an early career DCO scientist who has somehow managed to infiltrate the planetary sciences community. And so I thought to end our meeting, I will try to do something different here. Uh, instead of looking down, I'll invite you all to look up with me as I take you on a whirlwind tour of the outer solar system, which is far away, very cold, but surprisingly also wet. There are many reasons to study the solar system. There's a fantastic diversity of physical, chemical, and geological phenomena. For me, on a personal level, I'm really interested if we can gain clues to this perplexing problem of the origin of life by exploring elsewhere, so get some new information. And this might help us to understand some of the earliest chemistry that led to life on this planet and also help us to answer the question if life might be a natural outcome of the laws of physics and chemistry, or if it could be a fluke occurrence, a once in a universe type of event. <laughs> Our initial reconnaissance of the solar system has revealed four bodies that are the prime suspects in the search for life in our cosmic backyard. There's the planet Mars, <clears throat> which is of, an, of intense interest in terms of looking for evidence of past life and also for future human exploration. And then we have what are called the icy ocean worlds. These are three of the moons of the giant planets. We have Jupiter's moon Europa shown here, this little guy, Enceladus, which is the moon of Saturn, and then Titan, which is another moon of Saturn. So we're gonna visit each of these three worlds, and we're gonna start with Titan. So Titan is interesting because it's the big moon of Saturn, and it's unique in the solar system because it's the only moon that hosts a thick atmosphere. This atmosphere is similar to our own atmosphere in terms of being dominated by molecular nitrogen, but it also contains substantial amounts of methane gas, which is different. <clears throat> and what, what's really important about having methane and nitrogen in an atmosphere is because there are charged particles, high energy particles from the sun and from Saturn's magnetosphere which can induce chemical reactions in the upper atmosphere. So we've learned a lot about this from the Cassini-Huygens mission that just concluded a couple years ago. And what happens is a cascade of radical and ion reactions which turn methane and nitrogen into ever more complex organic molecules that eventually settle onto the surface where they can then participate in geochemical and geological processes. So Titan really is the original carbon planet or carbon moon. Um, we sent a lander to Titan over 10 years ago. It's called the Huygens probe. And so this is an image that was obtained while the probe was descending to the surface of Titan. And it really blew all of the scientists away because it looked like such a, a familiar landscape. Uh, you can just see right here, this hill slope looks to be dissected by what are now thought to be valley networks by a flowing fluid. But Titan is an example of extreme chemistry and physics. It's just in the opposite direction of what you all have been studying. We're going into the cryogenic regime to very low temperatures of around 90 to 94 Kelvin. And so we think this fluid is actually methane, which condenses out as rainfall, and you form clouds. And there's an active hydrological cycle. But instead of using liquid water, it involves liquid methane sculpting the landscape. <clears throat> and even more spectacularly, over the course of the past decade, while DCO was studying deep carbon here, people have been understanding carbon on Titan, and we've discovered that there are these vast bodies 
of hydrocarbon liquids in the north polar region of Titan. So they seem to be localized in this cold trap region. And these, these are massive bodies of hydrocarbon. They're quoted to be greater in abundance than the proven hydrocarbon reservoirs inside the Earth today. Um, they're dominantly methane fluids. So the Cassini mission was able to do some clever processing of their synthetic aperture radar data to infer the di dielectric constant of these fluids. And we found that they're predominantly methane, about 70 mole percent. And then nitrogen gas is actually really soluble in liquid methane. So it's about 20 mole percent nitrogen gas. And then some other organic compounds as well that we don't really understand in great detail. So we've struck oil. It's just a different type of oil. It's liquefied natural gas on Titan. Uh, we've also been learning a profound amount about the interior of Titan. Cassini was able to form gravity science. So we've learned about the gravitational field of Titan and how it varies in response to tides over Titan's eccentric orbit around Saturn. And this is the current model that's been pieced together about what the interior looks like. So you might notice that there's this light, there's this blue layer here. So we actually think that Titan has an ocean in its subsurface. And pe many people call Titan a world of two oceans because we have these liquid hydrocarbons on the surface. And then we have this other liquid water ocean. Not much is known about it, but analysis from the Cassini geophysical data suggests that it has a high density, higher than you'd expect from compressed water. So it's been suggested that perhaps this could be a dense ocean that is very rich in salts. And then we have underneath the ocean a rocky portion. So this is very interesting for me personally because I'm interested in the possible relationships between geochemical and volatile related processes in the interior and this fantastically unique atmosphere we find at the surface. I know Sammy Mikhail has talked a lot about this in relationship to the terrestrial planets. So we got inspired after the Deep Earth Water Model was published to look into this. I had this idea for 10 years ago. Could the nitrogen have been cooked up inside Titan? The unfortunate part about it is we didn't have the tools available at the time to evaluate aqueous geochemistry at the relevant pressures. Now we do. So we were able to perform, this is a study that was, whoops, that was published earlier this year by my postdoc. And what she did is just some standard analysis of different activity relationships between ammonium, ammonia, and N2. And you can see that as you start cranking up the pressure, you really start to favor ammonium as the dominant species. So this suggests to us that perhaps relatively high temperatures might need to be implicated to produce N2 in Titan's atmosphere. So in this particular case we evaluated, we suggested that temperatures may need to be above 400 degrees C. So this is leading to linkages between what we know and what we will know in the future as far as the thermal evolution in the, of the interior and its geochemical evolution. And if that's not exciting enough for you, I hope Ed Young is excited by this because this is a drone. <laughs> NASA is planning to send a drone to Titan. This is announced at Absicon earlier this summer. And so this is the next selection in the New Frontiers line of medium class missions. This is called the Dragonfly mission. It's scheduled to arrive on Titan in 2034. It'll make its first landing. It'll make many more landings, dozens of landings, because it will be mobile. And we'll be, the mission will be able to visit many sites around Titan. We'll be able to travel hundreds of kilometers. And this is really exciting because I told you all this organic material, we think it rains and settles out onto the surface. But because Titan's atmosphere is so opaque, we have very little understanding of what has happened to that material over geological time scales. So this mission is going to help reveal if Titan can serve as a prebiotic environment or not. And we're really excited as a, a mass spectrometer will be able to dig, it'll be able to drill and sample the chemistry. It can measure the elemental composition. We'll be able to look at some really nice images taken with cameras on this mission. So you just have to be patient, 2034, and, and we'll be able to see Titan again. This is a, we're moving on to Enceladus now. Perhaps one of the most interesting discoveries of the Cassini mission was finding that this little moon of Saturn, so this, this moon could fit inside the United, United Kingdom, it is geologically active. So it's one of the few places in the solar system where we can observe geology in action. There's a plume that was discovered a little over 10 years ago erupting from the South Polar region. It erupted over the entire course of the Cassini mission. And you can really get a sense, this image is nice, that, that this plume has violent eruptions 
and the force of gravity is no match for the plume. Here's what we think is going on, how this plume relates to geological and subsurface processes. We think that we find the plume erupting through these fractures, which are called tiger stripes on the surface. And then we think that the source of the plume is a liquid water ocean. And one of the ways that we learned that the source is a liquid water ocean is we flew the Cassini spacecraft through the plume on a number of occasions, and we're actually able to smell and taste the plume. It turns out that the plume tastes salty. We found salt, and so that was a dead giveaway that this ocean must be the source, and it has interacted with rocky material on the sea floor. One of the more recent exciting results, I think that's very relevant to this group, is the finding of complex organic material. I know that Benedict Menez spoke about finding carbonaceous material. Well, we've also found carbonaceous material in the Enceladus plume. We don't know much about it because the Cassini instruments were not really designed to characterize this stuff, but we do think that it contains these sorts of aromatic substructures in there. So this is an example of a time of flight mass spectrum that was acquired by an impact mass spectrometer on Cassini. And we found this peak here that corresponds to benzene cations. So we think that there, this organic material contains aromatic substructures. We also see some tantalizing hints of more complex functional groups, things like amines, alcohols, and carbonyl compounds. But those are still at the edge of detectability and identification. And then echoing a major theme for this group moving forward is to develop the methodologies to discriminate between abiotic and biotic sources and their mixtures, which may exist in the Enceladus ocean. I'm part of the neutral mass spectrometer team. We had a result from a few years ago that was published 2017 during the last close flyby of the Cassini spacecraft to Enceladus. So we, our closest approach here was within roughly 50 kilometers of the surface. And what we reported was that we detected mass counts from hydrogen gas in the plume. This shows our data here in this light blue and dark blue and some purple up here. And then these green data points show our uh, careful calibration of the engineering model in the laboratory. So we found that you can make some artificial mass two counts just by the way the instrument operates, but it was inconsistent and insufficient to explain the signal that we detected when we flew through the plume. So we concluded that the plume contains roughly 1% hydrogen by volume. And this turned out to be quite exciting because it's revealing more about deeper processes on Enceladus. So we, we detected the, the sodium chlorides and the salt, and that told us something about this upper region where we thought there's a liquid water ocean erupting material. But now we're learning something more about the deeper interior. And this relates to what people in this group think about as far as deep energy, where we think that the most reasonable source of the H2 is actually serpentinization of very iron-rich rocks of chondritic bulk composition. So this, this shows a summary of our current understanding after the Cassini mission. This ocean is thought to be about 50 kilometers deep, and we think we're seeing these chemical signatures of hydrothermal processes. Uh, we were able to perform what I call the, the first calorie count of an alien ocean here. So this is an attempt to quantify the degree of disequilibrium for the, oops, I forgot to include the reaction. This is for the methanogenesis reaction of CO2 plus hydrogen gives methane plus water. So we're able to quantify the de degree of disequilibrium in terms of the chemical affinity here. Using our existing data from the Cassini mission, we think the pH of this environment is alkaline between about 9 and 11. And when we combine that with our H2 data, then we are able to complete this estimate here. So this is the range from the Cassini ion and neutral mass spectrometer. And we're inferring the Enceladus ocean is here. So there seems to be a lot of what my advisor would call loitering affinity. And we think that that's very interesting. And this leads to the, the conclusion that the supply of energy is well above the demand that microbes on the Earth would require based on studies of microbes in marine sediments. So we're concluding that Enceladus is energetically habitable. It looks like a very nice place to be if you're a microorganism. What's coming next? Cassini ended in 2017. We crashed it into the planet Saturn to avoid contaminating any of its interesting moons. And so we're actively pursuing opportunities to develop mission concepts 
to pave way for the next generation. So we are right here, 2019. Hopefully, the James Webb Space Telescope will come online in the next couple years, and we'll be able to at least get some telescopic information, some new information, hopefully, about the surface composition of Enceladus. And then later on, it's going to take a while. So Craig Schiffrey's made a joke, but it's actually dead serious. Cassini was conceived when I was conceived. So we're conceiving a mission right now, and the next scientific generation is being conceived as we speak as well, because it just takes a long time to get to these places. So we're planning for the, the 2030s and beyond, because it takes that long to get a mission lined up, get the funding, and fully developed. And so we're thinking about concepts like, you may have heard of the Enceladus Life Finder, to do repeated plume passes, but with the next generation of mass spectrometry and other analytical chemistry tools. We're also talking about the potential to return samples. So you may have heard Bernard Marty talking about the um, Stardust mission and Genesis. So we're, we're actively investigating if we could use those types of collection methods to fly through the plume, collect samples, and bring them back to the laboratory. It's a challenging problem because if there are microbes present, we've got to figure out what do we do. Um, and then other concepts, like we, we just got funded by NASA to look at a, a flagship lander to be evaluated by the uh, next Planetary Science Decadal Survey here. So maybe we could be seeing images from the surface of Enceladus later on in the next coming de decades. Lastly, I'd like to speak a bit about Europa. Europa is the original ocean world. It's the first icy moon that we knew, or we thought has, we have strong evidence of a liquid water ocean shown here. And many of you may be comforted by the way Europa looks. It, it's kind of like a silicate terrestrial planet, but then you have a bunch of frosting on top here. It's like a, you know, a rock covered by ice cream or something like that, where there's a metal core, there's a silicate mantle, and then there's an ocean here. And the ocean is thought to be about 100 kilometers deep. So there's a lot of liquid water potentially on Europa. And we're really interested. One of the, the drivers for developing a mission to go to Europa were these intriguing observations. These are really at the limits of detectability, unfortunately. These are made by the Hubble Space Telescope, finding these signatures of potential plumes erupting from Europa. So we're very inspired because we think we, we know how to study plumes now from our experience at Enceladus. So we'd like to try to tackle this next problem at Europa, and we're hoping that Europa gives us these opportunities to try to assess its subsurface chemistry. So the mission, I'm part of the, the science team, oops, here, it's called Europa Clipper, and it will do multiple flybys, 40 to 50 flybys in its primary mission of Europa. Some of these will be as low as 20 to 25 kilometers from the surface, and we're developing this instrument called the Mass Spectrometer for Planetary Exploration. It's a neutral mass neutral gas mass spectrometer, and we consider it the next generation of space-based mass spectrometry. Let me, let me just give you a hint, a sense of why we're excited about mass specs. Here's the problem that we faced at Enceladus. We, we noticed this big peak at mass 28 in the mass spectrum, and we are, we are constantly stymied because you see right there that CO, so CO could be a microbial food source, or N2, which might indicate something about a nitrogen cycle. Those both overlap when you have a low mass resolution instrument. So we were not able to form any definitive scientific interpretations of what mass 28 really means. Now, moving on in the development of technology, we had the fantastic Rosetta mission Bernard talked about. And now when you have higher mass resolution, so Rosina, the mass spectrometer on that mission, had a resolution of 3,000. So I mentioned you went from about 100, now you're going to 3,000, and you could start to pull apart these similar peaks. CO and N2 are not identical. They differ in mass ever so slightly. So you can see in this current generation of mass spectrometers, now we can say, OK, we've got some N2 and some CO. And this led to new interpretations of how comets formed. Here's an example of our laboratory data from mass specs. So there's CO and there's N2. And I find this very comforting. Because I think when we go to Europe, and if we're given this kind of opportunity, I think we'll be able to nail this problem. We'll be able to conclusively say, do you have CO or N2 using this type of instrument? And what's particularly exciting is that we can now start taking advantage of some of these tools that DCO has developed. Things, you know, we've heard a lot from people about these methane, isotopes and methane, these isotopologs 
And we're very interested in pursuing this type of science to help us understand these foreign environments. So here's an example of how we're trying to work with isotopes in methane. These are data, they're collected about two months ago using the engineering model of mass specs. This is one step removed from the flight model that will go on the mission. And what we did is we just mixed together equal amounts of carbon-13 labeled methane and deuterated methane. And we just wanted to demonstrate to ourselves that this instrument could, in fact, separate these similarly mass species. And you can see right here, it does a pretty nice job. So I think this is providing a lot of encouragement for our team, and hopefully some of you, that we might be able to start doing some isotope biogeochemistry beyond Earth. Um, we've seen this kind of diagram before here, and I'm very intrigued where bodies like Europa, Enceladus, or Titan might fall on this kind of framework, and how we can use this framework and potentially then think about the next generation of clumped isotopologues to move us forward in understanding the origin of organic molecules and carbon-based species and the processes that are affecting them and how that fits into the greater scheme of the origin, evolution, and habitability of the solar system. Thank you. Exciting stuff. Do we have any questions for Chris? No? OK. Let's Oh, we're going to do calibration flybys. So we will be collecting data from the Europa Clipper mission of both Ganymede and Callisto. And there will be another mission in the early 2030s called JUICE that will be doing similar flybys and then will go into orbit around Ganymede. And another question from Ed. What, what about Mass 18? Mass 18? Uh, well, we're thinking about water. And we're... No, no, but I mean for methane. You have the resolution. Oh. Well, we're very intrigued by that potential, but we're not prepared to promise anything yet. So we'd be very interested in collaborating with you or Sho Shuhei Uno and other people to try to test this kind of capability. Okay, let's thank both of our speakers again for two great talks. <laughs> 10 years ago, this program began as an idea seeded by a number of enigmatic questions about where our planet's deep carbon, how much, how it moves, what form it takes, and where it came from. So 10 years later, we stand here with this very large community of scientists, all of whom have, create, have contributed to creating a new field of deep carbon science that brings together a vast network of interdisciplinary scientists in a range of fields. And over the past three days, we've been regaled with the highlights of the program, its achievements, its legacies, and its discoveries, and the exciting plans and projects that will extend into the future. And this program's tremendous success has been possible because of the enthusiasm of the community, the collaborations that have sprung up as a consequence of tackling big, important questions that cut across many fields, the innovation involved in exploring inhospitable field areas designing new instrumentation for new purposes, and conducting challenging experiments. And it's been a privilege to lead the synthesis effort over the last four years, and it's allowed me to look right across uh, the program, the vast array of cutting-edge science of the DCO. And this experience has been truly remarkable and humbling. So we stand on the brink of a new episode in deep carbon science. So this is not the end, merely the beginning, and I hope you'll all continue what we've all started here. Thank you. And Craig and I would now like to make some, some thanks. Uh, we'd like to start by acknowledging the incredible efforts of the Science Program Committee who put together the creative and enthralling program that we've enjoyed over the last few days. And let me read out their names so that we can thank them properly. They are Isabel Danielle, who chaired the committee, Catherine McCammon, James Badrow, Brendan McCormick Kilbride, Peter Barry, Mark Lever, Graham Pearson, Feng Ping Wang, and Craig Schiffries. And secondly, we'd like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank the Secretariat, 
who have worked tirelessly to orchestrate this program uh, over the past decade. And we'd like to thank them also for this, their role in planning this spectacular meeting. So they are Bob Hazen, Craig Schiffries, Andrea Mangum, Jen Mays, and Michelle Hoonstar. And lastly, we'd like to thank the engagement team um, who've been in, done a, just this truly spectacular job of communicating our science and have played such an enormous role too in, in this meeting. And they are Rob Polkany, Katie Pratt, Josh Wood, and lastly, but not least, Darlene Truechrist. And then we conclude the meeting, I think. Yeah, thank you all, and we hope you are as inspired by this event as we have been, and we hope you carry everything you've learned into the future. So let's go more deep carbon science. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>